Good morning. I'm calling to order this hearing. This is a budget oversight hearing of the Committee on Health. I'm Council Member Yvette Alexander. I represent Ward 7 and I also chair this committee. Today is Thursday, May the 8th. The time is approximately 10.35 a.m. and we are in room 123 of the John A. Wilson Building. The purpose of today's hearing is to discuss the budget for the D.C. Office on aging and the not-for-profit hospital corporation better known as the United Medical Center for fiscal year 2015 and fiscal year 2014 to date. The DC Office on Aging develops and carries out a comprehensive coordinated system of care, education, employment, and social services for the district's elderly population, those who are 60 years of age or older. It is structured to carry out advocacy, leadership, management, program and fiscal responsibilities. Its mission is to coordinate and connect seniors, persons with disabilities, and family caregivers with the highest quality of long-term service and support options, and to promote healthy and independent living in our community. In 2010, the district acquired United Medical Center in an effort to maintain the only hospital that resides east of the river. Since then, the not-for-profit hospital corporation's mission has been to provide excellent patient care and obtain positive clinical outcomes in a safe patient care environment while maintaining balance among cost, quality, and commitment to our patients, medical staff, and employees. We will first begin with our public witnesses um, with regards to the DC Office on Aging. And I see a lot more folks want to come in. Please forgive us for this smaller room um, this budget season. There are other hearings going on and I 15 people, we may have some empty chairs or they may be allowed to sit in what, 120. 120 next door. Um, will they be allowed to watch the hearing from 120? 
Okay. We'll provide something so that you can watch the hearing, but right next door they can have seats over there. I will call up our first round of witnesses and we will allow five minutes um, per testimony. Um, beginning with Romaine Thomas, who is the chair of the DC uh, Commission on Aging. Ms. Sally White, co-chair of the DC Advisory Coalition. And Lynn Person. Ms. Person is the director of the, D the DC um, Long-Term Care Ombudsman's Program. And good morning, ladies, and welcome. Good morning. And Mrs. Thomas. Yeah, okay, thank you. Thank you. You may proceed with your testimony. I have a copy. Good morning. Okay. Okay. Good morning, Council Member Alexander uh, and Associates. I am Romain B. Thomas, Chairperson of the Commission on Aging. It is my pleasure to appear before you in that capacity to share information regarding the proposed budget for the District of Columbia. I would like to take this opportunity to recognize uh, any of our members on the Commission who may be here at this time. I did see Ms. Woody, one of our commissioners. I don't know whether there are other commissioners. And of course, Ron Swander, who is our, our vice chair. And we have many commissioners, too. I would like for any of those many commissioners to please stand to be recognized. Joe Harris is here, any other person, because they help us to carry out that work that we expected to do in the communities and in the neighborhood. In brief, in brief review, the Commission serves as an official advocate for older residents of the District of Columbia to the, and to, to the Mayor, the District Office on Aging, the Council, the Director, and the public concerning the views, concerns, and needs of seniors in this great city. As advocates, we are committed to promoting equality healthy lifestyles, as well as belonging and improving the mental and physical well-being of seniors. We are proud and indeed very excited that the senior population is living longer, promising a bright future for many. We are encouraged by excellent reports such as that written by a uh, science editor some time ago, Albert Rosenfeld, that was entitled uh, Pro Longevity a report on the scientific discoveries now being made about aging and dying and their promise of an extended lifespan without old age. Dr. Rosenfeld also observes that we are living in an age where science has made some startling, amazing, and sweeping discoveries, although they haven't found that fountain of youth and, or that healing source. <laughs> Within the lifetime of many people now alive, it may be possible to postpone or slow down or even halt the aging process and extend the human life span by many years. As Dr. Rosenfeld further states, aging becomes merely another, if aging becomes an, merely another curable disease, we will we'll perhaps have found a solution to the problem. In another instance, just this past weekend, uh, 60 Minutes aired the TV segment, Living to 90 and Beyond. It highlighted the study known as 90 Plus, focusing on men and women above the age of 90, who are now the fastest growing segment of the U.S. population, although some reports say it's the 85 group. But uh, we all have reasons to cheer about that. As we approach the D.C. budget cycle for for FY the 15, we must give major attention to the changes and challenges that confront the aging population. Some seniors live longer and many require long-term support and services to stay healthy and happy. Funding for our senior programs must be consistent and sustainable. It makes no sense to increase funding one year and then cut it the next year. Programs that directly impact the elderly must be maintained 
or our capacity for senior care will be diminished. What may sound like a small funding reduction may force a, a relatively small provider to cease operations altogether. And once a provider stops operating, it becomes expensive and time consuming to recreate it to recreate it in caring in that caring capacity. We have some excellent senior service providers and some of those are represented here and you will hear later on today, hear from later on today. And we need to keep them around for the long term. And it is worthwhile to identify programs that are moving forward and address senior issues. By no way is this just limited to these programs that I mentioned, because there are other programs such as family matters in those programs. But I do cite the wellness centers, which are located in most wards, and I compliment Dr. Thompson for providing and seeing that these are operating and uh, the capacity that they can provide vital health, fitness, and social needs of seniors and are extremely popular. In fact, some are extremely overcrowded during peak periods. To meet the current and future needs of seniors, existing wellness centers need to be upgraded. We have that cited. And I do cite Seabury, and we're proud about that transportation and the grant that has been provided to them in terms of getting, and the budget supports that in terms of promoting, uh, supporting mobility because that seems to be one of the issues, especially when we grow old. And also, I would like to point to the age-friendly city which is a, a, a highly, very promising initiative, and we are proud that this budget does support that, and the mayor has given a lot of commitment to providing those kinds of funds and support. So I appreciate the opportunity to speak to you today, and I look forward to any questions that you might have, and thank you so very much. Thank you, Mrs. Thomas. Mm -hmm. I'll wait until the entire panel speaks okay, before thank I you. ask questions. Okay. So, okay. Good morning. Good morning, Council Member Alexander and members of the committee. My name is Sally White. I'm the Executive Director of Iona Senior Services and co-chair of the DC Senior Advisory Coalition. For 39 years, Iona has carried out its mission to support people with the challenges and opportunities of aging. We educate, advocate, and provide direct services to help people age well and live well in the District of Columbia. IANA has been a lead agency for the Office on Aging since 1982 and a founding member of the DC Senior Advisory Coalition made up of over 30 organizations advocating for and with older adults in the District of Columbia. For more than a decade, the community-based programs for seniors throughout the District of Columbia struggled to maintain their Office on Aging funded services in the face of rising costs, more seniors, and little, if any, increases in grants that govern much of their work. Thankfully, some agencies in the Senior Service Network gratefully received meaningful increases in 2014, including IONA. And I want to thank the Office on Aging for their work and partnership in making this possible. The Office on Aging is also working to change the reimbursement structure for grantees to a more manageable system, which is desperately needed and will be much appreciated. As a result of the increases in funding this year, transportation services are being modernized and expanded. Waiting lists for frail seniors re reliant on home delivered meals have disappeared. And essential social work services are helping more people find services and financial support needed to remain in or return to the community. The result is a win for seniors and for the DC government's aim to support seniors in their own homes. The DC Senior Advisory Coalition supports the mayor's Ms. FY15. Your, your microphone is on, isn't it? It is. If you could adjust it. Yeah, thank you. Okay, can you hear me now? Yeah. I can hear you some others. Okay. The DC Senior Advisory Coalition supports the mayor's FY15 proposed budget of $42,017,960 for the Office on Aging. It increases and annualizes support for much needed transportation and home delivered meals and provides new funding for wellness and other programs, which we hope will address the needs in all eight wards. In wards two and three, we are working on a wellness alliance model with strategic partners such as Howard Hospital, Sibley Hospital, the libraries, the rec centers, and others. 
commodity foods computer systems and the age friendly cities initiative are all supported in the mayor's budget and an additional three million four hundred eighty two thousand and eleven dollars is still needed to shore up services left behind for years and to continue programs that received only one time grants in FY 14 the result of these increases would be to continue rather than curtail housing and social services for at-risk seniors continue to expand transportation service using a modernized system strengthen the specialized services legal adult day health care housing insurance counseling fitness senior centers employment staff training update and expand programming in over 40 nutrition sites under leadership of lead agency ADRC's and in cooperation with existing DCOA and other services close to 100,000 citizens in the District of Columbia are age 16 over as a group they make enormous contributions to the life of our city through civic voluntary and religious organizations many of them provide the bulk of family support for several younger generations and some of them have become physically frail confused isolated and at great risk the senior service network is the first and sometimes the last line of support for all of them an active senior seeking to maintain fitness an Alzheimer's victim who cannot safely be left alone a dialysis patient needing three trips for treatment every week a son seeking home care and meals for his disabled mother our city aims to be a successful age-friendly city a key ingredient for that success is well-run outcome-oriented adequately funded support services for citizens of all incomes especially those services funded in part through grants authorized by the DC Act on Aging and the Federal Older Americans Act an increase of 3.5 million would bring the DC Office on Aging budget to a total of 45.5 million or approximately $455 for each person age 60 or older and still would be only 0.004 percent of the district's proposed 10.7 billion dollar budget the details of our request is attached and I thank you for allowing me to testify before you today I thank you for your testimony I'm really disappointed with the room we have today I knew that there would be a lot of seniors and I knew that we would have a large crowd so I am going to address this with the chairman um, please forgive me once again I'm really kind of ticked off about this Miss Person go right ahead thank you good morning councilwoman Alexander and members of the committee on health my name is Lynn Person the DC long-term care ombudsman with legal counsel for the elderly I'm testifying today on behalf of the DC long-term care ombudsman program and approximately 9,000 residents receiving long-term services and supports in the district facilities that includes nursing homes assisted living residences and community residence facilities as well as those individuals receiving these services in their private homes through the elderly and persons with physical disabilities Medicaid waiver the ombudsman program is part of the DC office on aging senior service network with responsibility for representing the interests of some of the district's most vulnerable citizens compliance with the older Americans Act is not a service delivery option for the district it's a mandate therefore it's imperative that funding is available to support implementation of programs operated and managed by or on behalf of the DC office on aging which we refer to as the one-stop shop and there being no wrong door um, for these residents receiving long-term services and supports in the district the ombudsman program continues to appreciate your diligence to ensure that DC residents are receiving optimal long-term services and supports in the community and in long-term care facilities according to 2012 US Census estimates for the District of Columbia approximately 11 percent of the population is over 65 years of age and 9 percent represents individuals ages 18 to 64 with disabilities Medicaid enrollment also shows a 4.8 percent increase from 2011 to 2012 for the district's aged and disabled populations a significant number of these residents would rather remain in their homes and receive needed services for as long as possible independent living with long-term services and supports is most preferred by district residents as well as the ombudsman program my focus today is to highlight the ombudsman program support of adequate funding for the DC office on aging to ensure individuals ages 65 and older and adults with disabilities ages 18 to 64 have access to appropriate accessible and affordable long-term services and supports these services and supports are vital to the quality of life and must be holistically designed to bring about the desired outcomes identified by the individual the older Americans Act and the district stakeholders not only are these services and supports effective when properly utilized they must also be accessible and affordable 
community-based services and alternative to institutional care is not only a cost savings initiative for the government and approximately 92,712 Medicaid enrolled district residents, it promotes independent living and an enhanced quality of life for long-term services and supports recipients. It is the assessment of our office that the local government should increase and enhance community-based long-term services and supports to further provide sufficient support to current long-term care facility residents for transition back to the community for those residents choosing to leave the nursing home. Meeting the demand of people aging in place, including adults with disabilities, requires an ongoing supply of long-term supports and services designed to meet the needs of this population. We, support, we supported the D.C. Office on Aging's 2014 proposed budget and are satisfied with the direction of the agency. The Ombudsman Program applauds Dr. Thompson's leadership specific to FY 2013 and fiscal year 2014 staffing increases for the Aging and Disability Resource Center. This program enhancement should allow the agency to facilitate and ensure an increased number of nursing home residents transition to the community. The Ombudsman Program continues to offer our supportive programs that are truly community-based focused, such as Money Follows the Person Demonstration Project and the Elderly and Persons with Physical Disabilities Waiver. Therefore, we recommend sufficient funding for these programs, coupled with vigilant oversight to make certain goals are achieved, thereby placing value to the dollars expended for long-term services and supports. This includes funding to move residents out of nursing homes and funding to make sure residents stay out of those nursing homes. The Ombudsman Program is proud to be a part of the D.C. Office on Aging Senior Service Network and is, and is encouraged by the D.C. Office on Aging's program enhancement intended at improving the lives of the people we serve in long-term care facilities and in their private homes. The D.C. Office on Aging has a fundamental responsibility, which is meeting the needs of such a vulnerable population. Therefore, this agency must be fiscally sound in order to satisfy this responsibility. It is our hope that the D.C. Office on Aging will continue to be wise and prudent in its allocation of funds and spending for programs affecting the residents that we serve, including increased staffing to satisfy residents' needs, as well as achieving their goals, supporting the district initiative and becoming an age-friendly uh, um, age city, thereby improving the quality of life for all of district's residents. Thank you, Councilwoman Alexander, for this opportunity to testify today, and I'm available for any questions you have regarding my testimony. I want to congratulate you for being within your time today. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Ms. Person comes to every hearing and advocates for every word, so she has a lot to say. Uh, I wanted to follow up on two things, and I believe the money that follows the person and the EPD waiver program, um, these are both, um, I guess, both are promoting seniors living, aging in place, and um, hopefully in their homes. I believe the mayor has allocated a million dollars, is that correct, for housing initiatives? I believe Transition. so, yes. And do you think that that's sufficient funding at this time, or is it just a start? I think it's just a start. Um, one of the barriers to individuals being able to move out and to actually move out in a timely fashion is housing. And so there's a significant need for funding to support the housing that the residents that we are aware of who would like to transition from institutions, especially from the nursing homes to the community. So the majority of the seniors in nursing homes don't have housing. I remember there was, I want to know, is there still a population that does have a house to, a home to return to? Because I remember the one um, instance in an earlier hearing where a senior wanted to go back to her home. There are some who have homes to return to to the community, but the majority of them do not. Okay. Thank you. Miss um, White, you made a recommendation of an additional uh, approximately $3.5 million, and these were one-time only grants? One, uh, the, um, the additional monies explained on the last page are in addition to uh, I'm sorry, the well, money's on the last page. The top number, the 415000 for service network providers is 250000 for Home First and 165 for Ward 5 Seabury Lead Agency. Those were in last year as one time only. So they, we really feel strongly need to be in the added to the budget again to be... Well, well I'm referring to, in, in your testimony, you said an additional... Um, Three right. point, approximately 3.5 is needed to shore up services right. left behind. So if so. you add up these, 
um, totals here on the back page, it's 3.48. Oh, I got million. you. So why were these only one-time grants in FY14? What right. happened? What happened in 15? Um, they just uh, the particularly the home first 250,000 didn't get added in the mayor's budget. I don't know if it was just an oversight um, with the budget being so large. I, oh, I just so these were all local dollars. This wasn't any federal money. Correct. Or? Okay. The one million, one almost the one one million two hundred sixty-seven thousand for the what we're calling the left behinds are those agencies that didn't receive significant, if any, increases this this year and have been struggling for a decade in the face of um, budget shortfalls. And you'll be hearing from a number of those agencies today, I'm sure. Okay, so there's no other. Um there's no other district agency that can take over some of these services or have you checked to see if anyone has taken No, they're all really vital organizations such as Home Care Partners, Legal Council for the Elderly. They're all providing much needed services. There just wasn't enough of an increase last year to, to go around. And um, so we really are advocating for an additional, the 1.267 million to give those agencies a boost so they can in some cases stay open and in many cases reach the people who are in need of services. And are you aware if any of these um, particular agencies get funding from anywhere else that could cover it? I know they all do what they can to get diversify their funding, but mm -hmm. I'm not I'm not aware of the details. Okay. Well, I will follow up with you. Thank okay. you. Mm -hmm. uh, and Mrs. Thomas, good morning. Good morning. You mentioned existing wellness centers need to be upgraded. So are you talking about upgrades in terms of programming or the physical uh, structure? Both, both. I think that can be extended in terms of uh, reading and meeting the needs of seniors uh, in different, uh, because of some of their individual uh, problems that they might possibly have. So they can try to address those particular problems. And I wanted to say, while I was take this opportunity to say to you that uh, we certainly appreciate the fact when I was speaking about the Friendly City, H Friendly City, that you did participate in Ward yes. 7 in terms of one of those explorations and we were trying to uh, determine uh, the sidewalks and the conditions that were there. So please know that we appreciate that so very much. Yes. That's what we need. We need that kind of leadership and follow-up. Thank you. Well, I definitely will. I know for the age-friendly, the mayor's allocated, I believe, 250000 mm -hmm. 250, uh -huh. And for the wellness centers, though, I believe that's for programming um, and operations, $2 million. Right. But um, what do you know um, specifically of any wellness centers that need any capital dollars in terms of upgrading their buildings, uh, you know, the, the physical structure? Perhaps some of the, the uh, if they know, uh, look at some of the new approaches to installing and some of the equipment that would be um, a very, very uh, useful and accommodate some of the needs that are there in terms of some of the physical needs. And I, for instance, I think about you look at things such as the capacity that I might have at myself, and that's hearing. They need to upgrade and do some things in terms of providing situations where seniors are comfortable in terms of those hearing kinds of conditions. And they probably need to look at it in terms of the visuality of it, too, in terms of some of the vision. And they look, need to look at some of those things that we take for granted and seem very simple as terms of hearing and seeing and speaking. They need to have, uh, the, and they might need more therapy or they might need more physical service in terms of those areas that might be housed within that particular center. And thank you. And you said wards two and three do not have a wellness center. Well, what are the I, seniors? I'm not so. I need to really check on that and look at some of the people in ward uh, two and three, and we we need to follow up on that. We really need to look at that more carefully. Like, yeah, what other activities do seniors engage in 
and those boards. Does anyone know in boards two and three what Can I speak seniors? To that? Um, yes, there are, there are a number of lunch programs in each ward, and those are really um, the only free alternatives for seniors in wards two and three right now. We mm -hmm. we really um, advocate at Iona. We've been working with our citizens advisory group on this um, on a, the idea of a wellness alliance so that we could bring programming to a variety of spaces throughout wards two and three not to be uh, not to have to build a new building anywhere but to really use what's already out there it's already up there maybe some, some of the network. recreation centers Absolutely. could have senior uh -huh. programs there i know yes. some recreation centers do that mm -hmm. as well yes mm -hmm. well thank you all for your testimony okay thank you on the next panel, I'd like to call up Reverend Joseph K. Williams. I'm afraid he is out sick today. Okay. He was so looking forward to this hearing, too. Brenda Glover. Ms. Glover's from Family Matters of Greater Washington. Deaf and Hard of Hearing Program. Lisa Queen. Dr. Kathy Brenneman, Dr. Brenneman, Chief of Geriatric Medicine at Providence Hospital, and the next group is a panel, so is Don Quattlebaum here? Come right up. Project Director of Seabury Ward 5 Aging Services. Oh, you're in a panel too. I'm sorry. Is Jan May here? Come right up, Mr. May. Executive Director of Legal Counsel for the Elderly. And welcome. This is Miss um, Glover, Brenda Glover. Welcome, Miss Glover. Hello, Chairman Alexander, and continue members. My name is Brenda Glover. I live in the DuPont Park in Ward Eight, Excuse and me, I am not here back here. They need to up the mics. The fan is blowing, and it's impossible to hear what the panel members are saying. Thank you, Dr. Labatt. You're actually out of order for that, but we do understand. The microphones are primarily um, for our viewing audience, um, and I, I apologize for the fans in the back. But persons watching on television can actually hear. So. Just try to be quiet back there and, and listen, and we will try to adjust your microphone. Thank you. Mm -hmm. I start there. Go ahead. Go okay. Hello, Chairman Alexander and community members. My name is Brenda Glover. I live in DuPont <coughs> Park in Ward 8, and I am here. I am with Family Matter of Greater Washington Ward 8 program for seniors was funded by the DC Office on Aging. I am testifying about my experience and to stress the importance of increasing funds for the Seniors Service Network funded by the D.C. Office on Agents budget. budget. I really appreciate the program. I really appreciate Family Matters, their part of hearing program. I have lived in the DuPont Apartments for five years and no one would help me with my needs until now. The Family Matter social worker 
Joa Lucas. He helped me with special things, including getting a lighted doorbell. You see, I could not hear people knock on my door. This proof was up upsetting. For example, the maiden's man would come to check different things in my apartment, like the air condition and water. I could not hear him knock. I had to leave my door propped open. Sometimes he would even use his key to enter my apartment. That would make me feel uncomfortable because I might have been dressing or even showering. Sometime when watching television, I would look up and see someone in my apartment. I didn't like, I didn't know that a lighted doorbell even existed. Now, thanks to Mr. Lucas and other staff at Family Matter, I see a flashing light. When someone is at my door, I felt the need to testify how helpful this program has been. The Family Matter, Death, and Heart of Healing program, important in existing seniors to, re to receive the service we deserve find it for these programs give us the ability to maintain our independence and to be better members in our community. Please support the senior citizens at Victor Paul or Lishan to in to increase the DC office on Agent Burgess by 3.5 million to ensure DC seniors continue to receive the highest quality. Thank you for the opportunity to speak with you today. Thank you. I uh, thank you, Ms. Glover. I don't have any questions for you, but I'm glad now that you can lock your door uh, because that was very dangerous in terms of your safety. So now you have a lighted um, doorbell that indicates that. And I'm glad. Are there any other services that they do um, beside that, or are there any other organizations um, that can provide services for you in terms of your impaired hearing? Mm -hmm. Are you are you completely deaf, or do you read lips, or no, no ma'am? I can hear some, but it's getting the older I get, the worse it gets. So I can hear some. Okay, that's and I'm great. learning sign language also. So that's, that's awesome. going to be a big help. Do you use an assisted um, device for hearing? Do you have a hearing aid? Yes. Okay, good. Well, I thank you for your testimony. I appreciate you coming in to share that with you. So, Family Matters, and they come into your home? Does Family Matters, a, a representative comes to your home, or do you go out to any program? Come to my home. That's excellent. Thank you for your testimony. Dr. Brenneman, good morning. Good morning. Um, thank you again to... Um, our Madam Chair Alexander and the other um, associates for allowing me to testify and also for our large population of people here who support seniors and provide the services that we all know they, they need. I'm Dr. Kathy Brenneman and I'm a geriatrician um, and also a resident of Washington DC 
and I've been practicing and living here since 1990. Uh, I'm currently medical director of, medis of geriatric medicine at Providence Hospital and also medical director of Carroll Manor Nursing and Rehabilitation Center. So I do see the whole scope of the very healthy seniors who come to my office along with the very frail and, um, and older paid people with, uh, with significant medical illnesses in the nursing facility. I've worked with DC government before and I participated in our re-classification re, um, of what is qualifi qualifications for nursing home and really changed it from more of a disease oriented form to a functional orientated form. So it was a matter of not if you had arthritis but more can you walk to get to the kitchen and get your food. So this did come about and the form is still being used today looking at the person's functions rather than the disease. The district has multiple health agencies that are a benefit to specific medical or financial populations and conditions. But aging is the one service that we all will be eligible to use. That is, if we're lucky, okay? Um, so as a resident of the district with the hopes of living longer and a provider of health care to the older adult, I'm here to give my support to the DC Office on Aging and the agencies that they support for their continued work and effort on the behalf of the older individual living within the district. I want to share a scenario with you that just happened last week and I hope that it will point out the value of services. A patient came to my office with her two sons. The patient was wheelchair bound, um, had a dementing illness and was totally dependent upon her sons for care. She and the family had been receiving DC home waiver services for the, about the last year. There was a change in the agencies. The son was given a new name of an agency that would be taking over the care, but this service did not happen. So for the past two months, the son had been doing the 24-7 uh, care of his mother, and that meant providing uh, all of her daily care, including bathing, dressing, toileting, transferring to bed and chair and back again, giving the medications and any other needs that she might have, be it social, medical, or psychological. We all know that these services are not directly connected to the DC Office of Aging, but more they serve more as an information center. After hearing his frustration and his, um, and he also was a senior, I think that's the other thing that we have to remember. You know, as our population is is becoming in their 90s, their caregiver are their children. And their children are in their 70s. So, you know, not only do we have to worry about the aging person, but also the who is taking care of the aging person as, as we ourselves age. So I decided to take the burden off the son. So I called the name of the agency that he was given. And I was told that this patient was not on their roster and that they were not accepting new patients for the next two weeks. I then inquired about where I should go next. They gave me the name of an agency that I called and again a nice person on a machine answered the phone and told me to press one, press two, leave a message and someone would get back to me. Well, that didn't seem quite right for me <laughs> and I wasn't in the mood to leave a message because this was a need that I thought needed to be dealt with as soon as possible. So after so now I'm on a quest and I'm determined to talk to a person and to see whether I can get a response so that we can get this woman's services back and relieve her son. So I then went online, found other numbers and started calling them. And again, machine, machine, machine to leave a message. I then went further to a high office in the district and while I was on hold, waiting for a person to answer, I was, I was struck by the machine. The message that I heard on hold gave me lots of options to communicate with that office. And these included Facebook, YouTube, or Twitter. I could tweet. 
Or I could leave a message and again, someone would call me back. Maybe a lot of you in the room Twitter and tweet, but I don't. <laughs> it's not my what the communication that I was raised with. So all these things, you know, as I listened, and I listened for a long time, it was close to 15 minutes. And I don't want to imply that seniors don't use electronic devices. I have a lot of patients and a lot of people do use cell phones, smartphones, the internet, and email. But it's, a lot of times it's not a convenient or preferred mode of communications. So my next call was to the DC office on aging. After three ro rings, the message was, good afternoon, may I help you? It was, so it was so refreshing to get the sound of a voice. At that point, I was given a number and it was to the ombudsman who we just heard from. And the ombudsman also answered the phone and at that point made a commitment to go out and evaluate this lady the next day. So with the, the rest of the story is easy, I think, that, you know, we really need real people behind the phone still. And, you know, and get the, and determine the best form of communications. Um, with the aging and diversity of the needs of the district's older population, along with the goal to make D.C. an age-friendly city with housing, outdoor spaces, social and civic events, we need so the support of the D.C. Office on Aging to continue with their education and wellness programs and assistance to other agencies, <laughs> families, seniors, and all with appropriate services. Again, I wanted to mention the 60 Minutes program that Living to 90 and Beyond was a wonderful program. It's, you can get it online. It, it's wonderful. I listened to it just yesterday. So in summary, I just want to offer my support to the seniors of the District of Columbia by providing support to the Department of Aging. That includes all of their needs, wellness, referrals, education, nutrition, transportation, and another scarce commodity in the modern world, which is a voice at the other end of the phone. Thank you for allowing me to testify. Thank you. <laughs> that was too much technology there. Thank you uh, for your testimony. Now, I do know that there are some seniors that are, I'm excited, they're learning how to use Absolutely. the internet now. But of course, we do want options available for all seniors. Were you referring to um, when you dial 311 or all district government agencies, you should be able to speak? Well, it was, it was 311 was my last phone call. That okay. I, I, it was a long message about tweeting, email, yeah. Facebook. And I mean, I had so to So I'm smile. wondering, and I'll ask the director, but I'm sure if you call Office on Aging with any questions, because I'm sure seniors call the Office on Aging for just about everything, I will check and make sure that a person would be able to pick up the phone and kind of guide a senior through. I know if a senior calls my office, I'll try to guide them through whatever service they need. And I still do have a lot of seniors who actually write letters in the mail Absolutely. to me and they expect a letter back in the mail um, for a response so uh, we still have that so I do respect the different modes of communication and I have to put my mom on blast because she can't even check her voicemail on her cell phone so maybe she's listening and she'll learn how to do that too uh, thank you for your testimony I have a follow-up question but I'll let um, Mr. May provide us testimony and I'll ask you about Carol Manor. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Council uh, Alexander and Associates. My name is Jan Allen May and I'm the Executive Director of Legal Counsel for the Elderly. We provide client-centered uh, legal services to D.C. seniors with special emphasis on those most in need. Elders with unsafe living environments due to landlord neglect or malfeasance, seniors facing foreclosure, older victims of predatory Predators and scam artists and those threatened with eviction and homelessness and seniors who need assistance to pay for food, housing, and other basic legal needs. We are a founding member of the Senior Advisory Coalition and uh, are able to carry out much of our work as a result of a grant from the Office on Aging. We're testifying today to reaffirm the importance of DCOA funding in the lives of our clients whose demand for these services is ever increasing. 
We use a holistic approach to help at-risk seniors combining legal and social work in order to fully respond to the root cause of the problem and create long-term systemic solutions. Uh, not only for seniors we serve, but also for the housing providers, the courts, concerned friends, neighbors, and family members. Our multi-pronged program consists of legal representation, community education, and policy advocacy, as well as the Ombudsman program, who you previously heard from this morning. Founded in 1975, LC champions the dignity and rights of vulnerable DC seniors by providing free legal services um, to DC residents 60 plus and in 2013, we helped more than 5,000 older neighbors in need. With thousands of volunteer time contributed by over 500 volunteers uh, each year, we're able to provide a wide range of services, legal, so psychosocial, financial, and educational, in a cost-effective way. Our primary goal is to serve and empower thousands of low-income seniors each year in those areas of, of law involving basic needs, income, housing, long-term care, personal autonomy, and consumer protection. We wish to thank the Council for supporting funding to the D.C. Office on Aging and the importance of DCOA's vital services. We support the Mayor's proposed budget of $42 million for the Office on Aging, but an additional $3,482,000 is still needed to show up, um, as I believe Ms. White uh, indicated, um, services left behind um, for years. The budget for our legal services program has essentially been flat for the last decade, despite significantly rising costs during the same period. 73% of our funding from DCOA is for the long-term care ombudsman program, a vital service to those most in need. However, that means that only about 27% is for um, attorney representation for legal advice of community residents. Thus, DCOA pays for about three full-time attorneys but we have about nine attorneys working to achieve the objectives of the DCOA grant, which we then had to subsidize from other sources. <clears throat> While we do all that we can do to sustain our level of services, including using hundreds of trained volunteers, uh, both attorney and non-attorney, paralegals, law students, uh, to shore up our staff work, at some point something has to give. DCOA and its grantees are long overdue to receive a significant increase in its funding simply to maintain the same level of services. With flat services, we either have to turn people away or wait too long for services. The Senior Advisory Coalition has made these points, um, and I just wish to uh, reassert them here in terms of our agency. People seem to be in agreement uh, uh, with the need for significant additional funding, um, yet no increases appear in the uh, proposed budget for these particular services. <clears throat> the message implicitly, if not explicitly, being sent uh, is that DCOA is grantees and most especially seniors in the district are being taken for granted and expected to sacrifice year after year. Um, the near-term result is that more and more agencies are dropping out and they simply can't afford to provide the subsidy necessary to maintain high-quality services. If the current trend continues, fewer services will be delivered despite higher demand and the quality of services will suffer. We ask for your support and advocacy to reverse this trend on behalf of the 60-plus population of the district. Thank you very much. Thank you all for your testimony. Uh, Dr. Brenneman, I just wanted to ask about Carol Manor as we're trying to uh, shift uh, our residents from nursing homes back into um, their homes or back into independent living. What is the percentage, I guess, of um, residents of Carroll Manor that go back into their respective communities? Um, not very many. <laughs> you know, and, and why is that? I think it's, it's more of housing and, you know, people who get to Carroll Manor, it's usually because they either, there's no housing available, there may not be this caregiver structure within the family, um, to or it may be their medical needs so somebody who's requiring insulin or blood sugars you know really it's difficult to maintain in the home unless you have someone there who can do it 24 7 so usually it's medical needs housing issues and then maybe not the 24-hour support Thank you. Um, Mr. May, I have a couple of questions for you. For one, where well, you provide services 
for seniors 60 or older? And what are the requirements um, for them to receive service? Uh, they need to be residents of the District of Columbia. And um, as my testimony indicated, we're, um, we put a priority on areas of basic needs for those who are most vulnerable. So it, does it matter? Is, are there income requirements to receive? Uh, some, uh, some of our uh, in-depth services uh, that are funded uh, by various sources have income uh, guidelines that we, that we use. Um, however, we provide hotline advice services, our ombudsman services, information referral services, um, and we also have a reduced fee panel for those people who are uh, middle income. Okay, I was going to ask, are some, so you do receive some funding by those seniors who can um, pay a retainer for your services? Oh, they, they pay private attorneys who, who contract with us to provide reduced fee. Um, in some very uh, uh, few instances, we do receive uh, 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 money back from those attorneys, uh, but that's in very few instances. So how are um, seniors made aware of your services? Oh, we have a very extensive uh, community education program. We speak at, at, at community events, at forums, um, at, 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 at church and other uh, religious groups. Um, we have a regular uh, radio show uh, once a month uh, uh, um, and uh, a very vast uh, community education program. So, and I'm sure you've heard it was in the paper not too long ago about some of the seniors uh, that lost their homes due to minimal property taxes. Yes, uh, the primary were, source for that article and that series of exposés was what legal counsel for the elderly. So Those you, were our clients. They were your clients, okay. So is that still an ongoing problem at well, this time? Because that dated back to like 2007. Well, a as you know, the uh, council has uh, passed unanimously a law to address many of these issues. Now, that law does not go into effect until the next fiscal year, so there are some lingering issues with regard to the transition period. Um, but we're very hopeful that uh, in the coming year we will have addressed um, many of the issues regarding the tax lien situation. Thank you. Thank you all for all of your advocacy. Thank you. Thank you. I'd like to call up our next panel of witnesses. Uh, that would be Dr. William Merritt, Time Banks USA, Dr. Edgar Kahn, and Ms. Deborah Frazier. Dr. Kahn? No, he just, he was here. He kind of stepped out of the room. Can we defer to some others and come back? <laughs> well, there's a panel of three. I'm one of the Are, three. Okay. Are the other two here? Thank you. Okay. Can we defer or? Or do you want to, yeah, do you want to wait for the next panel? Yes. Okay, that'll be Thank fine. you so much. I'll call up the next panel, Don Quattlebaum, Project Director, Seabury Ward 5 Aging Services, Regine Clement, Seabury Project Director, Home First Residences and Age in Place, and Lester Wynn, Project Director, of Seabury Connector. Is Mr. Joseph Resch here as well? Yes. You could, since this is a panel of four, if you, you all could squeeze in. Okay. And we can bring another chair up there for this one panel. Thank you. Good morning, and you may proceed, Ms. Quattlebaum. Good morning, Chairman Alexander and the members of the Committee on Health. My name is Dawn Quattlebaum, and I'm the Director of Seabury Resources for Aging Ward 5 Aging Services. I am also representing the Director of Seabury Ward 6. I am joined by my Seabury colleagues, and our mission is to provide personalized, affordable services and housing options to help older adults live with independence and dignity. Thank you for the opportunity to testify before you today. I have submitted letters of support from legendary Ward 5 ANC commissioners and our Ward 5 advisory council members who could not be here today. 
Seabury is a member of the, of the Senior Advisory Coalition, and our colleagues are here today. We serve moderate to low-income seniors who depend on our services as well as dedicated caregivers. We provide essential case management, counseling, and crisis intervention services. Our agencies coordinate life-sustaining home-delivered meals and serve meals and coordinate activities at 17 nutrition sites. Our activities help prevent isolation and encourage socialization. We schedule thousands of hours of health promotion activities and provide nutrition education sessions and one-on-one -on -one nutrition counseling to promote healthy lifestyles. Weekly telephone assurance calls are made to those who live alone and in Ward 5, an emergency food pantry provides a vital service. In addition, Seabury Ward 5 operates a citywide senior center for the blind and visually impaired for over 25 adults. We are very thankful for increased funding this year and depend heavily on D.C. Office on Aging grants. Ward 5 received $165,000 from the D.C. Council this fiscal year for two new social workers. These additions have greatly improved our response time to calls for service, reduced our case management wait list, enhanced our ability to work with more care receivers, which helps caregivers, and increased medical placements and our connection with Adult Protective Services. DCOA also provided increased funding for caregiver services and new funding from a home delivered meal coordinator and lent their staff to assess everyone on the home delivered meal wait list. New slots were created and now this wait list is non-existent. It's our understanding that the new social work funding was one time, which would have reversed our recent achievements and improved service delivery. Since Ward 5 has the highest number of 85 plus year olds in the city, the frailest seniors in the city, we need to maintain this department as is and not reduce its effectiveness. Ward 6 also received a home delivered meal coordinator and two new social workers and this funding is included in next year's budget. I have outlined two case management success stories just to demonstrate the positive impact our social workers make in seniors' lives. We plan to submit our 2015 DCOA grant application in order to continue to fulfill our successful mission. Both agencies need to not only maintain our current funding, but need additional funding. And we are requesting additional funding for the DC living wage rate and new staff. We support, we continue to support the Office on Aging as they are an important partner in our mission. We look forward to continuing to work with Dr. Don Chompson and his staff. The Office on Aging has significantly increased our 2014 budgets. However, their underfunding undermines our ability to properly serve current and future seniors. Your leadership and the D.C. Council's support is crucial in realizing additional funding to be a stronger community partner. We are depending on your continued support and the D.C. Council's agreement to not only maintain what Mayor Gray has proposed for next fiscal year, but to increase this budget by $3.5 million for the Senior Service Network. Thank you for your support of the district's older adults and for the opportunity to appear before this committee today. Thank you for your testimony. Good morning. Oh, good morning. Uh, my name is Regine Claremont, Council Chairman Alexander and the committee. I want to thank you for the opportunity to uh, speak on behalf of Seabury Resources for Aging's Home First Residences and Age in Place programs. Um, we are part of the Senior Network as well as the DC Senior Advisory Coalition. I wish to also thank the Ward 5 ANC commissioners and so others might eat some uh, collaborative partner um, with um, assisting senior, homeless seniors. I'm here to support uh, the mayor's f fiscal year 15 proposed budget of 42 million as well as the additional 35 million that is needed to shore up services like mine uh, left behind for the years to continue programs to receive that have received only one-time grants in FY14. As a community-based provider, our partnership with DCOA is invaluable, and our program cannot exist without its technical and financial support. We are deeply grateful for the 266,000 increase that we received in last year's funding. We are also grateful for the Department of General Services that provides the maintenance and repairs to the district-owned homes. As the senior population continues to grow, many older adults face economic hardships such as not being able to afford to remain or maintain their homes, adverse poverty, homelessness, and the rise of health care costs and the lack of affordable services. According to an article earlier this year in Washington Post that talked about the Affordable Act and Medicaid, 
um, transitioning people back into the community, the in-home care cost is between thirty to sixty thousand dollars, as opposed to nursing home placement in the district of one hundred and ten thousand. The article further supports the need for the district to invest in preventable programs such as ARGE and affordable housing services. Secondly, the lack of affordable housing in the district is staggering. DC now rates second to Hawaii as the, sec the second most expensive place in the United States, beating New York and California. In addition, homelessness among seniors is rising. To give you an example of uh, the issues with transition and lack of affordable housing, I have a story of a recent resident we just admitted into our program last month. His guardian, he has an appointed guardian that um, since 2009 to 2013 attempted to transition him out of nursing home placement back into the community but could not find anything that was affordable. In 2013, she was able to transi transition him into a licensed group home. However, that group home lost its license and it took her another 10 months to transition uh, him into our licensed group home uh, operated by the Department of Health. Since 1981, Home First Residence has provided three distinct family style affordable and supportive services to at-risk seniors. Our seniors c come from all walks of life formerly incarcerated to in, in a per practicing attorney. Two of our seniors have resided in our program for over 27 years. Mm -hmm. One of our facilities is 24-hour staff, community-based, and we have two other independent living homes. The average age of our seniors is 74, and the length of stay is 11 years. The average cost to be in our independent homes is $333,000. We also have an age in place program. It's an intergenerational program that assists seniors in wards four and five. We provide free house maintenance and yard work to seniors. Each of these service site visits are valued at $100 in the cost per hour, the average private cleaning service in the district. So we've saved seniors almost $22,000 in in-home and yard maintenance fees. We Thus, this, for, this fiscal year, we served over 169 seniors and with the support of over 1,000 volunteers. As my colleagues have stated, the additional dollars for the city is vital. DC's, DCOA support is critical in operating our programs. Unfortunately, 250000 of last year's dollars is deemed as one-time funding. The loss of the funds would be catastrophic and would regress back to um, uh, fiscal year 13 dollars 25 percent comes from service fees 42 percent would come from grants and contributions home force like many other nonprofits who testified today face many challenges in meeting the growing demands of affordable housing and an aging in place services home first continues to add it on their waiting list and direct seniors to other community services when possible if we do not receive the additional 250000 to annualize its year's funding to sustain the program, it's highly unlikely that the program will continue to exist, both age and place program and residences. My request to the council is that DCOA continue to fund the program at the current level of support. I want to thank you very much for this opportunity. Thank you for your testimony. I will reserve my questions until the entire panel speaks. Now, you, thank you. Good morning, Chairman Alexander and Council Members of the District of District Committee on Health. I am Lester Wynn, Program Director of the Seabury Connector Transportation Program. I am delighted to testify before you, for you and members of the City Council on behalf of Seabury Connector. The Seabury Connector is a curb-to-curb -curb medical transportation service providing services to senior citizens residing in the District of Columbia who are 60 years of age and older. I want to thank the members of the City Council on behalf of Seabury Resource for Aging and the senior resident of the District of Columbia for the $1.5 million with an additional $3 million increase from DCOA and the Mayor's Office for FY 2014. This increase has allowed the connector to purchase 43 new vehicles, expanded our hours of services, and increased staff training. As a result, these improvements have increased our, ride our ridership. To improve our operational efficiency, we are purchasing state-of-the-art scheduling, reservation, and fleet management software. 
Our growth has required us to hire seven additional drivers and expand the number of reservations in our service center. Our service center receives requests for transportation and call-in ride services for, from 7.30 a.m. to 6 p.m., Monday through Friday. We also expanded our hours of operation to accommodate dialysis and medical appointments on Saturdays from 8 a.m. to 5 p.m. In addition, this summer we will be expanding our service to provide transportation for groups of 10 or more seniors. Our staff continues to provide an aggressive outreach program to our senior citizens. We advertise these services at nutrition sites, wellness and dialysis centers, weekend feeding sites, and senior living communities. As an example of our services, the impact of our program is best illustrated by the, of the appreciation of the wife of one of our dialysis clients. For nearly 10 years, we have been providing transportation uh, for, for Mr. T to his three-day dialysis appointments. When he passed away on March 3, 2014, his wife was so appreciative of the care and attention that we provided that she invited the entire Seabury Connector staff to participate in his memorial <laughs> service. And she gave up the staff a huge basket of fruits. Our marketing also include the district, uh, include distributing of brochures, flyers, magnet posters, and pens. These materials are endorsed with the connector phone number, making it easy for our riders to request transportation. Transportation, in addition to English, our brochures are in six different languages. Our service center has the capacity to translate our conversation for these riders who has who first last who first language is not English. This month, Connector will mark our service in all eight wards of the city. Our first event will begin on May 9th, and with the last event on May 30th. Seabird Connector pres presently maintain a vehicle fleet of 58 vehicles. Ten of these vehicles have mileage of over 100,000 miles. As safety is our first priority, we anticipate to replace these vehicles during this fiscal year as the demand for services grows. We plan to add an additional 43 new vehicles within the next 60 days. The demand and need for our services is great. Our service center currently receives over 100 new requests for transportation from seniors every day and provide rides to over 150 cl uh, clients each day. This is in addition to our um, geriatric daycare centers. We also provide services to four different geriatric day daycare centers citywide. We recently have expanded our service to provide our riders with alternative transportation before and after our regular service, service day. These services are available in early morning, evenings, and weekends. And this expansion allows us to co cover existing transportation services gaps. While Seabury Connector serves the entire city, most of our riders live in Ward 5, 7, and 8, with our largest number of re requests coming from Ward 7. With additional funding, we can continue to provide safe, friendly, and accessible transportation to all the district seniors. Despite the increased demand, we have strived to reduce our clients' wait time. Increased funding is essential to, con to the connector to continue to provide service to our clients within 45 minutes. In partnership with the D.C. Office on Aging, Seabury Connector is becoming the ex exemplary of senior transportation, and we need additional funding to make this happen. Our growth requires Seabury Connector to purchase additional e uh, equipment, hire new drivers, and secure expanded office and parking space. Some of these costs we are facing include five, 503, 271 increase in thousand, I'm sorry, in needed to replace 11 vehicles. The fleet will increase from 58 vehicles in October 2014 to 78 vehicles in October 2015. 5,000, 
11 to a 19 increased personnel cost to hire 10 additional CDL drivers, 400,000 in new occupancy costs projected to accommodate to increase staff and fleet. Ongoing mandatory safe driving training is provided to all of our drivers. This extensive training includes road safety, defensive and distractive driving, techniques, first aid, and CPR. CPR. Our drivers are trained to provide excellent customer service, customer service to the elderly and those with the development disabilities. With your help and support, Seabird Connector will become the best senior citizen transportation service service in the District of Columbia and a national model, model for others to replicate. Thank you for permitting uh, me to testify on behalf of the Seabury Connector Transportation Service. Thank you all. You know how you all have the upper hand because I was always taught to respect my elders so I can't cut any of you off. <laughs> I feel terrible about that. <laughs> Thank you for your testimony. <laughs> Mr. Rash, go right ahead. Chairman Alexander and members of the Committee on Health. My name is Joe Resch. I'm the CEO of Seabury Resources for Aging. This year marks Seabury's 90th anniversary of providing services to older adults in the District of Columbia. As a member of the Senior Advisory Coalition, Seabury supports a, a $3.5 increase, million dollar increase in the DC Office on Aging budget. Maintaining the same budget for the DC Office on Aging and for Seabury's programs means falling backwards. This fiscal year has been a step forward and we can't afford to freeze funding at the 2014 level and ignore the needs of a growing older adult population. One common financial challenge for our programs that has surfaced since we appeared before the committee in February is the existence of the living wage law that establishes $13.60 per hour as the minimum wage in 2014 for DC government and grantees with 50 or more employees. This applies to Seabury. Our current budgets were developed and approved without knowledge of this regulation and our efforts to hire older adult workers from the senior employment programs into positions that paid more than the DC minimum wage has become a fi financial liability. Seabury is fully supportive of the living wage, but we need more support to meet the requirements. Looking forward to keep pace with the living wage for 2015, we anticipate we will have to um, provide a 2% increase in personnel compensation. If there isn't an increase in funding, positions will have to be cut, and that means a cut in services. As my colleagues, Mrs. Quattlebaum and Ms. Claremont stated, we're here to, to make a case that we need 165,000 for needed social workers in Ward 5, that 266,000 of funding for home first residences and age in place programs benefiting more than 300 seniors continues in 2015, and discontinuing these uh, funds threatens the viability of the residential services for formerly homeless residents. Seabury Connector, as Ms. Wynn described, provides critical transportation services. The council and mayor gave a great infusion to Connector in 2014, and we're transforming the service, expanding hours, shortening wait times, and creating a model urban transportation service. We're expecting new vehicles in the next 30 to 90 days, growing the fleet from 58 to at least 78 vehicles. Outreach thus far has been measured until our vehicle resources are in place, but already requests are increasing substantially. To maintain the momentum, we need 503,000 in capital funds to replace 11 more aging vehicles, 511,000 in funds for additional drivers for those vehicles, and 400,000 in funds to house the new fleet and expanded staff. We want the council to be proud of a first-rate service and ask for these additional funds for a Seabury connector. Everywhere you go in D.C., there's new construction, new businesses, and signs of a thriving economy. We're here to advocate that D.C.'s older residents are not left behind in the shadow of the city's growth and prosperity. On behalf of Seabury Resources for Aging and the 10,000 seniors we serve, thank you for giving us the opportunity to present today and for your passion and support for aging services. 
Uh, thank you for your testimony. So what is the total in capital funds and then operating um, funds that you're requesting? Um, I just want to be clear. The total in capital funds is the 500 and um, 503,000. Mm -hmm. Right. And so for operating? Um, for operating, um, it's the, um, um, it's about 900,000. So that, that is requested to cover additional drivers uh, and two of the programs that you mentioned. Addi no, additional drivers and uh, occupancy costs. This is for connector. Um, for Ward 5, um, we're asking for continued funding of 165000 for two social workers that this year were in a one-time uh, grant position. And for home first residences in age and place, 266000 to continue uh, the existing services. Well, so the capital dollars would be almost a mil. Um, Almost a million dollars in because you said funds to house the new fleet. Uh, it would actually be a staff. lease. It would actually be a lease arrangement. So oh, okay. I don't think it falls under capital. Okay. Um, our requests are included in the 3.5 million uh, that uh, the Senior Advisory Coalition has requested. Okay, so this would be a substantial portion of that 3.5 million. It would be. Is that? Let me be clear. So the million dollars for the transportation and the service um, net network providers. Service network providers, and I believe the the top couple of items on your list um, are the social workers for Ward Five and two hundred and fifty or sixty thousand for Home First. Okay, I'm just curious because you gave um, some startling statistics about the number of homeless seniors in the District of Columbia or the number of seniors um, in need of housing in the district. How much annually does it cost um, for one senior to, um, to provide all these services to a senior? About from housing to to health care, to transportation, to food, I mean everything. Everything that you provide to house a senior, what is that annually per senior? Would any of you estimate? Um, hmm. And there's a reason why I'm asking us. Yeah, I, I think it's, it's an excellent question. Um, I do know for our licensed community residential facility, it's pretty much $36 a day for 24-hour care, including nursing, social work. 24-hour um, care staff support because I'm looking I know that um, there's a model and I'm wondering has anyone ever considered I'm going to look in into it and see what I can do for senior foster care in the district like we have foster care for our young people has anyone ever explored foster care for seniors and I'm wondering if that would be something feasible that we could do in the District of Columbia with this amount of seniors out there in need of housing. What, have these seniors, they don't have any family members and no support. Does one try to look and see how they can receive housing or if there's any family member to take care of them or? Um, Again, for, for the for my program, um, the seniors come from all over. Some we have two right now uh, who have no family. We are it for them. Um, they are our longest standing. Actually, three. Uh, they are our longest standing seniors. But there are. I mean, that is a question that you would ask to try to see if there's any way they could be placed with someone who can provide yes. care for them? Most of the seniors, by the time they become chronically homeless, have utilized, um, you know, family, you know, attempted to live with family, have attempted to um, look at other options. But because of, of uh, health issues, um, lack of work, and things of that nature, they fall into that gap. So I'm wondering, would that be something that we need to look into? You think it's feasible to have a senior foster care program? Yeah, I think that's a great idea. <laughs> Thank you. I just thought of that.
<laughs> but I'm really going to look into that because just like we, you know, adopt children, I think it would be a great idea. I would adopt a couple of seniors in this room. <laughs> Thank you all for your testimony. I'm going to look into that and follow up. Thank, Thank you. you. I would like to call up our next panel who is actually coming up now. Dr. William Merritt, Time Banks USA. Good morning. Good morning, along with Edgar Kahn, or is it Edgar Kahn? Kahn. And Ms. Deborah Frazier. Thank you for your patience. And Ms. Frazier, you may proceed with your testimony. Oh, it wasn't ready to proceed. Okay. <coughs> Good morning. My name is Deborah Frazier. I am a DC resident and a long-term, long-time community activist in the District of Columbia. I've been doing activism and organizing uh, in the city around housing, HIV care, and uh, general support and informing community. Towards that end, I became acquainted with Time Banks as an issue, a model, and a way of strengthening communities and adding to the knowledge that the community has. My ask here today is to include the Time Bank model in the state plan to address the issues of providing respite care for folks who are taking care of seniors and wraparound care for seniors who are in need of such things. Um, I submit that There is a need for seniors to have support because what happens after 6 o'clock and from 6 p.m. to 6 a.m. and on the weekends, there are wonderful agencies that are doing wonderful things and people go home at 6 p.m. What happens after that? What happens to those seniors? I'm concerned for my community. I am ooh, a senior and I get to survive because friends and family assist me with the issues of my daily living. I'm concerned about the other seniors in our community that do not have support. Let us note that a society is judged and evaluated on the basis of how they deal with the least and the most needy of their residents. And as others have testified, seniors are, um, are in need. There's a growing population who must do something to address their challenges. Uh, I submit that the Time Bank model is a proven model uh, for 20 years in 43 states. This model has helped seniors coming out of care, coming out of nursing homes, and then enabling seniors to stay and age in place. Successful models include um, Allentown, Pennsylvania, where uh, people coming out of hospital are attached to uh, residents and family members and support uh, for them. There's Visiting Nurses um, Association run entirely through time banks and volunteerism, per se, in uh, New York. Submit stories. Here are stories. One, our own Office of Aging Director has a wonderful story that he was given a call late night around 10 p.m. cries emitting from a senior's home. What's happening? What's happening? It seems that senior is being emotionally and physically abused by someone who she kind of trusted that turned out to be a nefarious character. And he came to her aid at 10 o'clock at night. We submit that there are some other ways that, that our director is very concerned, but there are some other ways or community models. If that senior had wraparound care and support, neighbors who were looking out for her, who were concerned about her, then her needs could have been met. Other stories. One lady was moved to, lives, uh, in, lives independently in a senior building. She went to meet, she went to hospital for her knee. She wanted to come home. She could not because she didn't have family members, she didn't have neighbors who were organized to connect and support her. So she spent an additional two months in rehab when she really didn't have to because there was no one to do her mail, run errands for her, etc. We submit that this model would help with that. There are um, working seniors, um, um, working senior who has family members who are not supportive of her at all. She's paying family members to help her clean up and do things. They run off with the money. We connected her with someone in her own building down the hall, a youth 
who after school goes to help her. He does errands, he cleans the house for her, he goes back and forth to the grocery store, another model of support. Um, we note also that um, respite care is necessary. There are, um, we are in-betweeners, so we do have our elder mothers, fathers, aunts, and uncles that we're taking care of while we're raising our own families. There are many people who come home from work, run off to their, to their mothers or fathers who are home by themselves and they go to do the little support things that they need to do. There are home health care aides working 10, 12 hours a day, seven days a week. How do they get support? How do they keep caring for themselves? Where do they find the energy and the recreation and the release for them to continue to support our neighbors? Um, I tell another story about the senior who um, was early in Alzheimer's, but well taken care of in senior building. His daughter comes to visit him every day. She came, she left him about 5 o'clock, 6 o'clock. He decides he has to go to the hospital. He goes out of the, he's heading out of the door. The folks in the building are relaxing in their lobby. They see him going out the door. He's going to the hospital. They're saying, you can't go to the hospital. He's calling the cab. He's trying to get in the cab. So they spend an hour talking to him, coercing him, calming him down, saying, you don't need to do that, da, 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 let's take you upstairs. This is an example of families, neighbors, and community supporting each other around those things and those stories. Um, saying that most time banks, which is an informal system of care, please create a model, please add to the state plan an informal system of care that would allow people to help each other in the time banks model is a reciprocity piece. So if you go and help someone, you can get help from someone else. In answer to the question, Congresswoman, Councilwoman, maybe Congresswoman, for a slip that you presented uh, in terms of the senior foster care model. The time banks model could address that uh, issue by providing um, a care brigade or a wraparound care for a senior. So you could have a little team around a senior, which would be someone who would take you back and forth to your doctor's appointment, someone who could come and do some cleanup for you, someone who could cook for you, and it would you could age in place or you could do seniors together in a like um, a shared apartment setting, and there would be people who could provide those support services, because most seniors, many seniors are able and able by and they need that general support. So again, our ask is care for our seniors, support the folks that are already um, existing, do uh, add um, um, the time makes model to every ward, and in this way we can support things. And note that we look to support the efforts of all the wonderful agencies and groups that are here today, not to compete with them. What happens after 6 o'clock? What happens um, in the morning? How do we support that? We suggest that we can do that with time banks. We look forward to continuing to help our seniors and others. We've got some proven models. Let us get it done. Thank you. Thank you for your testimony, Ms. Frazier. Mr. Kahn? Uh, Council Member Alexander, uh, I'm Testifying both as uh, the CEO and founder of Time Banking, but also as distinguished professor of law <clears throat> at the UDC David A. Clark School of Law. My late wife. Thank you, and I uh, Mr. Conner. If you could just adjust your mic, just move it down. So, my late wife and I were the ones who founded the Antioch School of Law, and before that, I founded uh, the National Legal Service Program. Jan May is one of my students. And my students also are, are assigned uh, for community service to work with legal counsel for the elderly. I invented time banking, which, by the way, now has spread to 43 states, but it's not, and to 37 countries. It's not in its home territory, which is Washington, D.C. I want to br bring it home because it generates, it's generated at least 2 million hours of service in other places in the United States of people helping people. I invented it because it was clear to me that we would never have enough paid staff, we would never have enough paid programs to do the job. Yesterday I, I met with uh, and was on a, uh, the, uh, a, a panel 
uh, with Cheryl Christmas, who runs the, the foster grandparent program. She, she has a hundred waiting people to be foster grandparents. And I'm saying, well, why couldn't they be organized in a time bank to help all those seniors who are raising grandchildren who are under stress? Because we need, we can, there'll never be enough money to deal with everything we'd like to do, but there are enough people and enough talent and enough capacity in this community. You put 10 people together and they can do uh, anywhere between 100 and 150 chores which are not on their list. I ask my law students, do you know how to tie your shoes? And they say, yeah. And I say, well, do you put that on your resume? And they look at me like I'm crazy. I say, well, there's a, you know, there's a preschool child who could benefit from that. We don't begin, we think in terms of what we sell on our resume, but we can do so many more things. And this community is rich in capacity, but we don't know what our next door neighbor can do. We don't know. Uh, we live next to each other as strangers. We ask them something really personal, like, do you think it will rain tomorrow? But we don't know what they can do, and we don't know whom we can trust. Time banking is a system that creates, like a credit card, a membership based on trust, where you develop a track record where every hour you give counts as an hour credit in your bank, <coughs> and you can give that to a nonprofit, to the faith-based organization you're part of, uh, or to a family member. Many of us uh, can do things for others, but our children bring home uh, homework and algebra that we don't know how to do, but somebody's got a teen daughter who can do it. So we need to reweave that. And if you're going to think in terms of a brilliant idea of senior foster care, we need to amplify that, not just with the money positions that it would cost, but with neighbors helping neighbors in a way that really rebuilds community. My specific recommendations are that, uh, and finding as, as a lawyer is that I, th I find the state plan of aging, frankly, legally insufficient because it fails, fails to deal with informal care. The Congressional Budget, budget uh, Office says that 55% of the care that keeps people out of nursing homes is informal care. The AARP thinks it's closer to 80%. Uh, they value it at $350 billion. Uh, uh, the state of Virginia, which does list informal care, they have a budget of $500 million for the state. They estimate that the value of informal care in the state of Virginia is $10 billion, 20 times what, they, what their budget is. A failure to look at, stimulate, and grow informal care, I think, is a legally insufficient is, is a critical issue. We think that the lead agencies are critical agencies, but that they need to explicitly address informal care, because it's not just what their social workers or staff can do, but the very people whom they're helping are capable of helping others, giving companionship. When my, when my wife was dying of cancer, the most important thing I could do for her was to get, use a time bank so that somebody could do her hair in the hospital. It's, it's basic stuff. It's Obamacare will not walk your dog when you're in the hospital, but your dog is, is important to you. So I'm saying we need to rebuild uh, that informal care. The stories that you heard Deborah Fraser, and she's working for Bread for the City, which has started a time bank. Uh, Dr. Merritt is working with uh, Carver Terrace. Uh, we have two letters from lead agencies, both Family Matters and East of the River Collaborative, want to use time banking, but there's no funding for it and no earmarking and no budgeting of it. And I would suggest that you at least uh, earmark 10% of what the Office of Aging does. Don't use the word earmark. Care. That's a bad word okay. in the District of Columbia. Well, that <laughs> I, I, think th I think that they ought to have as a priority, as a specific area that they look at to augment their plan so that we do informal care. And I think that, uh, that, uh, that there ought to be some pilots that utilize it because, for instance, in New York City, the Visiting Nurse Service has uh, 3,000 members, uh, a time bank in Chinatown and Lower Harlem and in Brooklyn generating literally millions of hours, keeping people out of nursing homes, enable people to come back. And you're being sued already on the Olmstead Act uh, because you're not bringing people back fast enough. And when they come back, they don't have the informal care necessary to supplement the formal care. So I think it's a critical priority to, to earmark informal care. Uh, thank you for your testimony. Dr. Merritt, hello. Good morning. Uh, on behalf of uh, Time Banks USA, it's always an honor to be able to uh, greet uh, Honorable 
City Council Person, Ms. Alexander, we thank you for allowing us the opportunity to address, uh, address you in your committee. Uh, Dr. Kahn and Ms. Frazier basically have summed up uh, our desire. There was a question that you asked me, and you may want to ask me that again. How much? Well, I, I, I've sent you a budget. And of that budget, we look at the price associated with uh, our effort being at $400,000. But uh, time banking uh, absorbs half of that. Uh, through other funding mechanisms, and we're only asking uh, to be included in the budget at a uh, total of $204,000. We feel that this is a minimal amount uh, as it looks for the return on the investment. Uh, we all know the statistics of the uh, aging community, baby boomers turning 65 at the rate of 10,000 a day. Each one of us in this room are either seniors such as myself, uh, Dr. Kahn and Ms. Frazier, or we know people that are. <laughs> and we all know the need of, of our seniors are to age in place and to have golden years. I was fortunate enough to be able to care for my grandmother and my mother, uh, but families are no longer available as they were previously. And so the informal health care, as Dr. Kahn uses the example of walking the dog, well, if someone's in a hospital, walking the dog is kind of important. And uh, there are many, for instances, that time banking can serve. We're presently uh, uh, working with Senator uh, Hayes on the uh, Special Committee on Aging. Uh, we're looking at implementing the informal health care time banking in the state of South Carolina, Florida, as Ms. Frazier has already stated, we're already in a number of other states, California. But Dr. Kahn, when he said to me uh, over a year ago, he said, we're not home. We're not in the District of Columbia. And we as a nation, and we as members of the District of Columbia, should be the example, in my opinion, to lead and to show by example. I want to commend Dr. Thompson for his vision. Uh, his support of time banking, uh, both in uh, uh, written form and uh, in conversation with him and his staff, uh, we're ready to move. We know from the 20 some odd years of being in time banking, we have time banking members. Uh, Dr. Khan speaks of our 43 states. Well, we're in 37 countries as well. So time banking is not a novice idea. It is a proven, established a program uh, or programmatic piece of people working together. Uh, you talking about uh, the foster grandparent? You come up with the idea, I assure you time banking can implement it to serve the needs of folks who are not being served. We commend all of the formal care agencies, lead agencies that are being funded. We think they're doing an excellent work and meeting the needs but there will never be enough money we will always continue to grow our senior population everybody can't be young like you miss alexander so we got some folks out here that's getting a little old yeah i'm snoozing yeah i'm snoozing i'm doing it so uh, we uh we we feel we feel that we have the capacity we feel that we have the know-how and we feel that we have the track record that could use the District, as a, the District of Columbia as a model to replicate throughout our nation and get the credit that we deserve as the capital of the greatest country on this planet, America, and the leadership. We ask that you support us in our efforts. And I'd like to thank you very much again for having us. It was my pleasure. Thank you. Uh, thank you all once again. Now, just to be clear um, on the time banking concept, is it like a senior village, so, so to speak? I, I, I'm just wondering, so is there a list of services that are open to every senior who may need it? Like, how, how, how does one know what services are available? Well, the village, uh, the village in San Diego uses time banking as a tool. Any lead agency could use it as a tool. We don't need to be operating as a separate operation. What happens when you come into a time bank is you're asked 
what are the kinds of things you can do? Some can do home repair, uh, some can uh, uh, provide local information, some can be on the phone, uh, some can walk the dog, some know about uh, child care. And so that becomes, so yes, there's an overall list, but the databases that, that, we, that a single time bank creates is a database of the list of those members who say, I'm willing to do this. Don't call me Sunday, but you can call me uh, Friday and, and Tuesday. So say, for example, how many services um, are available through an average time bank? At upwards of 50, I would say. Uh, and we can, I can read you just a list escorting people to appointments, shopping, doing errands, helping with form filling, uh, typing letters, uh, budgeting, sewing. I'm, I'm sorry, I was, so I was told on. that when you all answer the questions to move closer yep. to the mic yep. uh, so we can hear you. So I got that. Is there an annual fee that participants would have to pay or are there states that require an annual fee to enter the program? They're run by nonprofits. Some nonprofits charge a, a membership fee. A membership uh, fee. Okay. In What's the average membership fee? Uh, it's been twenty-five dollars for the entire year. Yeah, but if we were funded, we would start it off, uh, and what we often do is start it off and say the first ninety days or even the first year is free, and after that, as you see, the use of it because. Uh, Sixty-two percent of personal bankruptcies stem from health-related costs, and so we know what the stress is on families. You, you made a very profound statement to say that informal care is the number one factor in keeping seniors out of nursing homes, and these are just some of the things that are provided. So that's why time banks uh, are so important. There's one more question I have to ask of you, and that would be, um, because you mentioned nonprofits are the facilitators of the program. Are there grants? Is there any funding source available for these um, time banks? And have you applied for any funding, federal or otherwise, private dollars? In the past, and the, and the way we were able to get going was major funding came for 10 years to experiment and develop the software and the methodology with the Anna Casey Foundation, that funding uh, ended two years ago. Uh, and how much was that provided? That was uh, roughly uh, $250,000 a year for, for 10 years, and that enabled us to develop the software. We now have new software that will be coming out that will be available on smartphones so that seniors can then find out whom they need and can make the contact directly. Uh, the, the local nonprofits, with that money we were able to set up, there are now 659 time banks in the United States and another and an equal number in England and, and uh, Japan and, and other places. So, we, so our job was to disseminate the idea. We wanted to unleash local creativity to shape it and own it. If I so, may, the, the money associated is administrative. How do we put this database in place? So we've got for 100 people saying these are the little things they can do. Well, when can you take your car and go to take Miss Brenda to the store? This person can do that for this hour. So the, so the labor, the support is no money. The, the, the funding is for a, a coordinator or a person to, to put all this in place, put it in a database or by hand, I do it by hand. Who can do this for who, what hours, at what time? So it's a matter of creating an infrastructure by which we can mobilize all these hundreds of people who can do an hour or two hours or three hours. If we have 10 people doing an hour each for one person, they've got their care, they've got their support, and we're recording it in the bank, and so there's no money. Okay, so are there p persons who are just volunteering to provide services, or is everyone who provides services expecting to get something in return? It's, it's a mix. People actually would prefer to volunteer. Very, people do not like to ask for services. They feel differently about it when they know that it's not charity, that uh, 
that, uh, th that they're going to pay for it because they're going to help somebody else. So it really facilitates their ability to request informal help. And when they come to potlucks, often at the potlucks, by the time they're finished, the agreement is they find somebody who they can help and they get and they get an agreement. So it's a matter of creating a, a whole new kind of sense of extended family. Well, now I'm aware of some of the um, particular wards in the city having senior villages. Have you assessed the success of those <coughs> in different I, parts I of the city? Ms. Alexander, we're working with uh, East of the River. They had looked at in your ward, Ward Seven, uh, about using a village, and they were funded to look at implementing the village uh, mm -hmm. concept. And we, we don't critique ourselves or compare ourselves with other programs. Uh, again, we're, we're working in the village concepts in various states, in California being one of them. But uh, one of the things that is prohibited for a lot of our uh, citizens, especially those who are economically affected, there's a cost associated with the village. There is no cost associated with our program. Other than a membership. Well, the membership is a $25 for that time banking. For the year. Yeah, so, for the year. It's so not what for is this? each individual member. I'm well, sorry. What it, it, no, it, it, it varies. Some, yeah. some, uh, so, uh, be, because because the cost of the infrastructure, for instance, many of the and I don't have a problem with. I mean, that's still a minimal fee to yeah. for a year to yeah. get oh, the yeah. services. But villages is it a monthly fee? It's no. It's an, it's a it's a yearly yeah. annual fee. Usually, is, is okay. What the villages charge. Right. Well, I'm going to look into this further. It's a very interesting concept, and I think it could benefit. Well, we we um, would be residents. we would be available, especially myself would be honored if you would uh, uh, afford me the opportunity to come in and to uh, maybe further discuss uh, uh, some of the particulars about this. I, I will uh, at your uh, leisure uh, try to get on your schedule to do that. And I want to end and note that say all of us are willing to help someone. Everybody's willing for people to help me across the street. People help me all the time. It's difficult for me to ask for help. So in the time they mind, if you do something for someone, then you can get some help from someone else. So you do an hour of taking the senior to the store. There's a lady in time bank that does nails. So you've given an hour to go in the store. You get your nails done for an hour. You're, you're, you're not just volunteering. You're supporting each other. You're getting to know your neighbors, and you trust them, and you can support each other that way. Volunteers are supported, and you provide a service to people, okay. too. The other thing Thank is you. the software prints out of yellow pages, so people can look in their, yellow, in their time bank yellow pages and find what they need. Thank you all for your testimony. Thank you. Thank you. I'd like to call up our next panel of witnesses, Samantha Davis, Advocacy Specialist with Some So Others May Eat, Lenora Champion, a Day Health Participant um, with So Others May Eat, and James Howard. And this is Mr. Howard. Are your other yes? Okay. There's a lag in the other room. Oh, okay. <laughs> and if we have written copies of everyone's testimony, whether you have testified previously or are about to testify, we really need all of your written copies for your testimonies. Thank you. So is this just um, Ms. Davis and Mr. Howard? So Lenora Champion, is, is Ms. Champion here? All right, well, Marla Lahat, Executive Director of Home Care Partners. Welcome. Ms. Davis, you may proceed with Thanks. your testimony. Good morning, Chairperson Alexander and committee. Thank you for the opportunity to testify this morning. I'm Samantha Davis, the advocacy specialist at So Others Might Eat. Some is an interfaith nonprofit that has served homeless and low-income individuals for, of all ages in the District of Columbia for over 40 years. Some is an active member of the Senior Advisory Coalition. We provide a comprehensive range of services, including services to more than 290 low-income elderly district residents through grants funded by DCOA. 
Our services include SOMS Homebound Senior Program, which provides case management, counseling, volunteers assisting, and facilitation of needed services to allow homebound seniors to age in place. The city's only shelter for abused and neglected elderly in the district, providing case management assistance to secure safe, permanent housing. A senior day center, providing socialization, case management, education, and meals. A summer camp program for seniors who have never had and cannot afford a vacation. Supplemental food and nutrition program that offers food bags and nutritional, nutritional supplements to seniors in need. And a volunteer program. I'm providing home care services and companionship to homebound elderly. Today I'm here to speak with you about the critical need to increase the DCOA budget by $3.5 million for this fiscal year. Uh, some is providing, currently providing upwards of 50% of cost of services to meet the demand um, of the seniors. This is common among DCOA grantees. For perspective, this year, for fiscal year 2014, we were awarded $74,000 for our senior center when our actual cost last year was $210,000. For Keener Place, we were awarded $184,000 when our actual cost for last year were $367,000. And for the Homebound Senior Program, we were awarded $76,000 when the actual cost for last year was $185,000. These discrepancies in DCOA funding and actual cost of services are problematic and a fiscal challenge to nonprofits such as some. Additionally, we now have to find approximately $17,000 in order for us to comply with the Living Wage Act. These are funds that we simply do not have. While some has been blessed to be able to finance the remaining costs of our programs thus far through individual donors and foundations, many nonprofit organizations are not so fortunate. Since 2009, six key lead agencies for the district and the provision of senior services have dropped out or gone bankrupt because the grants don't come close to covering the cost of services. Some has reached our highest fundraising abilities and thus our resources are stretched thin. For the homebound program, we have a caseload goal of 50 for this grant year, but have already exceeded that goal. In the senior day center, we have over 114 enrolled in C-STARS. We, we also provide case management for our seven residents in Keener Place for abused and neglected elderly and 43 residents of Keener House. All this is done with just two case managers and two social workers. We have a nurse for Keener Place, but would like to extend her hours so that she can address the health needs of the 43 residents of Keener House and assist in the homebound program. We have a waiting list and access of 22 persons for Keener Place for the abused and ne neglected elderly which are only seven beds. And a waiting list for the, for the homebound program is at seven currently. Additional funding for our program would largely decrease the fiscal burden on some, in addition to allowing us to increase the numbers of hours for the nurse, do a telephone reassurance caller in our homebound program, and develop a nutritional program for all the participants in our programming. We commend Dr. Thompson and his staff on the efforts they have made in partnering with service providers to ensure district seniors have access to high quality programs. However, the efforts of DCOA are outweighed by the inability of their grantees to keep up with the growing demand. For this fiscal year, we hope that you, Councilmember Alexander, and the Council find the $3.5 million to increase the DCOA budget which will improve senior access to quality services and reduce the financial burden of senior service providers. Thank you for your time and consideration. Thank you for your testimony, Ms. Davis. Mr. Howard, good afternoon. Good afternoon, Councilman Alexander. Uh, my name is James Howard, and I've been a registered voter and resident in D.C. for 20 years now, and I currently reside in Ward 7. I am testifying today about the need for increased funding for the DC Office on Aging. I want to share with you how important these services have been to me. I am currently an active participant in the Senior Day Care Program at Keener House. I decided to get involved by passing the Senior Dwelling Place sign that I saw on Pennsylvania Avenue. I knocked on the door and was warmly welcomed, and I've been there ever since. I love the program because it gives me the opportunity to form a fellowship with my peers. 
The diversity of activities make it an ideal place for me. I am actively involved in the day program at Sums Keener House. This program has helped me to make friends, get involved in the community activities, and go to places I would not have had the opportunity to go otherwise. The senior program assists others in this time of need. Without the program, I will be wandering around to keep from losing my mind. This program keeps me mentally sound. I have learned that some senior programs and programs all over the city are at risk at losing cuts I and mean, making cuts in their budget. I urge you to support these programs and to get additional funding for them. I thank you for this opportunity to testify today and look forward to testifying and to helping in any way I can. Thank you, Mr. Howard. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. My name is Marla Lahad and I am Executive Director of Home Care Partners. Home Care Partners is a proud member of the DC Senior Advisory Coalition and the DC Coalition on Long-Term Care. We are also one of the largest agencies within the DC Office on Aging Senior Service Network. For over 50 years, Home Care Partners has provided supportive home care services through the use of certified home health aides who provide assistance with personal care, light housekeeping, meal preparation, and shopping. DC nursing homes cost over $100,000 per year, while home care partners costs for the average client total only about $10,000 a year. Of course, cost is certainly not the only reason that seniors prefer to remain in their own homes. Um, our programs also support family caregivers, and you will hear about that a little bit later. I know that everyone has heard of the investigations of fraud and mismanagement among many of the DC Medicaid home care providers. Home Care Partners is not a Medicaid provider and is not among this group. Yet our DC Office on Aging clients are also low to moderate individuals, income individuals who do not have the financial means to pay privately for the home care assistance they need. What sets us apart? Number one, the DC Office on Aging supports home care partners in our efforts to ensure that our hardworking home health aides who provide service to over 400 seniors annually receive fair pay and benefits. Number two, the DC Office on Aging supports home care partners in our efforts to ensure that our home health aides are treated respectfully and are professionally supervised, leading to performance and service that is knowledgeable compassionate and ethical. And number three, the Office on Aging sets clear standards for home care partners to ensure that our clients receive case management from licensed nurses and social workers who have experience and commitment to the needs of seniors and are not focused on monetary goals that may lead to fraud or services that are motivated by profit rather than client need. All of this promotes a level of quality and accountability in the home care services we provide to DC Office on Aging clients. Our home care clients often can thrive with only 6 to 12 hours of home care services per week, a far cry from the 80 plus hours of service that some Medicaid clients receive. Our clients express a satisfaction rate that is consistently over 90%. But this level of quality service does not come without a cost. In order for home care partners to pay our aides the living wage and offer benefits, such as agency subsidized health insurance, retirement plans, and paid days off, the DC Office on Aging must provide us with adequate funding. I wish to commend Executive Director Dr. John Thompson and his staff for their responsiveness to the needs of the nonprofit agencies that make up the senior service network that deliver many of the services that seniors need and desire. Recently, the Office on Aging started a work group to reevaluate the reimbursement system for FY15, a very positive development. But these positive steps only go so far if the DC Office on Aging budget does not contain the funds necessary to make it possible for provider agencies to meet their costs. 
As a member of the Senior Advisory Coalition, I wish to support the budget request for an additional $3.5 million for DC Office on Aging in FY15, of which over $1 million will be allocated to agencies such as Home Care Partners that have had no meaningful increases in recent years. Thank you for your support of the DC Office on Aging and your commitment to making DC a truly age-friendly city. Uh, thank you all for your testimony. I got the message loud and clear with the 3.5. Uh, million dollar <laughs> increase. Uh, but I did want to ask Mr. Howard, um, what programs are offered at um, the Keener House? Okay, we have, yeah, we have uh, wellness exercises, we have meals, we have uh, a community sharing thing there, we have the commodity food services, and we also uh, get support from the food bank. So, do you also go to the Senior Wellness Center on Alabama Avenue? When I can get there. <laughs> okay. But That's it's, another problem. It is available to me. Yes, I have gone. But it's more convenient um, closer to where you live? Yes. Okay. Well, thank you all for your testimony. I do want to say um, we work with Seabury Transportation to get all the seniors there to the day program. Um, so our seniors come from ward, largely from Ward 7, Ward 8, some in Ward 6, and they get picked up, I believe, from their home um, and dropped off at Keener House at for Keener those House. who don't live there. How, how many um, seniors does it accommodate for the day program? The transportation or the day program? The day program. I think there's currently about 100 en enrolled. Wow. Um, Normally about 70, probably on any given day. Yeah. That's it. That's uh, major. And, and the, uh, the Seabury Transportation bus that we have, we have limited capacity. So the pickup is limited to 16, plus we have to have the, uh, the escorts to help us. Why, thank you. And Mr. Howard, it's an honor to represent <laughs> you in Ward 7, too. Thank you. Thank you all. I would like to call up our next um, witnesses. Carolyn Fowler Smith and Ms. Fowler Smith is Advisory Council Chair Seabury Home First Residences and Age in Place Program. Alexandra Ashbrook. <coughs> I don't believe Ms. Ashbrook is here. To my cave, is Miss Cave here? Tommy. Is it Tommy? I'm sorry. Tommy Cave, Executive Director, Downtown Clusters Geriatric um, Geriatric Daycare Center Incorporated. Cynthia Durham. Ms. Durham, come right ahead. Thank you all. Ms. Fowler-Smith, you may begin with your testimony. Thank you. Thank you. Good afternoon, um, Chairman um, Alexander. My name is Carolyn Fowler-Smith, and I am the Chair of the Seabury Home First Residences and Age in Place Advisory Council. I'm here today on behalf of Home First to ask that the D.C. Office of Aging continue to fund the program at the current baseline of $250,000. I have served on the advisory council since June of, two, two, of 2011, and I've been the chair since December of 2011. During my tenure on the council, I have seen the threat of having to close the program due to insufficient funds a threat that was greatly reduced by the generosity of this committee and the council last year. Our greatest loss of funding that led to the threat was the discontinuance of the Fannie Mae Walk for the Homeless on the National Mall. Since 1981, Home First Residences, which is located in Ward 5, provides family-style permanent shared living housing for 20 low-income seniors. The Age in Place program there has provided free yard work and general house cleaning for over 20 years, allowing seniors to remain independent in their own homes. 
Home First consists of one licensed community residential facility for eight residents and two independent homes with a total of 12 residents. There is no other housing program in the nation that provides this type of family style group living and continuum of care for primarily formerly homeless seniors. Home First is unique. These residents would be on the streets if it were not for Home First. Our residents come from all walks of life. Their previous lifestyles range from incarceration to lawyers. We have several veterans housed and one resident, the oldest one that we have there, was actually a sea merchant. Conversations with any one of them is so enlightening and very uplifting. It's never anything sad or de depressing they have to say about their life. Mr. X, who is a Belgian-born and the oldest resident, always greets the ladies with a kiss on the hand. <laughs> Mr. T makes cards for everyone, and Mr. W entertains us with his piano playing. Mr. V, who is the overseer of the home he lives in, loves jazz and checks on his fellow housemates. Mr. D, a former lawyer, loves to have intellectual conversations, especially on the subject of herbal remedies. And Mrs. M keeps everyone in check with her sharp remarks. I have participated in age and place projects, and I know how grateful the seniors are to obtain help. After each project, the smiles on their faces are priceless, knowing that they can rest safely in their clean homes and knowing that they won't receive a citation for an unkept yard. We have a wonderful, marvelous staff at Home First. Everyone works together and supports each other. The caretakers are the most professional, loving, concerned group I've ever encountered. I have visited several expensive, well-known nursing homes, visiting relatives and friends, and I have not seen the warmth, respect, and concern that exhibited by the caretakers at home first. They're always smiling and ensuring that the residents are comfortable and happy. The advisory council works really hard supporting the staff, sponsoring community outreach events, fundraising, and building relationships with the residents. Since I've been on the committee, we've had two very successful yard sales. We also um, celebrate holidays, birthdays, and attend memorial services of the residents. Each year, we have a big Christmas dinner for the residents, their families, and, friend, and the friends of home first. There's also a Valentine's Day brunch for the residents that's prepared by the council. The residents get to choose the menu and the council members do the cooking, and it's always been a fantastic event. We presented the veterans this year with frame certificates and a poem for Veterans Day. The events are all are held at, different, at a different house each time so that each group gets a chance to be the host. Not only have we established relationships with the residents, we also had the opportunity to engage with their families if they have any. Some have no families or, and some don't even have contact with family members. Home First is their family. It's just one big happy family and I enjoy stopping by to visit. When I retired, I knew that I was going to be involved in some type of volunteer work, but I didn't know what or where. And I'm so happy that one of my church members introduced me to Home First. I'm a native Washingtonian who's very invested in the success of our great city and deeply concerned about the care of our seniors. We all know the expense of maintaining a home. Can you imagine the cost of maintaining three homes? Our greatest challenge is funding. An increase in the budget for seniors will allow Home First to continue to provide the more than necessary services our low-income seniors need. I strongly support the mayor's increases for wellness programs and the continuation of last year's one-time increase for home delivered meals and transportation. And I also support the Senior Advisory Council's recommendation for the $3.5 million over the mayor's budget. Thank you so much for giving me the opportunity to speak, and I ask that my solution um, will be taken into, into consideration. Thank you for your testimony. Good, I'll hold all questions until the entire panel. Good afternoon. Good afternoon, Chairman Alexander. And members of the Committee uh, on Health. My name is Tommy Cave. 
and I'm the executive director of Downtown Clusters Geriatric Daycare Center and a member of the Senior Advisory Coalition. Thank you for this opportunity today. With support from the D.C. Office on Aging under Dr. Thompson's leadership, <clears throat> Downtown Clusters Geriatric Daycare Center offers a comprehensive system of person-centered, therapeutic, and supportive community-based services for functionally impaired older Washingtonians, including those living with Alzheimer's disease and other dementias, to help them remain in their homes and communities. Founded in 1975, our services include health monitoring and education, intergenerational programs, art, physical, occupational, and recreational therapies, extended day program, a noontime meal, caregivers respite and subsidies, uh, caregiver support group meetings, and a specialized program for persons living with Alzheimer's disease and other dementias, just to name a few. The demand for elderly care, quality elderly care, is greater now than ever. For example, at our center, where the average age is 82, our seniors are entering the program more sick and frail. 94% require assistance with three or more activities and or instrumental activities of daily living. Some come to us in wheelchairs and through our therapeutic programs are able to improve functioning to using walkers or canes. And were it not for the support from the DC Office on Aging, our elders would be at, great, at the greatest risk of institutionalization. Roosevelt said, the test of our progress is not whether we add to the abundance of those who have much. It is whether we provide enough for those who have too little. Chairman Alexander, Dr. Thompson, and the DC Office on Aging have too little. The Senior Network has too little. And Downtown Clusters has too little. We need your support to help seniors like Mr. A, who was found abandoned, living as a derelict in a shack in rural Virginia after all known relatives in the area had passed away years ago. His niece somehow found out about him and brought him to live with her in, here in Washington, D.C. When he entered the program 15 years ago, his communication skills were reduced to mere grunts. Years later, the burden of caring became too great for his niece, and he was able to remain in the community, though, through placement with Seabury's Home First program. Now, Mr. A can be seen assisting the ladies by bringing their bags in from shopping trips through our partnership with Seabury Connector. Or you may see him in physical therapy or at one of our parties dancing with the ladies. <laughs> His noontime meal comes to us from our lead agency, Terrific Inc. He has moved from a grunt to his favorite words, God bless you. Mm. Mr. A has very little. Chairman Alexander, study shows show that adult day services are a benefit to the care receiver, caregiver, and community. Our program offers a win, win, win. The senior is actively involved in programs that promote healthy, active engagement. The senior gains a new lease on life in attitude and action. The caregiver can work with peace of mind where attendance and productivity increase. Institutionalization is pre prevented, and the community receives a cost benefit. We urgently ask you to increase DCOA's budget, and I won't say the 3.5, to, to help adopt daycare centers provide for elders who are at the greatest risk, have the least voice, and have very little. Thank you for the opportunity. And in the words of Mr. A, God bless you. <laughs> Thank you, Ms. K, for your testimony. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. My name is Cynthia Durham, and I reside in Ward 5. I also am on the advisory board for Home First. And which way? This way? Okay. 
Yes. See if that is the green light on. Yes. So move it down some to see if it's okay. Now. Okay. I'm also on the advisory board of Home First. Um, every Thursday, I volunteer at the Age in Place program. One of my duties is to call the clients that receive our services, which are yard services. Maybe a little bit close because you've got a soft It won't move. Okay. Um, I also um, do surveys for the clients that we serve, uh, yard, that we do yard services for and um, help clean up their homes. When I call these people, they are so joyful for the services Age in Place give. I can hardly get off the phone. Um, they also enjoy the young people coming into their homes. It gives them a connection to the outside world. So I please ask you to support Age in Place program, and thank you for your time. Thank you all for your testimony. Yes, Ms. Durham, aging in place is what is preferred. Uh, our seniors live a much longer productive life, mm -hmm. and it's actually saving money. Someone stated in their testimony, nursing homes can cost up to $100,000 a year. Uh, so we definitely want to do that. Thank you for all that you do. Ms. Cabe, I'm sure it's a joy with Mr. A and all the other seniors, and we definitely want day programs uh, to continue because seniors need outings. They need to be out and about. And they want to be out and about. So thank you for all that you do. And the 3.5 is just ringing in my head. Uh, and Ms. Fowler-Smith, all three, you said there are three home first locations. They're all in one yeah. five? No, there are three homes within the home first residences. And they accommodate 20, 20 a total of 20 students. residents. Where, where is it located exactly? It's located um, right over um, on the same grounds where Model Cities is, at, um, 18, between, on 18th Street between Channing and Evart. Okay. You know where the nursing home is? It's, it's the nursing home is in the center, and we have one home here whose administrative offices, and the other two are on um, Evart Street. Okay, I know it exactly just, yeah. where that is. And you said that the different seniors that come there would be homeless um, otherwise if True. they did not have that. They are homeless when they come there. They are. Well, they refer to us from the social work, yes. So they are referred to us. Where are they before they get to home first? Some of them are on the street. Some of them have come from shelters. Um, some of them may have possibly, you know, been at home with a family member and they can no longer take care of them. So are there um, any health services provided there, mental health providers that come for the, Well, for the, the ones that are in the um, CRF, they do have caretakers there 24 hours a day. Um, but they, they've mental been trained to it for mental health. Mm -hmm. They have a social worker that comes in, I believe it's what, monthly? I think it's monthly. They have a social worker that comes in from um, Seabury. And you, I don't know if you were here earlier about the concept of uh, senior foster care. Yes, I was here. Do you think that that would be something that we need to take a look at in the district? Of course, of course, because housing is, is, is really getting to be a problem, you know, for, for, for um, seniors nowadays. So, you know, whatever they can do to help them. And this is all, what, this is all paid for by the district, the services, I mean, is there Medicaid reimbursement for the services at home first, or how, well, how are the residents funded? It's through the Office they, they, on Aging. They have, they, have a, they have some income, and through the DC, um, DC Office of Aging, you know, uh, most of our money used to, uh, not most of it, but some of our money used to come from grants and sponsors. The bulk of our money came from the Fannie Mae um, Walk on the Mall, which is discontinued. So and you so receive now, some private money. Right, and we try to hold fundraisers, you know, and do community outreach to try to get more sponsors and, you know, the fund, we call them fundraisers, but they're really fundraisers. <laughs> <laughs> and if there's any, so do some of the residents actually pay out of pocket for services? They pay for their housing. 
Okay. They pay for their housing. Well, thank you. Thank mm -hmm. you all for your testimony. I would like to call up, thank you, ma'am, our next panel, Alexandra Ashbrook, D.C. Hunger Solutions, Annette Leith, Ms. Leith, Chief Program Officer, Family Matters of Greater Washington, and Stacy Thweet. Project Director, uh, Model Cities Senior <coughs> Wellness Center. Ms. Ashbrook. Good, Good afternoon. afternoon. My name is Alex Ashbrook, and I direct DC Hunger Solutions, a nonprofit dedicated to ending hunger and promoting a hunger free community and improving the health, nutrition, well being, and economic security of low income residents. In the district, more than 12% of seniors are facing hunger. The impact of senior hunger extends well beyond an empty stomach. Food insecurity often coexists with lower nutrient intakes, decreased resistance to infection, increased levels of depression, diabetes, and limitations on activities of daily living. Too many seniors are forced to skip meals in order to afford the medication they need. As a member of the Senior Advisory Coalition and the chair of its nutrition work group, DC Hunger Solutions works to address senior hunger with a focus on championing the city's wisest use of key senior nutrition programs, including congregate meals, home delivered meals, the Commodity Supplemental Food Program, and the Supplemental Nutrition Assistance Program, food stamps. Together, these programs reach more than approximately 25,000 seniors, connecting them to nutritious foods, socialization opportunities, and doorways to other resources. All these programs, except for SNAP, are housed at the DC Office on Aging. A precursor to ensuring that the three DCOA administered nutrition programs can effectively serve seniors, particularly low-income seniors, is ensuring that the programs have sufficient funding. Fortunately, these three programs all receive federal funding, but the stream of federal funding is not designed to cover the cost of implementing the programs. Fortunately, the proposed DCOA fiscal year 2015 budget provides sufficient funding to help support access to these programs for food and secure seniors. First of all, home delivered meals. Home delivered meals are an effective tool in reducing hunger, improving senior nutrition, and helping older residents age in place. In recognition of the vital importance of the program and a growing wait list, an additional $1.9 million was invested in home delivered meals for fiscal year 2014. The Mayor's fiscal year 2015 budget solidifies this investment with the continuation of the $1.9 million in funding. This is a wise investment. Commodity Supplemental Food Program. The DCOA supports seniors struggling with hunger by providing local funding for fiscal year 2015 to support CSFP. This nutrition program, administered locally through the DCOA and the Capital Area Food Bank, provides a monthly food package for about 6,300 seniors who meet eligibility requirements and reside in DC. The final DCOA program is Congregate Meals, and again, the DCOA fiscal year 2015 budget provides funding to support Congregate Meals, also known as Meals with Friends. These group meals are offered to DC residents age 60 and older in senior apartment buildings, senior recreation centers, and other community spaces. While DCOA has made strides in shoring up funding for nutrition programs and addressing the needs of hungry residents, the mayor's budget did not include $1.3 million in funding to support arguably the most important nutrition resource for low-income seniors, the Supplemental Nutrition Assistance Program, food stamps. More than 5,100 DC residents receive only $15 per month in food stamp benefits. Another 2,200 residents receive only between $16 and $29 in SNAP each month. Many of these residents are seniors, seniors whose food budget is so precarious that this $15 each month is not enough to maintain a healthy diet. We are asking that the DC Council take action to increase the minimum SNAP benefit to $30 by allocating around $1.3 million in local funds to the DC Department of Human Services budget. This supplement would, would be used um, to benefit those who are receiving less than $3. $30 a month in SNAP. Investing in local 
in a local nutrition benefit will provide thousands with important resources they need to purchase healthy and nutritious food. The agency under the leadership of Dr. John Thompson is committed to addressing senior hunger and has taken important steps to improve its capacity to strengthen its use of these three key senior nutrition programs. In the upcoming year, DC Hunger Solutions looks forward to partnering with DCOA and SAC to ensure that no senior worries about getting a meal. And finally, as a member of the DC Senior Advisory Coalition, we are asking that you find an additional three point five million <laughs> <laughs> to show up services. Thank you. We're we're going up. We'll round it up. Thank you. Uh, thank you for your testimony, Miss Ashbrook. I'm just wondering for the um, the food stamp eligible seniors, would would they qualify for one of these other programs too? So they would need both, one of the meals and the additional food stamp? Yes, the Nutrition Safety Net for Seniors, um, some of the programs are based on income, but a senior can qualify for congregate meals or home delivered meals. Um, there's no income eligibility guideline. For commodity, you have to meet 130% of the federal poverty uh, guideline, but you can participate in all of those programs and SNAP. But Which is great because together they make a huge difference. No one program alone is going to do the trick. Really? So, but I'm saying even with the, the amount that a senior may get with the SNAP program already, and say if they supplemented that with the commodity food, would that, would that be sufficient at this time? For many people, it's not sufficient. I mean, there are many seniors, particularly seniors who have fixed incomes and are drawing down on their Social Security, who only get $15 a month in SNAP benefits. Um, they and they may be over income for CSFP. Oh, really? Mm-hmm. But they could still get a home delivered or congregate meal, though. They could they could access a congregate meal. Home delivered, you also have to be homebound, so you have other criteria besides that. Okay. So congregate meal, they could get that daily? Um, most sites are open Monday, Monday through, through Friday. Friday. And so maybe the SNAP could just, could, could, um, it's certainly a help to be able to access, but one, one issue with the SNAP program is that benefits were just cut November 1st um, across the country and hit every family in D.C. And another issue is that SNAP benefits, even if you're getting more than $15 a month, they don't last you throughout the month because they're based on a faulty food plan that so really have you doesn't talk to take the, you the Human month. Services Committee? We have. We've been talking to all the council members and their staff about the need to put this into the um, Human Services budget. And we really hope it will be in there to not only um, help people who are getting below $15 a month, but also to really help protect um, the district's investment in nutrition. Great. Thank, Thank you, you for your testimony. Thank you. And next, Ms. Lee. Good afternoon. Can you hear me okay? Good afternoon, Chairwoman, Alexander, members of the committee, and Dr. Thompson. My name is Annette Leith, and I'm Chief Program Officer of Family Matters of Greater Washington. I'm here today to testify on behalf of President, our President and CEO, Tanya Jackson Smallwood. As you may know, Family Matters was founded in 1882, and it is one of our nation's oldest leading social enterprises in the delivery of human and health services for individuals in need. We pride ourselves on creating and delivering compassionate solutions that empower, enrich, and elevate all ages. We do this, however, in partnership with DCOA and Dr. Thompson, the Senior Advisory Coalition, and numerous agencies throughout the region that form a network of support for those in need. We currently hold DCOA grants as the lead agency for senior services in Ward 8, and we manage Senior Works in Golden Washingtonian. In Ward 8, we provide many services. Of course, you've heard a little bit about the deaf and hard of hearing program, the provision of meals, health and nutrition counseling, long-term case management, respite care assistance, transportation assistance, and recreational activities. Our Senior Works program connects the seniors with internships and volunteer opportunities and can actually lead to paid positions. The Golden Washingtonian program is an informal club that actually combats isolation. It has events like the Miss Senior America pageant, the mayor's holiday celebration, 
the Salute to Centenarians, and the Miss Senior DC program. We are very proud to be in partnership with DCOA. And because of these programs, in 2012, we were able to serve more than 21,000 seniors. Additionally, we have a few more programs. The, the Retired and Senior Volunteer Program that sponsors volunteers, Connecting to Community Program. It's a pilot program that we love in collaboration with AARP, introducing seniors to technology, and would you believe it, social media. We also have Seniors Night Out Project, which introduces low-income seniors to the arts. We are in collaboration with the Kennedy Center for that project. But it's still an issue with those below the poverty line. There are seniors like Ms. Johnson, who is 80 years old, she lives in Ward 8, has a history of diabetes, hypertension, thyroid disease, cancer, and on top of her health issues, she has a grandson who is incarcerated, damage from a flood, just a lot of issues. The stress in her life exact, exacerbated her health issues, but Family Matters provided her with the case management that she needed to sort out her finances. We also helped her to pay her outstanding bills, get security deposit uh, back, moved into a safer home, and she's gained both financial security and independence. But it's stories like this that are very important for seniors to connect and engage with us. But sadly, due to difficulty with funding at times, nonprofits like ours find it very difficult to, to bear the cost. That is why you've probably heard that we had to provide notice last July to no longer oversee DCOA's important safety net program. Since 2007, Family Matters absorbed a shortfall of more than $2.7 million in covering the cost of that program. It was very difficult. There were a number of factors that were involved in this shortfall. Of course, it was the low rate of reimbursement, reimbursement, mandatory contribution rates, and others. But you can see that we had no other recourse but to return the program. That's why it's so vital. We do acknowledge and thank not only Dr. Thompson, but Mayor Gray and the council for helping to close the gaps in these programs by maintaining the increases in DCOA's 2014 budget for home delivered meals, expand and improve transportation, social work positions, and we also appreciate the mayor's support in budgeting an additional $2 million for wellness and related programs. I would particularly like to acknowledge the members of the DC Senior Advisory Coalition who have worked so hard to bring the need for these and other increases to the attention of the mayor and the city council. But together, there is still more for us to do. As you weigh your decision in revising the mayor's budget, I hope you think about Ms. Johnson that I just talked about and thousands of other seniors. I urge you to support Zach's request for what? $3.5 million <laughs> and their increase because we know firsthand how vital these programs are to ensure the health of older adults. The recession has had and continues to have tremendous impact on the nonprofit community. We urge the D.C. City Council to fully fund seniors programs so that the burden of providing these senior programs will not fall upon the nonprofit community. We ask you to do this so that seniors across the district have access to the programs and support they need to live happy, healthy, and fulfilling lives. I thank you for the opportunity to testify today. Thank you. Thank you. I think our senior residents are the best advocates in the city. Uh, yeah. <laughs> are there lobbyists in the room? Yes, every last one of you. Thank you for your testimony. Good afternoon. Was it is it Thweet or Thwet? Thweet. Thweet. Perfect. Good afternoon, Chairman Alexander, committee members and staff. Thank you for the opportunity to testify at today's hearing on the district's fiscal year 2015 budget. My name is Stacy Thweet, and I am the project director for Model City Senior Wellness Center located at 1901 Evart Street Northeast in Ward 5. I have served as the director at Model City since November of 2005, which is managed by Providence Hospital. I am here today to share my observations on the importance of the services we provide seniors and how the request for those services has changed over the past few years. As you know, D.C. seniors face some of the nation's highest rates of chronic disease in the nation with diabetes, hypertension, and chronic obstructive pulmonary disease in particular. The burden of chronic disease encompasses a broad spectrum 
of negative consequences, especially for those seniors who have multiple chronic diseases. These individuals are at higher risk for adverse drug effects, unnecessary and duplicative tests, and avoidable hospitalizations. Many doctors assume seniors have more support than they actually do around chronic disease management. Eating better, exercising, managing medication, regular blood pressure, and A1C checks, etc. They turn to the senior wellness centers for help. And as a community, we have a responsibility to be able to meet their needs. We support the mayor's increase for the wellness programs and the continuation of last year's one-time increase for home-delivered meals and transportation. Eight years ago when I started, approximately 60 to 80 seniors attended Model Cities program for activities on a daily basis. At this time, we see about 90 to 110 seniors who are participating in everything from fitness, nutrition, Spanish, sign language, golf, ballet, dance, computer classes, and many other social activities. Just this fiscal year, we have recruited 62 new members, 28 new men, 35 new baby boomers, with a total of 853 active members. With this number rapidly growing, there is more need for services and staff members. The maximum number of participants in the fitness class is 25, which means more space is needed. More instructors are needed to increase the number of classes, which will prevent a waiting list. More equipment and storage is needed to accommodate the additional participants. The nutrition class is filled with a minimum of 20 to 25 participants. They need a kitchenette, appliances, food for demonstrations, as well as storage space. They need a large, there's a need for a large shed for storage in order to stay within fire code regulations. The seniors really need a larger facility, bottom line. Due to the increasing volume of baby boomers, the seniors are driving the vehicles to the center and they need a larger parking lot. We currently have 16 parking spaces and four handicapped spaces. More positions are needed. For example, activities directors, social workers, re receptionists, greeters, nurse practitioners, mental health providers, intergenerational coordinators, community organizers, and an assistant director to support extended hours of operation, say 7.30 a.m. to approximately 8 p.m. on weekdays, and maybe Saturdays from 10 to 3. Now our oldest member is 98 years of age and she attends the center every day for about six hours. Now we have Miss Ollie here today. She's 82 years of age. She had a stroke in early 2011 and she joined Model Cities in October 2011. She used to come in with her walker and then she would use her cane and she would walk around the building all day. And she was standing in the back of the classes, exercise classes, and she would just step side to side. Now today, Miss Ollie is participating in five out of nine exercise classes every day and spends eight hours at the center daily. Without the funding, we cannot accommodate many more seniors. They are joining the Senior Wellness Center in leaps and bounds. So we have Model City requests your support in increasing the DC Office on Aging budget by $3.5 million <laughs> to provide more robust coordination of community services to improve nutrition and wellness programs and upgrade transportation operations. Thank you again for this opportunity to share this testimony with you. Uh, thank you all for your testimony. Is Miss Ollie still here? Yes, she is. Where's Miss Ollie? Hi, Miss Ollie. Welcome. Well, I want to know, so these are extended hours. What are the current hours of, op of the, operation? The current hours are Monday through Friday from 8 to 5. And on Monday, when, Mondays and Wednesdays, we're open from 5.30 to 6.30 for an additional fitness class for our baby boomers. Okay. And there's no Saturday hours currently? No. But you do see the need for that? I do. And you mentioned the parking lot. Do most of the seniors drive to the... Yeah. To the center, or do they receive transportation there? Most of them drive. We do have a van where we pick up 12 seniors per day. 
Um, so where do the other seniors park when they get they there? They have to park on the street. They have to park on the street. <coughs> and some do catch the bus. Okay. And there is room available to, for a parking lot? Yes, yeah. there's a lot of um, grassland okay. that could be turned into a parking lot. Well, we will look into that. I don't have any further questions for you. I thank you for your testimony. Thank you. And thank you, Miss Ollie. <laughs> Our next uh, panel of witnesses, Georgia Thomas. Georgia Thomas is a model, model city senior <coughs> wellness center. Maria Teresa Wilson. Ms. Wilson is from the Caregivers Institute. Alfreda. Mouso is Miss Mouso here? Okay. We'll wait one moment for Miss Mouso. Come right ahead, Ms. Maso, from the Hattie Holmes Senior Wellness Center. Welcome. And Ms. Thomas, you may proceed with your testimony. Um, thank you so much, Chairwoman. My name is Georgia Thomas. I retired in 2009. And I wanted somewhere to go, so I asked a lady uh, about what could I do. She told me about Model City, and I found my way there, and uh, I've been there ever since. Uh, I was excited when I got there, and I'm still experiencing that same excitement now because there's so many activities and events and uh, places that we can go. Uh, we have a wonderful fitness room. We uh, do yoga, Pilates, uh, uh, chair exercises, uh, circuit training, all types of uh, exercises in that room. But that room is always being rotated by other uh, activities and then sometimes when uh, they're doing yoga, the people that are ready to do the chair exercises, they're standing in the hallway waiting to get in, waiting for the doors to open to get in. That's how excited they are, you know, to want to exercise. We have Kojak on Monday, and everybody loves his class. We can only get 25 in, so we have to get there like going to a job, because if we're not, not there on time, we're not going to be one of the 25 and we can't do we can't exercise so like uh, my director says we have a lot of people coming in all the time we have a wonderful nutrition class they teach us about uh, eating healthy uh, vitamins all kinds of things to help yourself it's there if you want it you find every you know, kind of individual that can help you with anything. Because of Model City, one lady came in in 2013, around September, and she heard me say something about Africa. She has been traveling to Africa since 1977. So guess what? I went to Africa this March of 2014 with this lady. We have connections. There's connections, mm -hmm. and um, I uh, see that there we do need space, uh, and uh, the bathrooms are kind of old, and they do need some <coughs> updating. It would be nice to have some toilets that would flush on their own, and it would be <laughs> nice also to have uh, to have uh, higher seats for some people. 
And um, I'm just happy to be here to testify. I've never done it before. As you can see, I'm a little nervous, but I want Model City to be there for other people when they get ready and they decide that they want something to do. I want it to be there for them, and I want them to have space for the people, and they won't have to wait around. Thank you, Ms. Thomas, for your testimony. You didn't seem one bit nervous to me. Well, I was. <laughs> but I may have a few questions for you, but I'll wait until the entire panel. Thank you. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Um, good afternoon to you, um, Council Member Alexander, and all of the members of the um, Health um, Committee, and also to Dr. John Thompson from the Office on Aging. Um, I titled my um, testimony, Twice a Child, Once an Adult, A Caregiver's Saga. And I titled my testimony, Dusty, because my title is one of life's realities. And no, it ain't easy, but it's not impossible. And Ms. Wilson, if you don't mind just adjusting your mic, okay. microphone a little bit. How's this? That's good. Is that better? Yes. Okay, great. Should I start over and continue? <laughs> Continue. Okay. Um, it's not impossible when you're a part of a marvelous agency like the DC Caregivers Institute, headed by the indefatigable Ms. Kaseka Mukunde, a division of the DC Office on Aging, amply steered at the helm by Dr. John Thompson. As a former DC Caregiver of the Year and currently an ambassador to the Office on Aging, I can state unequivocally that without the assistance of the Caregivers Monthly Reimbursement Program, it would be quite unbearable because oftentimes when your elder becomes ill, you more oftentimes than not become an only child. Financial support becomes paramount. When an individual is recovering from a recovering rather from a devastating illness and is on a fixed income, the DC Caregivers Institute truly assists in stopping your pockets from hemorrhaging to death. The Caregivers Institute offers great mental health maintenance opportunities and well-deserved respite moments. We as caregivers are able to connect with other caregivers through Reiki programs, informational conference calls with experts in a myriad of disciplines. To continue these programs and develop new programs, the DC Caregivers Institute, along with the Office on Aging, must have an increase in their funding. In today's financial climate, that is the only way to maintain a sustainable quality of life. We must work in harmony to ensure that this happens. We need your help. H is for healing, E to engage in improving the quality of one's life, L to lift up the elder and the caregiver's daily spirits, and P promote all around sustainability. I cannot even begin to express to this illustrious body the importance, the necessity, and increase in the DC caregivers and the Office on Aging budget. There are no words. I, being a senior citizen, have been the primary, the only caregiver for my 88-year-old widow and post-stroke mother for over 15 years. Her care is a 24-7 requirement from daily bathing, dressing, meal preparations, med distribution, transportation, paying bills, all-around personal business, companionship, house maintenance, and when available, a home health care aid plus all medical visits. As an adult child returning home, it became necessary for me to sell my home. Although I have siblings, I have become an only child. I'm fine solo on every aspect of my mother's life and her care. So as you can ascertain, my monthly reimbursement from the DC caregivers is more than a necessity. And because I'm not the Lone Ranger in this matter, you can see even more so the need for an increase in the budget. And I thank you. Thank you, Ms. Thomas, and thank you for what you do. Uh, aside from your testimony, that's a lovely necklace you have. Oh, thank you. <laughs> okay. And I do have a jewelry business. We can talk afterwards. <laughs> 
And now I know what you're wearing. Thank you. I will talk to you. Okay. Good afternoon. Good afternoon, Chairman Alexander and committee members and Dr. Johnson. My name is Minister Alfreda Chi Mawuso, former ANC Commissioner in Ward 4, and I'm on the board currently with the Beacon Brightwood Business Alliance and Ward 4. I am testifying today about the need to increase funds for the Senior Service Network funded by the D.C. Office on Aging. I want to share with you how important these services have been for me and the others that I know in recent years. I am currently an active participant at the Hattie Home Center in Ward 4. I got involved in the program when I, was, when I turned 60 in December of last year. Why? Because I wanted to experience all of what Hattie Homes had to offer because I had to wait for six years to get in and I was there when they opened the door. And I'm very happy to be a part of Hattie Homes. I love this program because Hattie Homes is a warm and inviting center because of and because of the staff, which is open for new ideas and was willing to share the center with me immediately. I love the fact that the Hattie Homes provides support for us to maintain our mental and physical needs as well as provide day trips inside and outside of the D.C. area. It's a great place, place to fellowship and many other things. I would like to share with you that I, along with Marvie Campbell, was allowed to host a vintage fashion show for black history in February, using the seniors for models and wearing the clothing. They did an awesome job, along with the staff who chipped in with their warm spirits to allow us to use the facility, and we're both new members. 16% um, of the district's residents are over the age of 60. These programs give us the support we need to continue to be productive members of society, and I ask that you support the recommendation of the Senior Advisory Coalition to invest $3.5 in the Senior Services Advisory Coalition to ensure the quality programs are available for DC Network, and I thank you for this opportunity to speak with you today. Thank you very much. God Thank bless. you, ma'am. You have to be the baby of the I am. Homes Center. I am. <laughs> I, am. <laughs> I wouldn't believe that you were at the center, actually. Mm -hmm. uh, but I'm glad that you find that it's, it's catering to whatever needs you need. Mm -hmm. uh, I had the opportunity to visit there probably about three, three or four years ago when I chaired the committee um, before, and I haven't been there since. Is everything up to standard there at yes. the center? Yes, it is. I know that the two million, as I stated earlier, has been allocated for additional um, services, I guess. What would be something that needs to be, uh, that needs to be extended or expanded at Hattie Homes? Um, I would say the weekend hours need to be expanded. Okay. On Saturdays possibly? Saturdays. And you mentioned too, um, I wanted to mention, you mentioned you would be at home otherwise or nothing to do, so you will, you couldn't wait until Well, I would have found there. something, but I would not have found anything like Model City. Model City is a good fit for me. Mm -hmm. And the caregivers, thank you, the caregivers um, institute, they, you have to, they provide you supports that you need? Yes, it's it's like for example, um, my mother needs I call them the senior like pull ups and, and tugs for the bed and different things like that. And when you go out and purchase these things, you provide them with monthly receipts and they will reimburse you for um, those type of services, um, care services that you're providing for your relative. Which is a wonderful thing, you know. Mm -hmm. Uh, so, with regards to compensation, yeah. are you um, are you aware of the um, personal care um, program or 
Are you a home health aide? Are you certified? No, I am not a certified home health care aide by, um, by profession. I'm a psychologist. But I also um, work as an educator, and I have a business work that I do in the green environment, you know, edible walls and that type of thing. But um, it has come to that because it's been some of the agencies, and you may know this, that I have been working with have been shut down in terms of home health care aids. And my mother is not on Medicaid, she's on Medicare. So that's, okay. that's very restricting right there. I don't get the services, so I have to really pitch in. And uh, honestly, what happens is you get a little sequestered at home. And right now, and, and another thing is getting someone in your home that you can trust that the silverware will be there when you come back. You exactly. know, and, and that's a reality because we've had a lot of things lifted out of the house. Um, you know, and, and someone who is com comes to work to work and doesn't come to work just to collect a paycheck. That, that's another mm -hmm. thing. You know, no, they're not going to have the same feeling that you have about your relatives, but at least act like you do and, and provide a proper professional service. Yeah. Thank you. Well, we're going to see that all the funding is there to continue these great Thank programs so and services. Thank you. Okay. Thank you for your testimony. Okay. All right. Uh -huh. I would like to call up Ms. Lillian Stringfellow. Ms. Stringfellow is representing Hattie Home Senior Wellness Center. Marie Gilroy. Board member with the Capitol Hill Village and DC Senior Advisory Coalition. Author Bridgeport. Yeah. Okay. You're coming up. Oasis Senior Center, Ward 2. And ma'am, if you just don't mind stating your name for the record. Okay. Uh -huh. It's Tania McQueen. <coughs> Tania McQueen. Could you spell Tania, please? T A N E A. All right, thank you. And ma'am, you may begin with your testimony. Good morning, uh, Chairwoman Alexander. My name is Marie Guillory, and uh, I'm going to talk about transportation, senior transportation this morning. I'm a member this afternoon, sorry. <laughs> I'm a member of Capitol Hill Village and a member of the board there. Uh, Capitol Hill Village is a group of seniors that have organized to make our Capitol Hill neighborhood a great place to grow older. We have more than 350 individual members providing a wide range of services to our members, mostly through volunteers. Volunteers provide all kinds of services for our members, from moving heavy furniture to helping with meal preparation. But more than half of our calls are for help for transportation needs. In 2013 alone, volunteers gave 753 rides to our members. Most of those rides were to doctors or other medical appointments. Transportation is a critical need for seniors in DC and transportation becomes increasingly complicated when finances are limited. According to the latest updated U.S. Census Bureau's official measure, 16% of D.C. seniors live below the poverty line. When health expenses are considered, that number jumps to 26%. And Capitol Hill is no exception to those statistics. Zip codes 2002 and 2003 are similarly affected, and I live in 2003. This is not the time to pull back or merely maintain the status quo on funding for senior transportation. Senior transportation is an essential service for access to medical care. 
There's still work to be done to improve and expand services for seniors, and more resources are needed to do so. This is the time to demonstrate that the Council is serious and will follow through on its promise to make D.C. an age-friendly city. Uh, last year, I testified before this committee, or the committee that was considering the DCOA budget, on the basis of my experience as a WETS writer during a period when I was critically ill and was on dialysis. Based on that experience, I made five suggestions to improve the WETS service. I won't repeat those. I'm happy to say that the service, now the Seabury Connected Service, has improved. Seabury can tell you where those improvements are. I don't have to tell you. But more needs to be done. I can tell you that much. At Capitol Hill Village, we have identified critical improvements that must occur. Two of those are pertinent here, and I'll mention them. First, the DCOA-supported senior transportation system needs to establish a central point of <coughs> contact for requesting, scheduling, prioritizing, and monitoring the transportation furnished by Metro Access, Seabury Connector, the Taxi Cab Voucher Program, discounted Metro Access fares, and the Crest Door Through Door ex Escort Service. Coordination and transparency in the entire senior transportation delivery system will increase ease of use for seniors and ensure that seniors use the most appropriate transportation system for their specific need, avoiding duplication of services and overburdening one transportation method. While DCOA may not have direct control of all these services, Metro Access, for example, it can have a role in establishing a central point of contact and comp a comprehensive referral service guaranteeing that the transportation program can meet the wide variety of needs for the population so that people like Capitol Hill, for, for example, Capitol Hill Village, when we receive a call, instead of having to try to figure out where to send the senior or to get a volunteer to bring the senior to the medical appointment, can call that one referral number and immediately there's help. And that reference service then puts the senior in the right place. Second suggestion. The CIA services that are funded by DCOA should be publicized in a more effective and consistent manner. Many older adults still do not know how to access transportation services or where to turn for assistance. There's confusion stemming from the fact that each ADRC office advertises the service differently. So be, before I wrote this testimony up, I went to the various websites. I am computer literate. I went to the DCOA website and I went to the various ARDC, ADRC websites. First of all, you know, when that transition occurred from lead agency to ADRC, I don't think there was a broad uh, program to let seniors know, well, it's now ADRC. Well, what's that? You know, what does that even stand for? But, you know, it should be transparent. It should be easy to go to one website. Maybe it's DCOA. Maybe it's another one that says 
senior transportation, but there should be a way that you can quickly get to Seabury Connector, for example. But it's not, it's not easy to get to Seabury Connector if you don't know that it already exists. If you do a search and you try to find out, where can I get transportation service that I don't have to pay for, because that's what we're talking about for a senior who needs that kind of transportation service, it isn't easy. It isn't easy to do it by phone. It isn't easy to do it on the web. Uh, and it takes money to do those kinds of things. We all know that, right? It takes money, processes, organization, etc. So in conclusion, I urge you to adopt a budget that will permit improvements and enhancements to existing senior transportation services. And I'm not going to talk about all the other stuff. 3.5. <laughs> Thank you um, for your testimony. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Uh, my name is Lily Stringfellow. It's my first time here. And I'm a member of the Hattie Holmes uh, Wellness Center. I have been retired longer than I've got money. I'm one of those seniors who has outlived their money, okay? But, in the, I mean, it happens. In the pro and it's a good thing. In the process of making uh, financial adjustments and all, Hattie Holmes has provided services to me in my neighborhood, Ward 4, that I don't know how I've gotten through being a senior as easily as I have. He said, this is my first time to this, this type of meeting, and I'm glad I'm on in the evening because what went on this morning was overwhelming, the needs of the seniors in the city. I didn't know that. I guess it's just a blessing. I've been retired for almost 20 years. When I first retired, I, it, it was hard making the adjustment. I'd go from window to window looking at birth, wondering what to do. Okay, well finally I got up, I got moving, and I got into what is now called Model Cities. Uh, we go way back to Taylor Street, and it's just been absolutely wonderful. Now we're here asking for money. You asked the, uh, one of my colleagues what would she do if she had the additional funding. She was also from Hattie Home. She said extend the hours. I want to pay the people. Can we get the 10.5 uh, increase that, is that the, uh, the 10, 10 <laughs> What did I say, was that right? We're uh, taking advantage of your seat. 3.5. 10.5. Well, uh, well. Let me see if I can help you a little bit with that. We have at Hattie Holmes, seven seniors that are over 90 years old. And one of them, if you get it wrong, she'll still take you out back. Okay? So we are allowed to run, but we need money. We all need money. For me, I did not know how blessed I was until I sat through this, this session. I, I, I am just truly blessed, but I do feel for the others that are not so blessed. With the wellness centers, we have a place to increase them, I mean to improve the mind, the body, and the spirit. And that's why I'm here to ask that we get the 10.5, okay? <laughs> Thank you. That's not right. Thank you for your testimony. 3.5. Oh, I mean, 10 would be great. I yeah, guess. We do they're not gonna. They're not gonna argue that. Thank you for your testimony. Thank you. You may proceed. Good afternoon. My name is Tania McQueen, and I'm the program manager for a terrific Oasis Senior Center for the Homeless Age. I will be reading the testimony for Mr. Dwight Bridgeforth. Dear council members, my name is Dwight Bridgeforth. I am 64 years old, and I live in Ward 2. I am a homeless senior that, receive, that uses services provided by DCOA. I am a member and a volunteer of Terrific Inc.'s Oasis Senior Center. Terrific Oasis is a place where its name says it all. Oasis is a place of, hu of refuge in a desert. A lot of our guys, including me, are in desert-like situations. The desert is a lonely place, and a lot of us have no family. Ten of ten, if I didn't have Oasis, I would be wondering, trying to find stability that Oasis provides for me. 
OASIS provides me and my peers with a support system in a world where you can feel forgotten, alone, and overlooked. You have staff members who are willing to discuss your problems and listen to you no matter how small of the issue. They try to bring relevant subjects and materials with limited resources. They try to make the most out of nothing, literally. Terrific Oasis is a safe haven. It is a place where I can find myself, where I can find myself and I don't have to be myself and I don't have to worry about any fear of repercussions. The staff is genuinely concerned about our health and well-being. It is a place where I can come and feel like I have someone in my corner. It encourages me to take progressive steps in bettering myself externally and internally. Oasis provides me with the tools I need to change my life. Because of this center, I am a better person than the day I started two years ago. It has provided me with mentors in my age group and has allowed me to be a mentor to my peers. To sum it all up in one word, Oasis provides me with hope. It is a terrific refuge for seniors looking for help. Oasis has introduced me to certain things in my life that I would have never experienced. Oasis has provided me with a place to grow and has put me in touch with people that I would have never encountered in my past. I would have never taken the opportunity to try and understand these people. Now I don't see them as different. I see them as my family. I, look, I like it. It's, it, I, it feels like a place where when I can't go on, there's someone there to push me. I consider the staff to not only be employees of Terrific Incorporated, but friends, supporters, and biggest allies. They have poured into me and been patient with me, always putting what we want first. The reality of it is Oasis staffs are people like me. They are down to earth and they will and they and we see them grow daily. They are our families. The center has given me an opportunity to get my social security, to stay in touch with housing opportunities, and has also helped me to get recertified with my food handler's license. It has provided me with the opportunity to get job training. It has made me aware of staying on top of my health and health issues that I deal with through programs provided here. It has provided me with the opportunity to network with a group of my peers in similar battles and struggles. It has helped me to keep going when I feel like giving up. Sincerely, Dwight Bridgeforth. Thank you all for your testimonies. What I'm most concerned with is that, um, well, this 3.5 million mm. in summation was, a lot of it was based on one-time funding. Is that to be clear? And it's kind of hard for me to, to I guess, fathom how can we just have one-time funding for all these critical mm -hmm. services. I, I just can't understand that. And that's why we're going to have to do our best to try to find this funding. I, at this time, I can't confirm how, but, you know, I'm going to have to talk to all of my colleagues to see what we can do. If we cut this, I mean, some of these services, I don't know where our seniors would be. Uh, so definitely, we're going to have to work on that. I just wanted to ask, um, and thank you all for your testimony, it's quite clear um, that the services are needed. Uh, and I don't know when, maybe we can work on FY16 for the $10 million. Uh, <laughs> but <laughs> that's great. I wanted to ask um, Ms. Ms. Um, Gil Guillory? Guillory. For the senior village that you said you had provided 753 rides, is that through Seabury no, or is no. that through the village That's a, Those are volunteers that uh, the village itself, you, you're familiar with the village concept because I heard you discussing with the people from uh, I think it's a great concept. Yeah, and so uh, yes, through the village, our own village, Capitol Hill Village, we've provided those rides to seniors. But we we access, when we get calls at uh, Capitol Hill Village, in the first recourse, and we can't meet the demand for all of the calls that we get, and, and increasingly that's becoming so, uh, because as people get frailer and frailer, there are more and more visits. So, you know, we need the city services. We can't do it through volunteers. So in addition to those 753 rides, there even more absolutely um, absolutely in this community that use the seabird absolutely in fact I myself and I've been a member of Capitol Hill Village from the beginning in 2007 when I was ill 
I use to see where services. So the rides that you give people through your village are primarily for doctors. Local. They are doctors' visits. They're doctors. the same kind of thing that Seabury does. But remember, the before Seabury took over, the wet service had a lot of issues. Uh, so you know, we we filled in with with volunteers, and we still do because everybody can't fit into the schedule that Seabury has. Okay. Uh, but as Seabury gets better and better, of course, they're going to have a bigger and bigger problem because we're going to look to them and look in other places where we can do volunteer services for our membership. So uh, how, how is your village funded? We, and how many persons yes. do you accommodate? So we have about uh, 400 households. Uh, we pay dues. What are, what are the dues? Uh, 400 for an individual and uh, 500 for an individual, 800 for, for two. So that's annually? That's annually and we have fundraisers every year. We have huge fundraisers. We subsidize 10% of the membership. So 10% of the members do not pay that $400. So we have uh, so the 400 funds. do you break it down to pay monthly? Or do you have to pay that um, in whole? Annually. It's an but annual fee. Can you pay, you know? Once a year, yeah. Oh, once a year. So you right. can't. You can't pay it on a monthly basis for you those who are on fixed income if they could just... You know, I, I, I would never, I, I've never looked into that because I usually get a bill for the annual fee. Okay. Uh, so but I suspect if someone asked so. that, that we would do that. Okay. There, there would be no harm in doing it that way. Well, I thank you all for your testimony. Thank you. And now I would like to call up our next panel, Herbert Price, Alicia Watkins, and Valerie Clark, all from Terrific, Inc. Herbert Prince, I'm Price. sorry. Price. Oh, it is Price? Yeah. Herbert Price, Alicia Watkins, and Valerie Clark. <laughs> Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Now, I called up the Lisha Watkins and Valerie Clark, so... Well, I'm Dexter Reed, <laughs> social worker from Terrific Geek, and I'm, I'm Ms. Watkins' social worker. Okay. She asked me to uh, read her testimony today. Thank you. You may proceed. Okay. Good morning, Council Chair, Ms. Alexander, and Council Members. My name is Felicia Watkins. I am 85 years old and reside at 4418 Fifth Street, Northwest Washington, D.C., zip code 211 in Ward 4. I am a stroke survivor. I have been assisted in many ways by Mr. Dexter Reed, social worker, as well as others from Terrific Inc. Agency in Ward 4. I can call to ask any questions and have been made aware of the many resources senior citizens can receive in the District of Columbia that I never knew existed. I wasn't getting the food I needed, less sodium, so the terrific nutritionist helped me to change my diet. Since I have been in a wheelchair, I, can get, I can't get out of the house as much. Receiving transportation is very important to me. As I get older, I can use more help with my personal care, like going to the petition to get my hair, nails, and feet done. I need help with the house cleaning, yard work, and painting my house. Also, I have two dogs, for safety reasons, that need to be home and receive the vet. My pension doesn't help much to pay for all I just mentioned, so it would be nice to have some assistance for these and other areas. Being a senior with a disability, there are so many things someone like I need assistance with, and it's nice to have someone to talk to like Mr. Reed and the others, workers from Terrific Inc. Please, increase the Office of Aging's budget so that they can continue funding Terrific Inc. and other programs that can continue to help seniors who could use their many helpful services and programs. Thank you. Thank you for your testimony, Mr. Reed. Mr. Price, you may proceed. Okay. 
Uh, good afternoon, Council Member Alexander and uh, Distinguished Committee on Health. My name is Herbert Price, and I am a Ward 1 senior living at the Samuel Kelsey Apartments at 3322 14th Street in Northwestern Washington, D.C. I'm pleased to testify on behalf of D.C.'s Office on Aging, and I overwhelmingly support D.C.'s Office on Aging uh, services provided through Terrific Inc., uh, the D.C. Um, o, DCOA's Ward 1 ADRC and Lead Agency for Senior Services. My story is all too familiar. I, however, share it given that it may help another senior in need. Unfortunately, there are many other seniors dealing with serious health crisis, living on fixed income and limited resources. You know, uh, so, you know sometimes the golden years of life are a little gray. I wouldn't want anyone to walk a mile in my shoes. Painful to think about it. I, however, thank God that I'm still alive. If it had not been for Terrific Inc. Incorporated and their caring staff, I don't know what would have become of me. Approximately two years ago, I developed a chronic cough, cough that would not stop. I, con I contacted my doctor and after numerous tests, I was diagnosed with stage one lung cancer. Dur and, and during the surgery, I was also additionally diagnosed with COPD. That was a double uh, whammy. When I was released from the hospital, I was alone and, and weak and unable to, you know, base, uh, unable to stand with ex for extended periods of time or to cook for myself. I was hungry, weak, weak and frustrated. Sometimes, uh, uh, somehow, I was referred to Terrific Inc. Immediately, Dr. Levy made a home visit uh, and assessed the situation and referred me to Ms. Kaplan, their homebound meal coordinator, and I, I started receiving mom's meals. The food is great. I order what I like, and more importantly, I am, I am getting stronger every day. Additionally, I, met, I meet with um, their, um, Ms. Henry, terrific nutritionist, and she is helping me to manage my diet so I can so I can get stronger quickly and, and my medicine, make my, more, my medicine more effective. She is, uh, she is very knowledgeable. She has also conducted a, a nutrition seminars with, uh, with our whole building, and there's 150 appointment, apartments in our building, okay? La last, but certainly not least, I, I, I met Mr. Jonathan Johnson, the homebound meal coordinator, and I've, be, I've you know, established a pretty good friendship with him. I look forward to meeting with him on a regular basis, and he is frequent at our building meeting with myself and other seniors. In conclusion, I would I request that you further support DC's Office on, on Aging with increased funding for further increase to further increase the homebound meal program and homebound meal coordinator. Because of my positive experience, I have. I uh, recommended uh, Terrific Inc. to a number of the seniors in my building, including uh, uh, Hispanic-speaking seniors that are now or will shortly receive nutritious meals. Many seniors in the District of Columbia cannot afford or prepare a nutritious meal. We need increased services and responsible organizations like Terrific Inc. and DCO, uh, DC's Office on Aging uh, to help us. Please help us and thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Mr. Price. Ms. Clark, good afternoon. Good afternoon, uh, Chairwoman Alexander and other council members. My name is Valerie Clark, and I'm a resident of Ward 1, and I'm here today to share my story about navigating the D.C. resources and agencies as a caretaker for my mother. The old adage is, to whom much is given, much is required or expected. My parents, Ralph and Marion Clark, invested in me greatly. I was born and raised in Boston, Massachusetts, and moved to D.C. after graduate school. I've lived in the district for over 13 years and found fulfillment in giving back to the community. My father's sudden passing, uh, my, um, re related to my mother's decline in health, and my brother and I had to make a really tough decision and move my mother from Boston, Massachusetts to Washington last August. My mother now lives with me and she has congestive heart failure and COPD, both very challenging illnesses, but she remains resilient and active. Q 
keeping up with her appointments, her health care, keeping her active, and introducing her to D.C. is a full-time job. I serve as her health advocate, social worker, scheduler, and counselor. I somehow manage all of this while working a full-time job as a director of a national medical association. Recently, the Washington Post featured a series on caretakers. I was surprised to learn that there are 65.7 million caregivers that make up 29% of the U.S. population. I never really saw myself as a caretaker, but rather as a daughter doing the right thing at the right time. Once I moved her here, I was at a loss of where to start. D.C. has so much to offer, but I didn't know where to begin. I was referred to Terrific, Inc. by GW Hospital. After only one phone call, I had a home visit from Dr. Nancy Levy, who introduced me to many of the senior services in the district. Ms. Levy was knowledgeable and kind. After assessing my mother's health care needs, she turned, me, turned to me and asked me what my needs might be. This was surprising and much appreciated. I learned that Terrific Inc. services included programs for caregivers as well. This was a welcome relief. I am fortunate that I work for a company that has family-friendly policies that allow me to work from home twice a week so that I can care for my mother. I have extensive professional experience navigating the health care system, and at times I find myself overwhelmed and frustrated with the lack of support and resources. I often wonder how others do it with less means, support, and experience. I'm here to endorse the continued good work on behalf of Terrific Inc. programs that are offered to seniors and their families. I also feel it important to offer a few recommendations for the Council's consideration as you review the district's priorities. The first is in housing. In my research to bring my mother to D.C., I found that there's limited housing for seniors. And what I'm referring to, I call it the in-betweens, the people that aren't sick enough to go into skilled care like nursing homes, but they're not uh, well enough to live on their own or go to assisted living. They're sort of in-between. Ideally, I see a facility that has a team of allied health professionals that offers comprehensive care to residents when needed. The aim would be to deliver pre preventive care and services to keep residents in their apartments and fully engaged in the com community. As the city considers its financial priorities, I strongly urge that a creative model for senior housing is high on the list. Affordable housing is limited, but there should be a strong effort to include affordable housing for seniors and all this new construction. Secondly, transportation. We've heard uh, about transportation earlier in, in the testimonies. But unlike the housing, D.C. offers many options for seniors to get around the city for doctor's appointments. Transportation is essential for this community as many seniors and their families rely heavily on this service. Unfortunately, these free services are usually limit to, limited to just transporting seniors to health appointments. Seniors have other appointments like frequent visits to Social Security offices, social services, DMV for IDs, that are not eligible for the free or discounted rides. I strongly encourage an expans expansion of transportation services to also include social service appointments. <laughs> health companions and advocates. This is a tremendous need for what I call health companions and advocates. These individuals could be graduate students from local area colleges of public health and social services and social work that are partnered with our seniors to escort them on errands, day centers, social services, or doctor appointments. All parties would benefit greatly. The arrangement would allow caregivers a break, uh, students to get academic credit, and an education on how the health and social service system realistically works. And most importantly, seniors receive the support they need to navigate the systems and the bureaucracy. This model would be a tremendous opportunity for the city to engage our local universities and to partner to deliver a new model of care. And I'll stop there. I have another option, but I'll stop there for time. Thank you. Thank you. Well, during my questions, I can ask you what your uh, other option okay. is. But I wanted to just get clear from you, Ms. Clark, and you, Mr. Price. You were both referred through hospital visits, correct? Yes. yes. And Terrific Inc. comes out. They send someone out to your home. They sent a, a doctor, a Levy, uh, to, 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 to my home. Okay. 
and I met her, and, and I was so, in such bad shape that I didn't even re realize the full impact of, of such. So, Terrific Inc. really did quite a job for me. And, and I'm, to, what, I'm glad to say today that I'm a long, long way away from where I was. You look good. Thank you. <laughs> Do you feel good, too? Yes, except my COPD is bothering me a little bit. I think the coldness back there got me. Okay. But, but I feel pretty good. Yes. Good. Yeah. Well, and for you too, Miss Clark, so it's kind of like a, a social worker or someone who can navigate all the system. Miss right. Reed, you are what, the social that's what, worker. Yes, that's what the social workers and the other staff do. We come out to the home and we help the seniors in, in any way that we can to provide resources for them. And are most of the referrals through um, someone who has recently been hospitalized? Well, we, it's uh, a plethora of, of referrals. Of course, of course uh, the Office on Aging and other uh, friends, family, uh, other agencies. And you cover what services? Everything that they need. And, and we, we find resources any way, shape, form, or fashion. Uh, you know, we, we just do a good job of it. And Ms. Clark, I don't know if you were here, but in earlier testimony, some of the other services that you mentioned, I think that's why the senior villages or when they spoke on the time bank um, concept earlier, I think that can, you know, that can encompass a, a variety of the other services you mentioned, the non-medical yeah. appointments, the rides, the other services seniors need. I think that that would be a great concept um, for us to adopt in the District of Columbia. Some neighborhoods are doing it um, now, so if you need a ride, um, to a social service appointment, then you know someone may be able to accommodate you for that for that particular time of the day. I'm just curious to know what your other um, re re recommendation is. But for Mr. Reed, I just want to know too. You mentioned, or Miss um, Watkins mentioned, um, that personal care about going to the hair salon, nails and feet, and her, her dogs getting groomed and going to the vet? Yes. Do you, how do you assist with those needs? Well, uh, again, we try to find the resources that are in uh, the community to our clients, and if, especially free resources. So, um, Those resources you, you've obtained free of charge uh, to? Uh, some say we're still working on others, and of course, you know, uh, the, the more resources, the better that we find. So if it's a, if it's a dog grooming service out there that will provide uh, a, a minimal cost or a free cost, uh, we'll try to get that, that animal there. So, but, you know, we, we, we do the best that we can for our seniors. Thank you. And Ms. Clark, you wanted to go over your other recommendation. I'll allow you to do so. It has to do with um, energy uh, and, and electricity. So my mother has COPD as well, and there's an oxygen concentrator that runs 24 hours. Before she came to live with me, my electric bill was $35 a month. It's now over $130. And so I contacted Pepco for several reasons. One, to alert them that I had somebody with COPD living with me in case the lights go out, what do I do? Um, they then put me on a list that's sort of emergency. If the lights go out, you're the first to get your lights back on. That hasn't been the case yet, but at least I'm on the list. Uh, the second is that uh, instead of my payments going up and down, they have put me on a plan that is each month it's consistent. I think we can do more than that. Uh, the district has an opportunity here to identify people that are either on dialysis or have COPD and work with the utility companies. It's not so much about low income because there are people that are in between. Um, that need the same care uh, and the same service. Some of us still cannot pay these exorbitant amounts uh, with people who are living in our homes and, and have uh, real, real needs. And so I don't meet that criteria for low income. And my mother is living with me. And so uh, if, the, if the bills keep going up with the, the lights because we need the oxygen, it, uh, it doesn't fare well for us. Thank you. I, I know that we do have a program for energy assistance. It's, it's based on income. We may need to look at some assistance based on medical necessity um, as well. There are a lot of people who receive oxygen and 
I guess some of the, even some of the hospital beds with the air mattresses, there's a lot of additional uh, energy that's used on various medical supplies. So thank you for that recommendation. Um, I will look into that. Thank you, thank you all for your testimony. Thank, thank you. I'd like to call up, who's been patiently waiting back there, Stephen A. Nash. President and CEO, Started Baptist Home Foundation Incorporated. Paula Reichel. DC Director, Capital Area Food Bank. Dorothea Timian, Timian. A client with the Capital Area Food Bank and an extra chair is coming up is Audrey Murphy. Here to Kashwana Homes. Oh, wow. So we have, I'm sorry, Mr. Nash, Ms. Rachel, and Ms. Is Timmy, Timian? Yes. Ms. Okay. Ms. Hardy is going to read the testimony. Okay. All right. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Uh, good afternoon, uh, Council Member Alexander and members of staff. My name is Paula Reichel and I am the DC Region Director at the Capital Area Food Bank. The mission of the Capital Area Food Bank is to feed those who suffer from hunger in the Washington metro area by acquiring food and distributing it through its network of partner agencies and educating, empowering, and enlightening the community about the issue of hunger and nutrition. And today I am here to testify about the critical need for the USDA's Commodity Supplemental Food Program, or CSFP, which is nearly 50% supported by local funding. Uh, as you've heard today, Washington, D.C. has the highest rate of seniors living in poverty, one consequence of which is food insecurity. The adverse health effects of food insecurity are magnified for the senior population. According to a 2014 study prepared for the National Foundation to End Senior Hunger, food insecure seniors have significantly worse health outcomes than food secure seniors. They are 50% more likely to be diabetic, three times more likely to suffer from depression, and 60% more likely to have heart failure or experience a heart attack. Poor health outcomes for food insecure seniors lead to increased feebleness and decreased mobility, greatly reducing the ability of seniors to age in place. CSFP, administered by the Capital Area Food Bank as a lead agency with the DC Office on Aging, provides a monthly 30-pound nutritious food supplement to over 6,300 low-income food insecure DC seniors through a network of community distribution sites and a homebound distribution program. CSFP bags feature nutritious staple ingredients which support a senior's specific dietary needs, including low sodium canned vegetables, low sugar canned fruit, dairy, healthy proteins, and whole grains. Um, and beginning in May, fresh produce will be uh, provided to participants at two uh, walk-in clinic sites on a year-round basis to enhance the nutritional profile of the program. Prior to this, access to fresh produce was limited to the seasonal release of the Senior Farmers Market Nutrition Program checks, uh, which Ms. Mary will uh, be enthusiastically supportive of, <laughs> yes. uh, which are administered in coordination with CSFP. Uh, senior CSFP participants appreciate the health value of the foods provided, which encourage them to prepare nutritious meals, improve their eating habits, and remain active in their home and in their community. As one client stated, my mind is now on getting healthy, going out, and doing good for others. The DC Office on Aging has been a strong partner to the Capital Area Food Bank and has, been, and has supported initiatives to reduce the program's administrative burden and to mitigate barriers to program access. We support the Mayor's FY15 budget allocation for the uh, Commodity Supplemental Food Program and urge the DC Office on Aging and the DC Council to continue allocating sufficient resources to CSFP to meaningfully contribute to the health and well-being of food insecure DC seniors and to view the program, which is relatively new to DCOA, as a critical community resource interconnected with its other food, transportation, and specialized senior services. Thank you.
Thank you. Good afternoon. Well, good afternoon. I am just so excited to be here. <laughs> um, Council Member Alexander, I would like to uh, let you know that I participate in the program and have participated in the program since 2009. And just like so many across I'm sorry, the is your mic, if you could move it over a little bit, over? The, this bar. Closer? Is that good enough? If you adjust it a little this too, way? yeah. Or, is yeah. that okay? Can you hear me now? Can, can you hear me now? Yes. Okay, yeah. you can hear me now. Yes. Okay, great. A little better. Um, okay. I um, have participated in the program since 2009, and just like so many across the United States, I lost my employment. And the first thing I thought about, now what? What am I going to do? So I saw a flyer in the library about the program. I called, and uh, I've been participating for uh, five years, and I can't say enough about the program. Um, it really has been a lifesaver to me as a senior living on a fixed income. Uh, the additional food helps to cut down on my monthly food bill, and it is a huge help. And uh, moving, thinking forward, uh, should you decide about the, uh, the senior foster care program, I think this program, the com uh, commodity food supplement program, would be an additional asset to those uh, foster um, seniors because it would help to cut down on their food bill as it did to help cut down on my food bill. Uh, the program has helped me to tremendously improve my eating habits and begin to use the ingredients to prepare healthy meals. And I especially, I, if I had known with this kind of enthusiasm, I would have made a sign, we need more vouchers <laughs> so that we could go to the farmer's markets. You talk about a great value. They give you uh, the vouchers. Uh, I think they start... This month, I think, mm -hmm. uh, and they go through uh, October or so. And you, in addition to getting the, the healthy bag of food, you also get these vouchers where you can go to any farmer's market in the D.C. area, and it's such a delight. So I would like to let you know that fresh, fresh fruits and vegetables from the farm are the best way to go, and I don't think it gets any better than that. Um, one of the things that, that I've learned about the program, in addition to uh, what it does for me health-wise, was social engagement because I met uh, a Miss Letitia Washington who works with the program, and she is the one that gave me a lot of good information, um, very caring, a lot of compassion. So I would like to just encourage you um, to not only um, give us the money, or think about giving us the money, invest $3.5 But when you do that foster uh, senior program, think about this as an asset. This would be an asset to helping people every month with some good, healthy food, in addition to we want more vouchers so that we can go to the farmer's market. And to be honest with you, that is my testimony. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. At 66 years old, you're going to. Uh, these seniors are looking great. Thank you for your testimony. Good afternoon. Good afternoon, Chairman Alexander and members of the committee. Thank you for the opportunity to testify before you regarding the budget of the Office on Aging. My name is Elaine Hardy, as Mr. Nash has already identified. Is this good? My name is Elaine Hardy, and I am the director of CenterCare Adult Day Treatment Program. CenterCare is located at 2601 18th Street Northeast. We're in the Ward 5 district, and um, here recently we have uh, we have a wonderful campus um, that's full of uh, services for seniors. I've invited you before, Ms. Alexander, Councilman Alexander, and I told you you did not need an invitation to come and visit with us anytime. Um, here recently, Seabury has joined our campus, and as you know, they spoke before about the transportation services they provide to our elders, and we deeply appreciate that. Uh, we are here today in support of Dr. John Thompson, the director of DC Office on Aging, and his staff, <laughs> speci specifically Camille Williams. They are tireless servants of the district, and they deeply care for the elders. I am also here to talk about the changes in the provision and funding for adult day health care provided to low-income adults in the District of Columbia. 
Adult day health care included in the department's definition of day treatment programs is one very successful but often overlooked community-based long-term care service. Senecare has been a Medicaid provider of adult day health care for 27 years. Currently, we have an average daily census of 25. I did want to um, uh, bring to your attention, I started Senecare in 1999 originally, and we had an average daily census then of 55 a day, and we could accept up to 70 participants, and we had a waiting list. So you'll see how we're being drastically affected right now by the changes that are occurring. Um, we currently have 25 participants uh, who, are, who are, attend our center on a daily basis who have medical, social, and nutritional uh, needs, and they receive that stimulation as a result of being with us. Over this time, we have provided medical monitoring and support and structured therapeutic programming to older adults who are among the most vulnerable and frail in the District of Columbia. These individuals are all suffering from disabling cognitive and physical conditions and are certified by Medicaid as requiring a nursing home level of care. Without this support, many of our clients will move into nursing homes or linger at home with inadequate and, un and ultimately causing Medicaid costs to increase dramatically. Without support, most can remain in the community for many years. As I am sure you're aware, Centers for Medicaid and Medicare Services has required that the district discontinue payment for all day treatment programs, which includes adult day health care, using the state plan methodology that has been in place for the last 30 years or so. Fortunately, there is an alternate methodology using the 1915-I state plan amendment, which, if done correctly, will allow this vital service to continue. For the past several months, we've been working with the Department of Healthcare Finance on the research and development of the 1915-I. We are grateful to be included in this process and for the department's efforts to keep providers informed as it moves along. We understand the perilous position this office has. On one hand, CMS has given Department of Healthcare Finance an ultimatum and the possibility of facing significant loss of federal reimbursement if they don't make changes ASAP. On the other hand, the process of developing a new state plan amendment takes significant amount of time and careful planning and any gaps in service could prove catastrophic for the frail older adults in our care as well as the organizations that work with them. As we move forward, the finalization of 1915-I, there are certain issues that we want to be sure Chairman Alexander and the committee are aware of. Number one, the moratorium of enrollment. New Medicaid clients have not been enrolled in day treatment programs as of January 1, 2013. As long as this restriction is in place, we all need to understand that frail older adults seeking support in the community may be placed in nursing homes rather than being able to continue living in a least restrictive environment in their own homes. And I do want to add that Senecare has been informed that five participants who were displaced because of the inability to be readmitted into our facility uh, are now placed in long-term care facilities. Continuity of service, that's number two. Since CMS cut off reimbursement for day treatment programs before the new 1915-I was in place, we need district funds to bridge the gap and ensure continued care for the small but significant number of frail elder adults remain in adult day health care and living in their own homes. Stoddard has been providing this gap funding of 200 to 300,000 per year, but we are no longer able to provide that support. We have, uh, we have provided statistical data and correspondence that will follow up this hearing and will be directed to Department of Healthcare Finance, DC Office on Aging, and Councilwoman Alexander's office. Number three, level of changes, level of care changes. We understand that new processes and definitions for level of care in the 1915-I will impact level of care criteria for nursing facilities and EPD waiver participants. We urge the healthcare, Department of Healthcare Finance to engage the nursing facility, EPD waiver and advocacy community in discussions on proposed changes as soon as possible. We are requesting uh, reinstatement funds in the amount of $400,000 for fiscal year 2014 in order to sustain our current budget expectations and prevent further discontinuance of service to this critically endangered population. 
we ask that you please increase the Office on Aging's budget by what? $3.5 million and restore our program so we may continue to help our D.C. seniors. Thank you so much for your attention. Thank you, Mr. Nash. Good afternoon. I'll, I'll hold my questions until the entire panel. Uh, thank you, uh, Councilmember Alexander. And I'll be very brief because it was hard to pretty much cover everything. Um, but uh, uh, we are definitely in support of the Office on Aging and, their, and the increase of their budget of $3.5 million. We are uh, definitely in support of uh, Dr. Thompson and his staff. They have been excellent supporters of us. They have uh, uh, through thick and thin been there. I have a story to tell about Dr. Thompson that um, anytime we need him for anything, he comes and he is there. Uh, we had, uh, uh, I think last year we were doing the heat wave. We lost uh, our power, mm -hmm. and uh, Dr. Thompson came himself and made sure that every person that was involved with that was there during that whole crisis. And so he is an excellent uh, a servant uh, uh, for the district, and, and he cares deeply about the elders. Um, uh, Stoddard, uh, as you know, many of you may know, it's been around uh, for uh, since 1902 serving uh, residents of the district. Um, in our facility in Northwest D.C. We expanded to Washington Center for the Aids and Services, which is a district-owned facility in the July of uh, 2010, and uh, where we have Center Care and we also have Washington Center for the Aids and Services. We're expanding uh, across the metropolitan area. We have uh, a facility we're building in Mitchellville, Maryland now, um, and we're also working with NCBA the states in Columbia Heights and, uh, and working with Capitol Hill Village to provide some newer type of uh, uh, nursing home skill services uh, in the city that we're very excited about. Um, we consider ourselves and all our facilities just a big house in the neighborhood, um, in a big part of the neighborhood, and we're just excited about the fact that we're here to hear about what everybody else is doing in the city and their challenges. And we, we know we have Seabury that's on our campus. Uh, we have uh, Model City uh, that is on the campus. Um, and we have Civic here. And uh, so there are all kind of opportunities for us to work together to better serve our, our elders. Um, as Ms. Hardy said, Civic here is a key aspect of services we feel is the gateway uh, to caring for elders. We've been there for 27 years. and. Uh, Two points we need to make is in the, during the 27 years, our Medicaid rate has stayed at the same rate, okay, where other adult daycare programs have been able to uh, increase to have the services and keep the, the services going. Um, we're still at $61 a day. Um, the other uh, part of it is uh, when we took over the facility, uh, we agreed with the Office on Aging in the District of Columbia that we would uh, be able to supplement uh, uh, that gap uh, that we saw and that the Office on Aging was funding before for about $400,000 a year. Um, and uh, that was fine when we first started, but now that the district, and we agree with the district's philosophy of really having people stay more at home and less in nursing homes, mm -hmm. that has definitely affected our Medicaid rate uh, for our nursing home. Uh, we, we're losing about $13 a day now um, in, our, in our nursing home rate, and that money we're using to supplement center care, it is no longer there. So center care is, is struggling uh, from, two, from two areas now. It's not getting the funding, it can't accept uh, new Medicaid residents, our Medicaid rates are low, and then we don't, we don't have the sources to, to, to support them as much as we did in the past before. So uh, we just wanted to uh, find any way that we can to, to provide the, uh, the funds to make that happen in the future. Thank you. Thank you all for your testimony. So I want to be clear that um, because some people um, in the day treatment community have stated that they have not been able to return. I understand a new client is not one who was there before and is now returning after a hospitalization. Are you encountering a problem? with those persons coming back into care? Yes. Because some people said they were encountering that. Yes, and I did mention that briefly in the testimony that we are having difficulty in reinstating um, uh, folk into our program who have uh, had to go out for just a short illness 
And see, I need and to hear that, that because back. I can follow up um, with Director Turnage because uh, are you following up on that? I was told there would not be a problem with those persons. They're not considered new clients. We have not been successful in getting them to return. I have one client who is um, a little um, under the age of 60 years old. Unfortunately, uh, he had a stroke early. His mother cares for him, and she has called everyone in the city, and so have I, to try to get him reinstated, reinstated. and his Medicaid was removed from him in error. He did not go out sick. If you and could follow up, because you're not the first provider that says, that says that they are not able to return mm -hmm. their former clients, mm -hmm. and they're considered as new clients now, too. Yes. And I was told that's not supposed to be the case. So we're going to follow up on that. And lastly, have you, given, have you been given a timeline as to when the 1915I plan is going to be approved? No, not not entirely. Um, we've we've had several cutoff dates, but yeah. It, yeah, we're still we're still working on on that. It's still a work in progress, so you know, we're, we're patiently working with who are, all that are involved with that. Okay, to try to make that happen is the quicker the better for us. So right, yeah. So in the meantime, please follow up with me about those um, clients that you had that are now <laughs> trying to return. I'll, I'll try to assist you with that. As I mentioned, about five of them are in the nursing home now as a result of the as family members not, not being able to have anyone care for them during the day. So day treatment really compensates um, between, I mean, really compensates for those that are going into nursing care. Yes. So they're in nursing homes, but they only need, technically, they only need treatment during the day. Yes. And there was no other alternative for those but a nursing home for those that may need eight hours of care during the day? Not like home health or anything else that could compensate? We make those recommendations, but it's ultimately up to the family as to what they decide to do. Um, so we do make those recommendations when they leave the program. And that's the cost difference of how much money. Someone said like 100000 a year. Right. Right. As opposed to maybe the Medicaid, the Medicaid program plays a, and, and I'm, I'm, I'm in trouble, but in quoting, um, I think about 80000 a year, the Medicaid program approximately, and adult daycare, a treatment program that can keep people at home, uh, maybe 16000 18000 a year. So it's a huge difference, and, and, and again, we're in support of that program, and we think that center care and all adult daycare programs uh, uh, need to be fully funded and, and supported to, to make sure that that it happened because that's where the seniors want to be. They want to be at home. Families want them to be at home. And, and, and unfortunately, but I know it's a reality sometimes that families make decisions based on economic means, whether they can take care of family members or not. I was wondering, and you were here earlier about the concept of foster care yes. for older adults. Do you think that may encourage family members then to maybe say, well, maybe we can work things out uh, with our seniors, or do you think that there would actually be persons out there that may be interested in doing that, like a foster child, a foster adult? Yes. I, I, I love research, so the moment you mentioned it, I went online, and um, <laughs> the state of Massachusetts, had, Massachusetts has a wonderful model already in place, regulations already in place. It'll cost about 18000 a year. Uh, to find something like that. We were looking up here. <laughs> but that's interesting that only one state has come up with that at this point. I, I, maybe the District of Columbia is going to be number two now. We can lead it. We can lead it even better. So we'll see. And thank you all so much for your testimony. I'm glad. I, I'm also concerned when you mention farmers markets. I'm concerned that there are so many unhealthy options. We think about our younger population with our children, mm -hmm. but are seniors actually accessing a lot of um, fast food and junk food options as well that are on fixed income? 
Well, I think we probably see seniors uh, going for a lot of prepared meals, which are usually very high in sodium. Um, I know there's been talk about uh, how important it is to have healthy prepared meals. Uh, the great thing about the Quality Supplemental Food Program is it's a federal USDA program. And similar to like the National School Lunch Program, there are actually uh, component requirements that go in the bag. So every bag that we distribute always has the same type of items. It always has a fruit, it always has a vegetable, it always has a healthy grain. Um, okay, and this I was going to ask, so you never slip in cookies or? <laughs> no. <laughs> no, we're, uh, we're federally regulated. What goes in the bag is federally regulated, though we do have a choice as, in, as to what component we choose. So, but in terms of um, SNAP benefits, there's, is there that, I guess, that type of a regulation on what food you can purchase with any supplemental food income? Uh, for SNAP, no, there are no, uh, like, nutritional regulations for the program, although that's something that's been proposed uh, in but different jurisdictions. Member, Alexander, one of the things that you heard about were the great services that are offered at the Senior Wellness Center. And one of the things that's offered there on a regular basis is a nutritious meal. Mm -hmm. So um, when you think about uh, what's out there, the education, the awareness, uh, meals in place, congregate meals, meals at the Senior Wellness Center, uh, uh, coupons to go to the farmer's market, education, all of that encourages us to eat healthier. So 3.5 would be great. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you all for your testimony. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Nothing else. I got that left. <laughs> I think we're wrapping up our witness list. Is Miss Audrey Murphy here? Miss Murphy is program coordinator from West Respite Aid and Body Wise Program and Cat. Casawana Holmes. Uh, you can correct me. Kashana. Uh, Kashana. Thank you. That's pretty. Kashana. Kashana Holmes, a respite aid and body wise program. And I believe, is there anyone else who would like to testify? I believe this wraps up uh, our witness list for everyone. Someone wants to testify? <laughs> okay, this is it. This is going to wrap it up before our executive witness comes up. Good afternoon. Good afternoon, and thank you so very much. I'm Audrey Murphy. I'm with the volunteer senior program located on the grounds of UDC. We are under the, um, the leadership of the Institute of Gerontology. Our volunteers are restricted in some areas because they are district residents. They must be at least 55 years of, old, of age. They also must be low income persons. I've been a part of the senior network for several years. I find it very rewarding to work with persons who are just a few years my senior. The Institute of Gerontology through the Respite Aid Program with the second component, which is called the BodyWise program, provides educational aspects and community services for the District of Columbia residents. As I said earlier, these residents must meet an age requirement and an income guideline. The Institute of Gerontology has been in existence for a very, very long time, since 19. 71. It provides services for more than 2,500 seniors from all sections and wards of the District of Columbia. Now the Respite Aid Program allows residents of the District of Columbia to remain in their homes while we provide short-term release for the primary caregiver. Many of our seniors living in the metropolitan area live alone. And for those persons who do live alone, we try and alter our time with them in case they are looking for a primary person to give them care 
in the absence of a volunteer. Our volunteers receive a very small stipend. That stipend is paid once a month for four hours of service each day. As a representative of the Institute of Gerontology, we are here to support the Office of Aging proposed budget. We're not asking for all of the proposal. We're only asking for a very small percentage. That percentage would allow us to bring aboard additional volunteers. Over the last few years, we have gotten a very, very small minimal increase. If we are fortunate enough to get a part of this proposed budget, we will be able to bring aboard additional volunteers who desperately could use the income. In addition to our volunteers, we are very concerned that the cost of our volunteers, especially the cost for they are going from point A to point B during the day, is going to increase. And with that in mind, Ms. Kashana Holmes is going to give us some additional information. Okay. Thank you, Ms. Holmes. Yes. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Um, in addition to what Ms. Murphy has already said about our program, we are very concerned that the constant increase in transportation, the cost of volunteers outpack the program ability, ability to help them with transportation costs. An additional funding would allow the program to subsidize some of the costs. While many of our volunteers have been with the program for many years, some have expressed concerns about the cost of actually getting to their volunteer sites and its cost, and it's costing them to volunteer. We recognize that this program has made significant impact in maintaining seniors in their homes and assisting them in going to the doctors, running small errands and meal preparation, just to name a few things. Allowing frail seniors to remain in their homes far outweigh the cost of nursing homes or assistant living care. We know, how, we know much of the cost is borne by the government through either the Medicare or the Medicare, Medicaid or Medicare programs. The financial stability of the D.C. Office on Aging will increase funding and would ultimately transition to the many programs who are providing this much needed service. We really look at this as a win-win situation for us all. So thank you so much for allowing me the opportunity to testify this afternoon. So could you just explain to me, I just want to be clear, um, respite aid and BodyWise program, what is that exactly? The respite aid program is a volunteer program done by seniors to provide caregiving four hours a day for other seniors who may need a little support to maintain their daily living. So you go into the, to their home? Yes. yes. And how are you compensated now by that? The D.C. Office on Aging? The D.C. Office on Aging. Completely. Yes. And so is it any reciprocal arrangement? The seniors who volunteer, do they in turn receive services yeah. too? Or these are just seniors who are volunteering They receive a stipend check. So that stipend check is um, supposed to subsidize some of their transportation costs and for them to get a small meal during the day. And it comes once a month. So what, what, are their, what are the volunteers' qualifications? What are some of the things they, they are qualified to do? They're, they're do, they do non-medical care, so they serve as companionships. So they come over to the home and they provide and do small errands like grooming the dog if you needed, to, needed us to. Um, we do small errands um, and provide companionships. Going companionship. to the grocery store. Going to the yes. grocery store, going to doctor's appointments and to the social services offices with these um, frail, valid, um, frail clients that may need extra assistance. So how does one become aware of this program? Because there have been people who testified to say these are some of the services that they would like for themselves and for, and for um, seniors they're caring for. We get a lot of referrals from different um, organizations, um, Terrific Inc. being one of them. Um, we get a lot of people that comes through UDC. Um, that's where we're housed at. Um, and we just try to advertise it as much as possible. We're in the Iona book. Um, 
uh, for senior services, and we just try to advertise word of mouth to let people know we're definitely out here. So can persons also pay a little extra for your service? No, we don't accept we don't accept that. No tips? No, no, no not that. Oh, no, we, we don't do jail either. No, we don't do that. <laughs> okay. Well, thank you. This is a great service, and I would love to expand this service. Thank, thank, you. thank you. We appreciate it. Thank you all for your testimony. All right. And it's about a quarter to three. We will take a brief 10-minute recess, and then we'll hear from our executive witness, Dr. Thompson from the D.C. Office on Aging. Yes, thank you. Who's been here the entire time. Thank you.
We are reconvening at 3 o'clock with our executive witness, Dr. John M. Thompson, the director of the D.C. <laughs> Office on Aging. And before, oh, you didn't have to stand, but thank you anyway. <laughs> if you don't mind raising your right hand, do you affirm under penalty of law that the testimony you are about to give the Committee on Health is the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but? I affirm. Thank you. Thank you. And Dr. Thompson, I have your testimony, so you yes, may go right ahead. All right, thank you, ma'am. Good afternoon, Chairperson Alexander, members and staff of the Committee on Health, and members of the public. I am Dr. John M. Thompson, Executive Director of the District of Columbia Office on Aging. I am pleased to testify before you today on Mayor Gray's fiscal year 2015 budget and confidently share that DCOA's FY 2015 proposed budget fully addresses the agency's funding needs. To support the continued growth of the District of Columbia, Mayor Gray's FY 2015 budget submission focuses on four priorities. One, continuing improvements in public education. Two, investing in additional affordable housing. Three, encouraging economic and workforce development. And four, improving the quality of life for all. Mayor Gray's FY 2015 budget demonstrates his commitment to our core programs and services by ensuring that seniors and persons living with disabilities continue to receive cost-effective, high-quality services that support their independence. The budget preserves funding for key programs including transportation, nutritional meals and nutrition counseling, consumer information assistance and outreach, employment services and training, education and advocacy, elder rights, daycare services and caregiver support, support of residential facilities, and the Aging and Disability Resource Center, which administers, administers the following programs. <clears throat> Hospital discharge planning, diabetes self-management program, options counseling, nursing home transition, money follows the person, and the lifespan respite program. Moreover, the budget includes increased funding for for community-based support consisting of health promotion and wellness and in-home support. The Commodity Supplemental Food Program and the Seniors Farmers Market Nutrition Program and the Age-Friendly Initiative. DCOA's proposed FY 2015 budget is $42 million, <clears throat> which represents an increase of $6.5 million in comparison to the approved FY 2014 budget. A breakdown for the proposed FY 2015 budget constitutes $31.7 million in local funding, $7.7 .7 million for federal funding, and $2.5 million in intradistrict. This budget is sufficient for DCOA to meet the federal requirements of the Older Americans Act and to carry out its mission as defined in DC Law 1-24 to advocate, plan, implement, and monitor programs in health, education, employment, and social services that promote longevity, independence, dignity, and choice for our seniors. Additionally, DCOA has sufficient funding to continue serving persons with disabilities and caregivers through its Aging and Disability Resource Center. Before I continue my discussion on FY 2015 budget and our strategy, and our strategy for moving forward, I would like to highlight the district's efforts in transforming Washington, D.C. into an age-friendly city. In my budget testimony last year, I testified that we were launching Mayor Gray's Age-Friendly City Initiative through a partnership with the World Health Organization and AARP. An age-friendly city is an inclusive and accessible environment that encourages active and healthy living for all residents by making improvements focused on eight domains of city life affecting the health and well-being of older people. <clears throat> These domains include outdoor spaces and buildings, transportation, housing, social participation, respect and social inclusion, civic participation and employment, communication and information, and community support and health services. The district has added emergency preparedness and elder abuse, neglect, and exploitation as domains due to the importance, importance of these issues. <clears throat> to date, we have collected a wealth of data from residents, business leaders, advocates, government officials, 
and other community stakeholders at the Mayor's Second Annual Senior Symposium and the Age-Friendly DC Forum. We have also facilitated a number of block-by-block -block walks to engage advisory neighborhood commissioners and residents about what they would like to see in an age-friendly city. And council member, you were also at our uh, one of our walks in Ward 7. The collected data from the various forums and walks will shape the district's age-friendly D.C. strategic plan, which will consist of a number of measurable and attainable goals. We look forward to working with our public and private partners in accomplishing all goals within the next three years, <clears throat> bolstering service delivery, customer service, and agency accountability. In FY 2015, DCOA plans to improve service delivery in a number of areas. First, DCOA will extend the weekday hours of operation and establish weekend hours at each of the six senior wellness centers. By expanding service hours, working seniors such as baby boomers are able to exercise prior to going to work. Evening hours could be dedicated to a variety of activities, including, but not limited to, social programming, educational workshops, aerobics, aerobics or spinning classes, and community meetings. For the first time, DCOA will establish weekend hours at the centers, which will enable seniors to take advantage of health, wellness, nutrition, and socialization service offerings six days a week. In addition to extended hours of operation, DCOA will bolster health and wellness programs by hiring health practitioners who can improve the health outcomes of the participants at each of the centers. DCOA will also establish a health and wellness component at the Asian Pacific Islander Center, which currently offers only socialization and a congregate meal site. Second, DCOA will increase access to seniors needing in-home health services, which will allow more seniors to age in place despite their limited income. Services include escort, personal hygiene, feeding, light duty house cleaning, shopping and errands, and companionship and supervision. Third, DCOA plans to decrease food waste at each of the congregate meal sites. The anticipated realized savings will allow DCOA to feed a greater number of seniors. Fourth, DCOA plans to establish a respite program for seniors living with Alzheimer's or other types of dementia on the east end of the city. A respite program will keep seniors living with Alzheimer's or other, or other types of dementia socially connected and mentally engaged while family members receive respite from the toil of taking care of loved ones. Fifth, DCOA will work with the Office of Contracting and Procurement to identify a company to conduct an actuarial study for all agency services. This study is needed as the agency has not properly adjusted its reimbursement rates for community-based organizations rendering services on behalf of the agency. Unfortunately, this had led, has led to some agencies to go out of business or terminate their partnerships with the agency as they were operating DCOA-funded programs at a deficit. As a result of this study, we anticipate that grantees will receive fair and equitable reimbursement rates. Six, DCOA plans to overhaul its current information technology system, which we call CSTARS, with a user-friendly and streamlined platform for contractors and grantees to input programmatic utilization data. The ideal system will enable the agency to produce real-time data reports that shape policy and budget decisions. A new data management system will bolster the agency's oversight function. In order to accomplish these aforementioned goals and additional ones, DCOA reassessed the current knowledge, skills, and abilities of our existing staff and established new core functions that require skill sets and competencies that vary greatly from the current positions. Consequently, in FY 2014, we created 11 new positions, including leadership positions, retitled positions, offered internal promotions, and consolidated core functions. These recently created positions are a part of the agency's current 20 vacancies, eight locally funded positions, 8.5 intra-district positions, and 3.5 grant funded positions. The agency will be equally as diligent in filling these vacancies as we were in filling 12 positions since the agency's last performance oversight hearing on February 25th of this year. 
However, the agency's true vacancies in FY 2015 will decline drastically to a total of three positions, two grant-funded positions, 0.5 intra-district, and 0.5 locally funded. This is due to the reduction of 6.5 budgeted FTEs and the agency's plan to fill 10.5 of our current vacancies in the next 45 days. As you can see, our overall goal is to maximize the agency's resources so we can provide a higher quality of service to our constituency to help them increase their quality of life. This means that it is critical to our agency's success that we get the right individuals in the right jobs. In closing, Madam Chairperson, the continued strong performance of the D.C. Office on Aging is attributed to our community-based partners, our strong base of volunteers, and the continued commitment of the DCOA staff and leaders in providing high-quality, essential, and life-supportive services and programs for the district's older residents and persons with disabilities. I want to personally and professionally thank and encourage them to stay committed as we continue our partnerships and bolstering the programs, services, and operations of DCOA. I would also like to thank the Mayor and Deputy Mayor Otero for their vision and continued support of DCOA. Madam Chairperson, thank you for your leadership and support of programs administered by our agency. Through our collective efforts, we will transform Washington, D.C. into an age-friendly city. This concludes my testimony, and at this time, I will be pleased to answer any questions from you. Thank you so much. Thank you for your testimony, Dr. Thompson. I want to first and foremost thank you for your service uh, to the D.C. Office on Aging. I didn't think that I would be chairing this agency again. Um, but I think it really makes sense to be with the Committee on Health, Absolutely. actually, and I look forward to possibly keeping uh, this agency awesome. and under your leadership, too, Thank you. <laughs> if you get my drift. Yes, I understand. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but I, I wanted to first ask, um, with the additional 3.5, that's all that we've been hearing, and I just want to clear up, because I'm trying to understand was this money from one time, you know, in 20, in FY14, it was only one time grants that No, ma'am. When you look so, at the 3.5, at the top of that page, the $250,000 uh, that was funding to Seabury, as well as the 165000 for the two social workers. And so those were the only ones that are one time funding. And that was. Uh, provided by the council on last year, so that was not a part of the mayor's budget. That was something that the council uh, did as one-time funding. Okay. And so let me, let me also add, if you don't mind, uh, Madam Chairperson, that the $165,000 is in the budget this, for FY15. The $250,000, I'll go out on the limb, that is something, uh, one thing we don't like to do is cut funding uh, from our grantees, and so that's something we have to look at. Okay, for the 250000 Now, the mayor has a million dollars, for, but that's for nursing homes. Nursing home transitions, right, helping those individuals who are returning to the community and making sure that they have housing. Okay, so that $250,000 grant will not be returning in FY15? No, ma'am. Okay. I need to look at that, so possibly I can look at that. Now, I, and I'm sure you see the whole list absolutely um, and that's what you're referring to so for these other services if we could just go um, down the line approximately 1.2 million for service network providers that have been left behind um, and that I'm just reading that as a right. quote for some of the adult day centers the legal help the housing what are we doing in this budget to to accommodate all of these services well, well let, let me say that all grantees had uh, a slight increase last year. And of course, some grantees had a higher increase, such as our lead agencies or our Aging and Disability Resource Center. Uh, I think as a, as a start, council member, that first we have to do is do that actuarial study. And so yes, we understand that folks need more, our grantees need more money. Uh, but I think as a start, we must complete the actuarial study. And as I've expressed to our uh, grantees as well as the Senior Advisory Coalition, uh, the purpose of the actuarial study is to make sure that we uh, fund our grantees at the appropriate level. And so that may mean by funding them at the right level, as soon as we increase uh, the reimbursement rates, 
that service delivery will decrease. That's what that uh, that's what that means. And so, but that that is the first step is to at least fund them at the right level. Okay. Um, and when is this study being um, This provided? study should be completed before the end of this fiscal year, which will help us to implement the new reimbursement rates for next fiscal year. And also let me add, uh, Council Member, as I look at our, uh, let me also add uh, that uh, you've been at uh, Mayor Gray's budget town hall meeting, and so uh, we've actually uh, made sure that we kept he kept the funding for transportation so that funding is right. intact and I thought so okay yeah. that funding is intact and the lead agency nutrition sites we've done a lot for we have, we have. and so it's an opportunity what we can do is uh, with the amount of money and we have to say that uh, with the money that the mayor gave us uh, for the current fiscal year as well as uh, going into the next fiscal year so he's given us I think it was about 3.7 million dollars for uh, what, what's the, the total amount for for food? Yeah, for 15. So the total budget for food is 7.3, 7.3 million dollars. And so that's an opportunity for us to look internally, uh, Madam Chairperson, and how we can, uh, if necessary, taking some of those dollars to get the appropriate staff members because uh, the vision in going forward is making sure that those individuals who are not on the homebound meal program and need one, those individuals would be able to be uh, serviced by our agency. Okay, so for the lead agency nutrition sites, can we incorporate some of that funding to fund these sites? Is that what we're doing? It's, it's suggested 100000 per ward? I have to look at that. Okay. So that's something I just want to follow up then on, well, the actuarial study for the network right. service providers and the lead agency nutrition sites and that would be probably about two million uh, for those services so I, I'll follow up on that okay thank you for that thank and you. I want to ask I know the mayor has um, has allocated two million for the wellness centers yes and when I ask about a breakdown of some of these services for the you mentioned extending the hours of operation at the wellness centers right is that what that two million is going to be allocated a, for? a portion of that so what, how much of that is going to be? I, I don't have a, a breakdown at this time, but a portion is to extend the hours. A portion uh, is to also finance a health care practitioner at each of those six senior wellness centers. So currently we do health and wellness, but we don't have health care providers on site. And so we want to make sure we have a health care provider on site. So a part of the money is to fund that and, of course, to extend the hours into uh, the weekend as well. Okay, and I want to ask, so if you could provide this for yes. me, possibly after the hearing, if you don't have the dollar amounts, I want the dollar amounts Absolutely. for each of these services, Absolutely. so in-home health services. Right, and let, let me also add for in-home health, uh, part of the money uh, that the mayor gave for uh, our wellness programs, that is to extend into uh, the home setting, and so that is to help. Uh, that is to help specifically those homebound folks or those folks who are un unable to get out on a daily basis is to fund that program as well. And so that's going to be at the tune of $500,000. Okay. What about decreasing waste from the congregate meal sites? What efforts are being made so that we can ensure that? Absolutely. So uh, we're in the midst of working with the National Foundation to End Senior Hunger. So uh, working with that organization uh, is a study that we'll be doing, and they'll be able to uh, track every waste at every single senior wellness. Uh, at not currently, we're going to start off with with three sites. We're going to track waste at three sites, mm -hmm. and that'll give us the opportunity of really assessing that data, and also working with one of our food vendors and see how much waste that is being produced by that organization, and so that'll help us, and it also help us to. Uh, provide nutri additional nutritional counseling and let me also say if you don't mind part of Mayor, Mayor Gray's sustainable DC any food that is wasted will be generated to compost that will be sent back to our intergenerational gardens. Awesome. The establishment of an Alzheimer's respite program. Yes ma'am. And you did mention that. Yes ma'am. Um, how much funding would go towards that? I don't know if that it, it, it'll be It'll be under $100,000. Okay. And how will those residents be selected to receive services? I, I'm not sure at this time I'll be working. First of all, I have to get a partner to a community-based organization to administer that program, and it'll be up to them how we 
Is that what the organization that testified, respite and body no. wise? They don't no, oh, they don't do that. that. No. Okay. And the new information technology system. Yes, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. So this is this is the opportunity for us. Uh, I don't know, I've been with the agency I've been with the agency on and off uh, since two thousand eight. And one thing's for sure, we have not done an effective job with data collection and analysis. And so this is the opportunity of getting uh, a data uh, tracking system, and even our grantees can attest to that, a user-friendly system where we can input the data and be able to extract the data into a usable form uh, for policy decisions. Okay. So just to repeat, and you can provide this for me later, I want the dollar amounts yes, for the hours of operation, the health practitioners uh, for the wellness centers, in-home health services, uh, what, what efforts to decrease waste from the congregate food sites, the establishment of the Alzheimer's respite program, and the new information technology system. So I would like a breakdown of those. Yes, ma'am. Uh, and just to continue on, let me. Well, for the um, the rent supplements, is it a million dollars um, for low-income seniors? The, the or is it ten million? The, I didn't know if it was one no, million. Or the 10. funding that the mayor uh, has is one million dollars. Okay. So, and also um, the one hundred million dollar initiative. Well, that was out of the one hundred million right. dollar initiative right. overall for affordable housing. For, Yes. So for rent supplements, a million dollars is going into that. What would be the approximate allocated amount per senior to benefit from this? I, I'm, I'm, not, I'm, I'm not sure. These are vouchers. I'm not sure. Okay. And so I, I would like to know well, how, how many seniors would that accommodate Absolutely. and what would be um, the cost per senior. And does it include the whole wraparound services that come with that or is it just a voucher? No, no that's just a housing voucher. Just a housing voucher. Okay. And we don't know. I want to know how much rent uh, this would be intended to cover. Would it provide a senior for a year's, you know, annual rent just for about a year? Or I, I just want to know once they receive this supplement, how would they okay. sustain that? Absolutely. After, you know, so I want to get the timeline of how long they would actually benefit from this and then what would be the plan yes, uh, you know after this would run out so to speak okay. so um, I want that information okay. and along those lines too um, do we have any numbers for how many low-income seniors overall in the city that we have currently L that are in need of, of housing let us get that number to you mm -hmm. let us get that number to okay, you. okay thank you and as far as the lead agencies are concerned, uh, how many people have moved out of nursing homes? Do we have that number? In, in, the, mid, in the mid 60s. Okay, that's um, up to date? Right. Yes, ma'am. And what has been the impact of, um, in terms of the, the first, well, the lead agencies for their increase in many years? Um, what has been the impact in that increase? Is this what what some of the results were? They're able to actually get seniors out of the no, nursing that, homes? Uh, the 60 or so folks that we've been able to transition out of nursing homes, that is a pot of money that Mayor Gray, uh, Mayor Gray gave us last fiscal year, and he's continued that funding into the current fiscal year. So it's a total, totally different set of money. Okay, so when the lead agencies now, they've been advocating to receive an increase. So what has been the impact thus far in of the lead ability agencies? to provide case management service, uh, the ability to be able to uh, assess seniors who need a homebound meal, and just the ability to just reach more people through the services that they offer. So their job is to coordinate services for seniors throughout their ward. And have they been effective in Ab doing so? Absolutely. And let me also add that when I look at the budget, and I have my two budget folks sitting to my left, that when we look at the burn rate overall for our grantees, we're looking at a burn rate at about 35% current burn rate. And so you're looking at 
uh, six months into the fiscal year that you would expect the burn rate to be around 50 percent. And so uh, this is the opportunity. We've restructured our folks internally so that we can improve oversight and so that we can ensure that our grantees are spending 100 percent of their dollars within that current fiscal year and not taking any dollars over to the next fiscal year. Okay. And I wanted to get the approximate cost um, of the Aging and Disability Resource Center. Yes. Um, what was that cost per person that that has been moved from a nursing home? I'm sorry. Oh, uh, a person leaving a nursing home? Yes. And so we heard earlier from the Executive Director, Marla Lahat. So her program is about $10,000 $10, a year in providing uh, home care, uh, home health services for folks. And of course, uh, in comparison, a stay in a nursing home is about over $100,000. Now, we don't uh, actualize our costs because it's just our internal staff providing uh, the assessment, going to a nursing home and asking uh, key questions, whether or not somebody wants to move out of a nursing facility, and also if they have the ability to move out of that facility. So you said approximately 65 um, to 70 seniors have moved Around out, or persons have moved out of nursing yes, homes. What do you project for FY15 um, for at, that? At this point, uh, I don't know. We have uh, the Deputy Mayor, Deputy Mayor Othello has hired a special assistant for long-term uh, services. And so we're in the midst of determining how many uh, folks could be moved out for FY15. And so we'll have a better assessment after the Deputy Mayor's office look at, look at that so number. Is one of the major barriers that they don't have a home to return H to? Housing, or housing is the primary barrier for many of these individuals. And what about any other other issues aside from housing? Uh, besides it? housing is making sure that the individuals have uh, funding to be able to pay first month's rent if they have to uh, pay rent, uh, having uh, deposits, so whatever the case may be, just having money to get back on their feet is, is very important. And so how many people in your agency are dedicated to this um, transitioning from nursing homes? Is there a department? Yes. With the well, I will, you know, we're not a department, so we're, not, we're an office. So we have, so we have a unit. A unit. We have a unit. So we have 11 individuals who are dedicated. So that includes the funding that the mayor gave, so local funding for the nursing home transition program. And we also work with our folks uh, through the Department of Healthcare and Finance, the Money Follows the Person program. Okay, awesome. I want to get to the Commodity Supplemental Food Program. And just a, one basic um, question for that. So the mayor included an additional 455000 for, for that. Five. Now, is your office, because it handles more than just the senior meals, it handles, um, it states, um, low-income pregnant, postpartum, and lactating women, and preschool-aged children. So are you going to administer all of that, or are you just going to have a portion? Oh, uh, no, ma'am. We started, the program was transitioned to us, and so the mayor just made sure that we have permanent funding for that program in FY15. So the program was transitioned to us uh, in for FY14. So, so uh, you're going to cover all of that. Uh, and so let me also add that the postpartum and and the young children are phasing out of this program. And so currently, the last number I, I uh, had, we had about 21 people, 21 persons on the program. And just to put it in perspective, the number of seniors on the program, we have around 6,300 people. Uh, but let me also add that those individuals who are phasing out of this program, they will still, they will continue to receive benefits through the Supplemental Nutrition and Assistance Program as well as WIC. Okay, so this 455000 will eventually just be for seniors? Yes, ma'am. And there are, you know, I know they're not under your purview, but as you mentioned, there are other compensated programs for these other eligibles to Absolutely. receive? Absolutely. Yes, ma'am. Okay, that's great. And for the age-friendly city, 250000 is going to support that program. And I know that this is only a beginning for that. Yes. What will that support? So it does not support an FTE. We have additional funding uh, to support the age-friendly city DC coordinator. So that supports when we do our, for example, last fall we had a chance to have the mayor's age-friendly city forum 
Um, and so it supports that endeavor. We had a chance to also host a forum or the mayor's second annual senior symposium for data collection. So it will just support the programmatic aspect, not personnel. So when will we get to, like when we did the walkthrough yes, and we found out some of the problems that needed to be remedied to, for an age-friendly right. city, when are we eventually or are we working with other agencies um, to resolve that? How, how is the complete funding going to be established for age-friendly city? A, a good way to look at it, uh, Madam Chairperson, is that 250, uh, as I mentioned, is for the programmatic aspect. We're working with so many different uh, governmental, D.C. governmental agencies that are already investing in programs for seniors or helping to create this age-friendly city. And so a good example is the Department of Parks and Recreation who have transformed some of their outdoor spacing. And so if you go to some of uh, DPR facilities, uh, you'll see universally designed equipment where seniors and other persons with disabilities can take advantage of those equipment. And so it's not just necessarily pumping money into the D into DCOA's budget for age-friendly city. It's just coordinating the efforts across the district. Let me also add that uh, the mayor's age-friendly city task force is currently working on a strategic plan, and that group is headed by uh, Deputy Mayor B.B. Othello as well, well as President Steve Knapp of George Washington University. Uh, the group will have a strategic plan later on this year to present to the mayor. And so at that point, we'll be able to execute everything we need to execute. As far as the age-friendly initiative is concerned, what other agencies do you think are like the top agencies that need to be involved in this effort? We're working with, uh, so I mentioned, you mentioned DPR. DPR, right, so Department of Health Care Finance, Department of Human Services, Department of Disability Services, Office of Disability Rights, uh, geez, Depart Department of the, uh, of the Environment, Office of Planning is, is a huge partner, Department of Transportation, Metropolitan Police Department, uh, geez, the list goes on. So Everyone. in essence, every <laughs> single agency has an opportunity to shape an age-friendly city because seniors depend on so many different agencies and even the Office of Tax and Revenue. Exactly. <coughs> because you know what I want to establish I guess is to go through all of these eventually all of these agencies will have a a, a portion of the funding what needs to take yeah. place like the number of well D dot the number of sidewalks that need to be revamped right. or, or lighting in front right. of senior um, senior um, residences, yes, senior buildings. Right. So that's interesting because I want to ensure and what effort are you going uh, to to make sure that you um, that you carry out to make sure that each of these agencies has a I mean technically or should it be intra-district funds into Office on Aging from all of these different agencies? Uh, I, I, would, I wouldn't say so. So for example uh, if it's a lighting issue, it's definitely money should not go into DCOA's budget to address those issues. Any well, if it's just for senior buildings. For senior buildings, if it's a housing authority issue, it should be housing authority receiving the funds. And so I, I don't see, and then again, I don't see additional monies going uh, for street lights when street lights should be oper operable in the first place. Mm -hmm. And so not unless there's a new initiative, something new. So within, right, uh, like the flashing beacons. Or right, something right. Like so that. If we're looking at, yeah, as the mayor calls the traffic calming signals. If we need additional traffic calming signals, yes, it'll be additional monies. But we're expecting the Department of Transportation to have money in their budget to deal with those issues. Okay. So we have established that the two million is for for the wellness centers, for the programming and extended hours. It was stated in a couple of testimonies that Ward Two and Three do not have a wellness center. Yes, sir. What, what are we doing to um, accommodate those seniors and those Senior, wards? Seniors are able to uh, go to any of the six existing uh, senior wellness centers. But is it feasible? Well, would you arrange for transportation? Someone in Ward 3 wants to go to Ward 7, or are you... Are we, you are, we, are, we are wrapping up on transportation uh, as we get increased number of vans and buses as well as drivers will be able to accommodate some of those seniors. Are there any other <coughs> programs that you can connect seniors to in those wards that the can accommodate them? The BodyWise program that 
uh, some of our colleagues testified on, and that program is administered by UDC. Okay. So they can go out to other activities? Yes, ma'am. And are there any plans for construction for a wellness center in each ward? In wards two and three, are there any plans underway now? No, in nothing the at this point. Nothing at this point. Okay. And transportation services, you mentioned, um, so that was, was it $3 million? Yes, ma'am. Total? Yes, ma'am. For medical and non medical? Yes, ma'am. And which of these um, have been allocated? Will any of these be allocated for the Medicaid um, transportation contractor? Not at all. Nothing. So, how much will be allocated for each? Is it 1.5 for each? Is it evenly distributed? for medical and non-medical transportation? The primary focus uh, remains on medical appointments, but as we continue to increase the number of vehicles and drivers, we'll be able to provide more supports to those individuals wanting to go to Costco or to the museum and to other uh, group trips. So currently, what are some of the non-medical transportation, um, I guess, approved transportation services that um, seniors can obtain now? Seniors going to Whole Food, going to play bingo. <laughs> really? Right. These, so, are, or, these are organized right. trips. Absolutely. And, and we even transport seniors to our daycare center. Okay. And for the home delivered meals, uh, can you estimate how much of the 2014 budget um, for home delivered meals and transportation will actually be spent in 2014? Okay. Tra tra the total budget, but you want to know the breakdown on tra transportation as it relates to home delivery meal? Mm hmm You're, We'll get that number to you. All righty. And are there any funds that will be unspent um, in that area for 2014? On, transpor on transportation? Mm -hmm. or, the, or the meals? I'm looking at spending 100%, council member. <laughs> So in 2015, well, the funding is more for 2015 than it was in 2014, correct? Is there a waiting list for any Cur other? Currently no waiting list to my knowledge. Okay. And the lead agencies, what are you doing, um, like you said, oh, that was the, um, for the increases for the lead agencies, you said once that actuarial study is conducted. Were they made aware of this? Do the lead agencies know about uh, this actuarial study? Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. And in fact, a couple of our, <coughs> excuse me, a couple of our grantees testified uh, about meeting with the Office on Aging to begin our conversation on the reimbursement structure. So yes, ma'am, they are apprised of it. And as far as your agency is concerned with full-time employees, could you explain the overall decrease um, it shows that your office lost 6.5 local FTEs right. and a half a person with the federal. Yeah, well, that's Point hard five. to lose a half a person. Half a person. <laughs> yes. And, <laughs> but and you gained four intradistrict. Right, we sure did. And that's for our Aging and Disability Resource Center. So the 6.5, that is attributed to uh, when the FY14 budget was being formulated, council gave funding for 12 additional social workers and those 12 additional social workers were to go into uh, go to the community based organization and because the funding was placed in the wrong category we had to reprogram the funding for our uh, community based organizations and so because of that those 12 FTEs are essentially unfunded positions for the office on aging and there was one thank you there was one um, testimony I believe it was Seabury that talked about the Living Wage Act, that that may in fact um, really have a, a, a marked uh, effect on their services because they have to pay higher wages now because of that. Um, has that been taken into consideration? We'll be able to determine that after the actuarial study. Okay. And for additional local funds, it. Um, to be correct, you received an additional $5.8 million for FY15. And I want to know, well, you did, you did state, if you could just go into that again, that is in your testimony, how those funds um, would be spent. Absolutely. So, so uh, you'll see for the commodity program over $400,000. 
also receive funding uh, to sustain the funding for transportation uh, at $3 million, $250,000 for our age-friendly city program. And just to explain, under subsidies and transfers, it shows an increase of $6.5 million approximately. And if you could explain that increase. Where are we? Where are we on subsidies? And Raina can cite that. What page? Where is it? E89. On table BY BYO dash three. On line fifty. <coughs> Okay, so our three million for transportation to Seabury uh, is at four for four fifty for our capital area food banking. And what else? That was you said four hundred fifty thousand. Yes, ma'am. Okay. And what's, That's still a long way what's from six million. Oh, two million for wellness. Capital centers. area food bank and two million, two million for wellness. 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 Okay. What else? Okay, any more? What else? Or you want to, if you can't locate yeah. it all, let me, let me look at it. We still, I want to still look for the million within that 6.5. Okay. Well, wait a minute now. So far, that's just like 2.4 million. No, three, you have 3 million for transportation. Oh, I'm sorry. 2 no. million for health and wellness, and then 455 for the commodity program through Capital Area Food Bank. Okay. So I owe you a million dollars. Okay. That's a deal. And just the last question. Yes, ma'am. Or you, you, you can still look for it, but if you can get back to me. Absolutely. Um, with that. Um, how are your federal grants allocated from within the agency? Could you give examples of some of the federal grants? Yes. So uh, our funding this uh, funding that will end as far as lifespan respite program. And so these are dollars that we compete for. Uh, those are what we consider a discretionary pot of money. We also receive formula funding. So for example, we receive $500,000 every year from the Administration on Community Living. And that's just a, a set rate we receive. So is there anyone dedicated in your office for federal grants? No. In terms of funding being In funded terms, by, do you apply for them, or these are just we do. Funded? We have we have uh, folks on the leadership team as well as social workers apply for different grants. So do they just focus? Is that what no, absolutely no, no one because grant writing is seasonal, for, especially once we go after federal funding, it, it's practically seasonal. So I, I don't think it's uh, making uh, it would make good business sense for us to just hire somebody. Not at this point to focus on just writing grants. Okay, well, I don't have any further questions. If you could just follow up with me, um, most importantly, for the specifics um, that I asked for in terms of the, um, the breakdowns for each of those services mentioned yes, and the 6.5 million. Absolutely, absolutely. Thank you. Thank, Thank you, you so all much. for your testimony. Have a good day. You too. Thank you. And next we will hear from our public witnesses for the not-for-profit Hospital Corporation, and then we will hear from the executive with UMC. Is Lisa Queen here? Miss Lisa Queen, Dion Brown, you're on television. Oh. <laughs> And we can wait. Thank you, Ms. Brown. You can have a seat, and we'll wait until the room clears out to provide your testimony. And just checking, uh, if Lisa Queen is not here, are there any other public witnesses that want to testify on behalf of the 
not-for-profit not <coughs> hospital corporation. And thank you, Ms. Brown. I have a copy of your testimony, so you may proceed. Thank you, Madam Chair. I'm Dion Brown. Thank you for the privilege of testifying before you today. Th this issue is close to my heart as I studied D.C. General Hospital 20 years ago while pursuing graduate studies. Over the ensuing years, I've kept my finger on the pulse of health care in the District of Columbia while building a career as a management consultant specializing in health policy and health IT. The necessity of a hospital east of the river is a very flawed assumption. Close proximity of a hospital to a population does not produce better health outcomes. Ironically, almost every member of the council is on record perpetuating the theory of necessity without challenge. I grew up in Ward 7 and am in my 12th year of living in Ward 8. I cannot recall anyone ever asking residents east of the river about their medical needs. The unspoken truth is that other hospitals in the city enjoy the medical ghetto that concentrates the sickest patients who rely on publicly financed insurance or are unable to pay. The current location of United Medical Center is remote for most residents of the city and not centrally located for those residing east of the river. As a matter of fact, it provides almost half of its indigent care to residents of Maryland as it is located on the state line. Most telling is Washington Business Journal's report of a leakage rate of 85% of visits for DC residents in Ward 7 and 8. And I quote, anybody who can avoid United Medical Center does and its bad reputation is getting worse through word of mouth. Even 80% of Medicaid insured patients avoid UMC if they can, and only one of 20 commercially insured patients who calls East of the River home goes to UMC." End quote. There also is not a compelling business case for the city keeping UMC on the books. Wall Street has warned repeatedly that it may impact our bond rating adversely. Now the mayor requested $300 million to build a new hospital on the campus of St. Elizabeth's. First of all, this is an onerous financial burden to place on a new mayor now that the incumbent has lost the primary. I request what big blogger Nikki Peel dubbed a political booty call to be tabled until the next budget cycle. Nobody is offering to buy United Medical Center. The leadership petitions the local government on a regular for infusions to meet cash shortfalls while giving glowing management reports out the other side of their mouth. Contractor after contractor has failed to restore its operations to sustainability. Doctors, dimensions, specialty, and now Huron. They each come to town with big promises and leave flush with taxpayers' cash. Meanwhile, the hospital is still not on solid footing, nor marketable to patients or potential buyers. The game doesn't change, it just rewinds. The city has made significant investments in primary and preventive care to help support the construction of a new network of community health centers throughout the city. Two full service centers have opened in Ward 8 in the past couple of years, with one open and another forthcoming in Ward 7. The needs of residents UMC supposedly serves would be best met by having them engage the health care delivery system differently rather than enabling dysfunction. The health care landscape has shifted nationally towards an emphasis on primary and preventive care. Federal funding is following suit. 
As the saying goes, an ounce of prevention is worth a pound of cure. Commit funding to make wellness visits and early intervention accessible outside of no work, normal working hours. Around the clock urgent care is nowhere to be found east of the river outside of a hospital setting and the proposed one is being fought tooth and nail. That is one of the reasons expensive emergent care is so much a part of the social fabric for the poor and uninsured. To the mayor's credit, he has scaled back UMC's inpatient services. However, the level of spending remains inefficient for the case mix it serves. Also, people are shooting in Washington Highlands where UMC is located like it's still the crack era. It made national news just last week as one of the 25 most dangerous neighborhoods in America. One more reason people avoid it. Nonetheless, UMC is not a trauma center. How about investing those funds in violence prevention programs or a police substation which crime-ridden 7th District lacks? Treat this like the public health crisis it is because survivors can also be a drain on the system. The Department of Health needs to take a whole systems approach to determine the best allocation of resources. Again, there's no business or public health case for the status quo. Despite continually sinking funds into the aforementioned money pit, Ward 8 still has third world health outcomes in almost every category. It's time to do something radical. RSM McGladry's 2011 report recommended a three-year ceiling for turning the hospital around. The day of reckoning is upon us. What now? There was speculation that people would be dying in the streets if the city closed DC General Hospital. Such did not come to pass. Buying $300 million of the same thing that never produced a return is like multiplying by zero. All indicators point to UMC not being viable. It's a viable business proposition for the consultants, but not for the residents of the District of Columbia. We cannot afford to stay the course because human lives are at stake. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Brown. Now, I, I can honestly say that your, your sentiment is not uh, alone. There are a lot of people who have said the same thing. I can honestly tell you from the first allocation um, that we provided for the hospital at $70 million, way back when, we were in dire straits at that time, and no one politically or otherwise was willing to say, we were going to close another hospital. So politically and probably for health reasons, we decided to keep it open. And then, um, you know, my colleagues and I and other people, residents as yourself, are wondering how much money are we going to pour in. We're pouring in millions and millions and millions of dollars. And I can honestly say, with the mayor's $300 million proposal, um, we are really scrutinizing this proposal to say we're not going to do this again. This is big now. $300 million is major. And we're looking at all the money that we poured into UMC and now it's proposed to squash all that and we're going to a new location with the new hospital. So your take on this is that it doesn't look like you agree with this notion of a new hospital. It would not be a new hospital. It may be a new physical facility, but it's the same hospital. Now, I want to, um, I want to correct one thing or, or to make clear with you. You did mention that you can't recall any residents east of the river, um, anyone asking them <laughs> about their medical needs. Now, I'm not sure, but I will ask. I know in Ward 7 there was a town hall meeting and there may have been more than one um, with the um, um, needs assessment with the United Medical Center that they were conducting needs assessments. You did not attend or you weren't aware of one in Ward 8? I have never heard of one in Ward 8, no. There was one in Ward 7. I attended it. 
and they asked a lot of questions and they answered a lot of concerns. People were very candid about what they knew about Greater Southeast and now United Medical Center and a lot of those uh, concerns and suggestions were taken back um, by the, the management um, and Huron and at my, that time. The, the way I framed that was more broadly than how that institution meets medical needs. I'm talking about the medical needs of the community and how it engages the overall health care system in the city. And so I don't define my medical needs relative to that one institution or any one institution. So I can personally ask you, you, you reside in Ward 8. Yes. And have you ever obtained any services from United Medical Center, I'll either tell you, inpatient or outpatient? I had um, an accident in my house where I injured myself. I had a deep cut, bleeding profusely. And I stabilized myself as best as I can and drove myself to Alexandria Hospital. You didn't even go to the hospital. I didn't even dial 911 because I didn't want to risk going over there. And I got treated. And, and actually, the ride was probably about the same. It took me less than 15 minutes to cross the Wilson Bridge and get there. So, so why did you make that, that decision? That or why wouldn't you? And these were the questions that they were actually asking in Ward 7. What would it take for you to go to United Medical Center? Yeah. I would not willingly go there. And why is that? Have you ever been before? I have been inside the hospital. I've been there for meetings. I actually interviewed there for a job uh, about, that was in 2002. And at the time, the COO of the hospital put my resume down and said, why would you want to come here? I'm on my way out. Wow. <laughs> and that's all I needed to hear. And I pursued employment elsewhere. So if a COO of a hospital can tell and you said that was like in 2002. Yes, that okay. was I moved in ward, to Ward 8 in 2001. That was in 2002. So that was Greater Southeast Hospital. It's the same hospital. You put a new name on the building. It's the same hospital. But have you ever received any type of medical care there? No, no. And yeah. I mean, if you look at the statistics presented in the Washington Journal's um, business journal's article, which I appended to my testimony, you will see the statistics of you know, how little of the market share in Ward 7 and 8 that they get. And so my sentiments are not by far rare. Well, I want to ask you, one, what is your, you have a background in, in health policy? That's correct. correct. And I wanted to know what would it take or what do you suggest um, be done at this point with United Medical Center, with that site? As my granddaddy would say, take that horse out back and shoot it. It's time to put it out its misery. The city has exhausted its options, has put pump money into it. And again, we, we're not getting more favorable health outcomes. And so if we're not getting more favorable health outcomes with its presence, what will its absence do to us? I think that's the question that the council has not struggled with. So what hospital, if any, in the District of Columbia have you access, access for service? Uh, I Actually, back in the day, we used to go to D.C. General. And I was born in D.C. General. I have been treated at Howard University. Most of my care has been at Washington Hospital Center. I've also been to Georgetown. So would you recommend any of those hospitals being closed, aside from D.C. General that's closed? Well, I wouldn't recommend any hospital to be closed um, because well, I'm, I'm taking a position on this particular one right, because but you of access the services, relationship to the city. Were your services satisfactory at the other hospitals that you, that you had um, services rendered? They vary, but I thought uh, Georgetown and a hospital center were excellent. So, uh, and I'm just asking you, um, just rhetorically, so suppose Georgetown or Washington Hospital Center, MedStar, suppose they partnered um, with the new facility. Would you think that would be a viable solution then? I would have to look very deeply at the nature of that partnership. Are you just putting their brand on the same system or well, how could it be the same changes no now how would it be the same system if a new hospital had partnered with a Johns Hopkins or MedStar or Howard University how would that be the same 
Well, from a legal standpoint, all partnerships are not created equally. So again, I would have to see what the nature of that partnership is and how substantive the changes in operations are at that particular hospital. So, As things stand now, I don't see that happening. So from your testimony, you would support UMC currently just shutting down and you do not support a new hospital? I do not support a new United Medical Center, that's correct. Okay, so it wouldn't be a new United Medical Center. I mean, that's closing. This is a new hospital. So are you so. saying if George or if MedStar or Johns Hopkins or someone else decided they wanted to build a hospital somewhere east of the river, would I support that? Is that what you're asking? Well, no. I'm asking would you support a new hospital? Is there a need for a hospital? Um, truly, some of the, some of the um, occurrences that you've cited, their shootings, um, there are people in need of care. So you do agree that there is a need for a hospital? No, I think I made that very clear up front. It, there is no need for a hospital east of the river, no. Oh, there is no need? In no, field. and actually I thought the plan that um, so Mayor Williams proposed to build a new hospital on the site of D.C. General was excellent because, again, that's more centrally located. More people would come from different areas. It would have a broader market base. Where United Medical Center is located, whether it's where it is now or on the campus of St. Elizabeth's is so remote and inconvenient for folks and we all know the stigma that Ward 8 has. People will not come from all over the city to patronize those hospitals. So I don't envision the market changing its habits so radically to sustain an entire new hospital. Well I don't agree that Ward 8 has a stigma because I know that you're a resident of Ward 8. So yes, I, I guess we have to work to to lift that stigma, whatever it is, but you live in Ward 8. Yes, I do. And I experience that stigma every day. I tell people I live in Ward 8, and they're like, really? Ew. <laughs> well, <laughs> really? You have to work to, to educate people. Have and you not seen me in these place. halls over the past four or five years working on that? Yes. Well, um, I hope you um, stay tuned for the testimony of the United Medical Center. Absolutely. All right. Thank you so much, Ms. Brown. You're welcome. And next we will hear from our executive witness, Mr. David Small and team. Come right up. Mr. Small is the Chief Executive Officer of United Medical Center. And gentlemen, if you don't mind to raise your right hand and do you affirm under penalty of law that the testimony you're about to give the Committee on Health is the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but? Yep. Yeah. Thank you. And Mr. Small, I have a copy of your testimony, so you may proceed. Uh, thank you. Um, good afternoon now, um, Madam Chair, uh, members of the committee, um, and, and those interested parties who may be watching or listening. Um, my name is David Small, and I uh, have the pleasure of serving as the Chief Executive Officer on an interim basis for the United Medical Center. Um, and technically the not-for-profit hospital corporation commonly known as United Medical Center. Um, I'd like to introduce I have Michael Davis to my right uh, who from the OCFO's office serves as our chief financial officer and Matt Harrison to my left who uh, is a managing director with Euron Consulting. Uh, I also have what I consider to be the A team sitting behind me. Our executive team are here uh, you've met them and, and know them from the past, so I won't uh, delay testimony. Um, you have my testimony in front of you, and uh, owing to the time, uh, I know you can read. I know you probably have read it, and we have had conversations. So um, I, I'd like to uh, just uh, say that it's there for the record, uh, with your permission. I'd like to give a couple of quick highlights, and I feel very compelled, uh, having listened to the previous witness, to uh, make some comments uh, in rebuttal, perhaps. Um, it's just, just my nature to um, advocate for uh, my hospital and the people that it serves. Um, our, well, our, she's waiting for your rebuttal. That, she is. That's, in. <laughs> that's correct. Um, and, and a couple of things I will say. Um, uh, and um, in, in part of those highlight comments do, in fact, rebut some of the, uh, the comments. As you know, Madam Chair, um, uh, we've embarked on a transformation journey. Uh, with the assistance of, of uh, Euron. And uh, the board um, 
uh, with Iran's assistance last year, conducted a extensive community needs assessment. The community being defined as our primary service area, wards seven and eight, and we did take into account some of the uh, uh, local nearby areas of, of Maryland since uh, we do see Maryland residents who avail themselves of us. As part of that uh, process, we did, as you mentioned, hold a number of town hall meetings. Uh, one was in uh, your district and two were in uh, the other. Uh, they were... Um, and, and can you recall if you could cite the dates and the times? Because I believe, if I'm correct, did you... Did you um, give information to civic association presidents or advisory neighborhood commissioners? We used the ANCs. We, knew, we advertised and announced this throughout the churches, the local churches of the area. We had yard-style uh, signage. We had handout flyers that were delivered to homes. Uh, we used your network, with your help, thank you, of announcing the one that was in your district. Uh, so we felt that these were uh, very widely announced. Did you uh, use the other councilman, Councilmember Barry's? Oh, um, ab absolutely. As well? Absol absolutely. They co hosted. We had a number of, of, of organizations that co hosted to help get the word out. Um, I will also say that we had a relatively um, uh, good attendance. Uh, I don't remember the dates, they were in May. Um, um, and I believe, um, perhaps. Some of my team might re might remember. Okay, we'll, we'll we'll get those dates and times. Uh, um, um, they were fairly well attended. We had several hundred residents uh, who attended in, in total, so we felt that we had some um, good feedback from those folks. And as you yourself reported in your in your comments just a few minutes ago, the sessions were started all with the question: What comes to mind when we say United Medical Center? And there were plenty of negative things that were talked about. And they were, quite frankly, not necessarily undeserved, but they were also old tapes, as I like to say. Folks talking about things that happened, um, you know, many years prior, and certainly not uh, from the time period that the d district uh, took over ownership and control and installed uh, the current board. Um, certainly, uh, while some of the past reputation arguably might have been deserved, what the, sta what the staff and the Euron consultants and the board heard from the community was, in fact, they did want to see a hospital there. They, in fact, wanted to see a full-service hospital. Some people even suggesting um, and, and some council members at some breakfast meetings suggesting that maybe we should have a trauma center there. So there was no sentiment that was expressed to anybody that suggested there should not be a hospital uh, with inpatient beds, a full service hospital, a, um, a full service adult P, uh, 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 ER uh, being run, et cetera. As a matter of fact, what folks told us was they wanted a local hospital, they wanted primary care, they wanted specialty care, they wanted inpatient care, they wanted um, uh, emergency room care, they wanted more of it, and they wanted more doctors. When we asked the question, why do you go, and, and the number was right because it came out of our study, that 85% of the local 140 or 50,000 residents of our local community, Madam Chair, were going into town or elsewhere. When we asked why, the response was the same. We want to see a quality product appropriately and conveniently delivered as a customer-focused entity, and we want more doctors, and we want more services. If you provide those, we will come. I'm happy to say that as you've received bi-monthly reports with your colleagues and the mayor, uh, as we have reported most recently in the performance oversight hearing of February, the hospital is, in fact, gaining market back. We are the only hospital over the last 12 months that through the District of Columbia Hospital Association's statistics that has shown continued uh, month over month, year over year growth in admissions. All of the rest of the hospitals in 12 month period are showing negative growth in admissions. We are one of the few hospitals that has sustained and is growing emergency room care. We have seen a 29% increase in ambulance traffic. 
That isn't because there are people frivolously using the ER. We know that there are people who could be using urgent care and non-ER services, and we're promoting that and using that. However, there are still a great many people who need emergent, urgent care of a ER visit a type. They are being admitted. We're seeing lots more people who are being admitted from our emergency room, and our census is rising. We actually, as I've stated in my testimony, we've brought online more beds, beds previously closed under prior administrations and ownership because that volume and that need is there. So I want to be fair, Mr. Um, Small, and I want to address some of the concerns since Ms. Brown is still here. She mentioned about the market share, mm -hmm. um, the location of the hospital. I know it borders Prince George's County. Uh, it's right on the line. And she had mentioned that there are actually probably fewer district residents that actually utilize the hospital at that location. Do we have statistics on the the persons who utilize the hospital? Are they Maryland or are they district residents, the majority? The overwhelming majority are residents of our local community, district community. The highest percentage of Maryland residents that we get are actually to our emergency room. Uh, about 14, 15 percent of our emergency room traffic is through uh, local uh, nearby Prince George's County. But residents. those, that's a, a, that's a large cost. ER costs are really draining on a hospital. It is. So what in terms um, of reimbursement are we getting for that or what are we doing to deter that that service? Or are we getting reimbursed for a lot of that ER a service? A absolutely. Uh, we have uh, those folks who are covered by health insurance, we get reimbursed. Those folks who are covered by Maryland Medicaid, we get reimbursed. If they're on Medicare, we get reimbursed. We have a very low overall unreimbursed um, uh, amount of our patient population, regardless of where they come from. We have a um, a self uh, a self pay overall population percentage of what Michael about two percent on the inpatient basis it's two percent on the outpatient basis it's about fourteen percent so the outpatient about that don't live in the district no, ov no overall overall. Overall. Oh, overall oh for reimbursement I'm sorry yeah, for, for reimbursement, reimbursement. Right. what about the outpatient services are the majority of those residents district residents yeah, abso absolutely we get we have very few Maryland residents except coming to our ER. Correct. So that's we, because we have a very good relationship with Prince George's EMS. Okay, awesome. So we've met, we've answered about the needs assessment, the town hall meetings, about the market share um, with the residents. Um, she also felt that um, this is a, a waste of money for the overall. Um, investment that we put so much in and the 300 million what is um, your assessment of the need for a hospital at that location at which location well just in, in, in or, that or, area or in that area. geographic area well, again, seven or eight in our needs assessment that's part of our strategic plan uh, the demographics uh, and the study that was done indicated that over a 500 bed inpatient need to serve the projected need over the next five to eight years of the ward seven and eight uh, population was required. We are not suggesting that UMC be a 500 bed hospital, but certainly as we talked about it and as our plan <coughs> indicates, a 130 to 150 bed inpatient hospital for adults is about the right size over the next half a decade or longer in support of those projected needs for Ward 7 and 8. So to what extent was Huron or UMC consulted when the mayor um, when the mayor came up with the concept for a new hospital? Mm -hmm. Were you consulted before he stated that a he absolutely. was going to? Absolutely. Let me, uh, I will take you back just a little bit in answering your question. Uh, forgive me if it's a little long-winded. But when we did our a board strategic plan retreat in July, and the mayor came and he attended a portion of that, and we talked about some of the findings, some of the findings that I just indicated, the need for a hospital, et cetera. Uh, the mayor asked the board to consider, um, in terms of its planning going forward, 
that we keep on the table the option of building a new hospital uh, for the future. That might be important in terms of attracting a partner, uh, which we said was critical to the long-term survivability of the hospital um, for the district residents under uh, emerging uh, health care reform. Um, the strategic plan that was adopted identified the fact that uh, building a new hospital on the current site while a current hospital existed would result in um, an inefficient and uh, non-contemporary configuration when all was said and done for a very large sum of money, estimated to be perhaps $300 million. So in our recommendations to at, the board, at the current site, at the current site, would still be a $300 million uh, investment to build a new hospital around, because our hospital is right in the middle of the, the uh, location, we'd have to build a hospital and, and configure the, the, the various buildings and services in a very inefficient, non-contemporary way. So we told the board at that time, and the board accepted, that building a hospital, a new hospital at that site, was not a viable option. So let me be clear, when that decision was made, um, I, I just want to be clear on some of the monies that have been spent in FY14. So last year, $20 million was dedicated uh, to UMC. And I want to be clear, over the course of FY14 and 15, uh, $20 million was dedicated. $15 million went towards a feasibility study in FY14, correct? No. That, what, uh, that did not occur. The twenty what, million dollars. So where is the fifteen or where is the twenty million dollars at this it's, point? It's, it was, it's in the budget for twenty fifteen under new hospital development. Because in twenty fourteen, while that money was there, that was not judged by the board in the adopted plan that I'm happy to say that you all have supported, called for as a priority our work to develop um, bringing more services to the campus bringing more physicians to the campus and starting our process of building uh, and developing community-centered uh, primary health care centers. So the feasibility study or any monies for development of a new hospital has carried over. It wasn't spent in 2014. So it was it's in carried over. Because now the mayor originally proposed $300 million, and now he announced that the investment would be 335 million eight hundred seventy six thousand so where did that extra thirty five um, thirty five um, million come from okay remember that that is that investment is a multi-year plan okay. to build a new hospital so that's cetera. some finance so it, it's there. not financing but it's over the course of of multiple years to bring on and address the cost of building a new hospital if that's the will of the council. However, building a new hospital is a four or five year project. We still need to move forward with the other elements of our plan that need to be funded. You'll recall our plan that was adopted and right now is the current plan that has that we're operating under which called for uh, um, 20, 23 million dollars for investment in community-based primary care centers. So this That's is going the towards the current budget. location. So those were those were community-based centers, one in Ward Seven and one in Ward Eight. Those are to be developed. They're going to be developed in 2015. They're in our budget. If you look at our schedule of sources and uses, I believe it's 23 million or 24 million in that range for the two new community-based centers. That's still there, and that's part of the larger 338 uh, million. So does this have to do about. with the proton therapy, those centers that are opening up? Nothing no, to no. do with that. No, not Community-based centers. Two ambulatory, I, two off-site ambulatory care centers. And what was that was Huron summation that we needed that as well? For yes, that? that was in the original plan and adopted by the board, yes. You'll recall, Madam Chair, that the plan, the strategic plan for the hospital calls for, that's currently in play right now, calls for a five-year investment of $155 million. 
that $155 million was divided into some major categories. Um, there was uh, $23, $24 million for these two community ambulatory centers that we just mentioned. There was also $38 million in there for renovating the, the current hospital. There was also some $50 million for building a new ambulatory and medical office building on the current campus. And there were also IT and other capital improvement investments, as well as um, investments in new programming and recruiting of physicians, et cetera. So can I ask you this, and I know that you're on, um, we have paid, uh, what, $12.7 million. So how much of that money, I don't understand, and I just want to understand for the $20 million or the $15 million going towards a feasibility study, what are those additional funds needed if we've now determined we're going to build a new hospital, um, we've determined the location of the new hospital, and Huron has been in there turning the hospital around. What is this additional need for $15 million for a feasibility study. What is that going to encompass? I, I think what are we, I what think, are we, I think um, it's a misnomer, Madam Chair, excuse me, for calling it a feasibility study. It's part of whatever is required for new hospital development, engineering work, architectural work, you know, all that preliminary development. Activity. Okay, so it would be would development and architectural design right. and not, development. It's not necessarily feasibility. And in particular, if in fact, uh, the final decision is to build a new hospital and to build it on the St. Elizabeth's campus. Um, all of the necessary infrastructure that would be part of building a new hospital, all the utilities, etc., that all comes as part of the uh, the district's development of that site anyway. So there's some some built-in savings, if you will, that wouldn't occur if you were building a hospital, new hospital elsewhere. Okay, so that, that kind of clears up because I was confused about a feasibility study. Yeah. Because I know that Huron um, basically was going to conduct any feasibility study that needed to take place, correct? Um, to the best of my knowledge, that's correct. You know, the, um, you know, the original strategic planning effort that we did uh, basically sized the hospital, you know, the, what the number of inpatient beds that would be needed uh, came up with the ambulatory model. Uh, it's, it did not include the detailed, um, the detailed uh, foundational work that David was talking about that would be necessary to design the, you know, the infrastructure, the access, um, site development, those sorts of things. This is my concern. It's not in there as construction or design or development. It says feasibility study. So, I mean, moving forward, I'm really going to have a difficult time approving the budget as this state's feasibility study. Because a feasibility study in itself is a, a determination if something is viable or not. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. So, that's a lot of money to have some confusion in the budget. Feasibility study. That's different than development. So someone's going to have to clear that up. I mean, I, I can't have that in black and white for a feasibility study. We all know, everyone in there knows that's different from development. And if, in fact, it is development, I mean, what is it going to take to correct that? Because this is the, this is the question of my fellow colleagues as well. They are concerned additionally, and we know that it's a great thing if we have a $300 million hospital and, you know, people will be just dying to come in there and partner. Ooh, don't, don't say uh, dying. No, not dying. Well, Ms. Brown said dying. <laughs> no, people will just be eager to come in yeah. uh, and partner. But the concern is, is that should we put up this investment without the certainty? Uh, that there will, in fact, be a partner. And now, if that's the difference between a feasibility study and, and design or, or development, that ensures that something is, in fact, going to take place. So a lot of the criticism is, yeah. and that's me, I support, personally, I right. do support a new state-of-the-art hospital, but I also support a known uh, confirm partner in place because we put a lot of money into this and now that we know that this is going to be something new 
we have to have some certainty there. So that's the overall, that's what, you know, in discussing with my colleagues, I think pretty much across the board, we support a new hospital, but it was the promise of, or, or the, the confirmation that there would in fact be a partner that was recommended. Um, the district does not want to be in the business of running a hospital. Mm -hmm. So that was the certainty and the guarantee that we need moving forward. And I, and I just don't see putting the cart right. before the horse. And I think, Madam Chair, I, you know, I, I, I'm not the expert in this, uh, certainly locally, and learning more every day. But my understanding is that uh, for the purposes of the capital budget um, uh, that the mayor submitted, it, it is a six-year plan in order to schedule out what borrowings will occur and, and those sorts of things. Um, and understanding that if there was going to be discussion about a new hospital um, and, a, and, and perhaps a direction to do that, now was the time to be thinking about that before, in fact, we spend more money per our current adopted plan to start renovating a current structure. Uh, so, you know, it was put in there for discussion uh, to, to, to get that direction going, et cetera and not necessarily meant let's put it in there today because it's a deal maker or breaker uh, with some potential partnership. I think it's a little too early to, to, to say that. Uh, as you know and as we've reported, uh, we have been having um, uh, informal informational exchanges. Uh, we have executed some non-disclosure agreements with some interested parties. Uh, we are moving forward. We have a process in place and a transaction advisory group with members of various. Uh, uh, so, what is this partner partners. saying? This partner is saying that the council has to approve the money before we move forward. Or no. have you expressed to them that the council would really move forward once they know? Um, we gave you the sense of the council. Mm -hmm. Uh, resolution. That's correct. And we we stuck to our end of the deal. Mm -hmm. Now we we want to see a partner. Mm -hmm. So is the partner has the partner been approached with, or potential partners be, have been approached with? We really need your confirmation or something to say, you know, that we are interested. So the council can at least see some interested parties. I mean, you understand. I, I, Where I, I understand from. we're a little bit about uh, chicken and egg, if I, if, if I can say it that way. Um, a very expensive chicken and egg, well, I, I understand, <laughs> and quite frankly, if, you're, if, the, if the budget need for a capital, six-year capital plan and, and, and getting all of this in and decided, uh, timing-wise, was not today, uh, we'd probably be in a different position in terms of talking to potential partners and seeing what would it take to negotiate a deal uh, to have them interested. Does it take a new hospital? Does it take a, you know, what level of commitment for the district and those sorts of things? And quite frankly, it's too early in those conversations. Um, as you know, uh, the plan all along has been to identify potential partners and talk to them in the spring, identify someone who had real interest, enter into hopeful, uh, hopefully enter into a uh, letter of intent where you're then actually into full negotiations, uh, come forward with a board recommended deal proposal uh, to the council as you came out of your summer uh, hiatus after August. Uh, we're still on track to do that and obviously there's a, there's a timing issue here of having to approve a budget and where does this fit in the budget when it's, uh, it's, it's not um, uh, timing wise aligning with uh, negotiations with, with an actual partner potential. What I can tell you though is that when the mayor made the decision um, after talking with everybody to go ahead and put this in the proposed six year capital plan, we did advise those individual organizations that we had been conversing with that this was there and we did gauge what their reaction to that was. And again, there's, there's caution on their part because they said that's, that's very, that could be very attractive unless um, you know, the district was going to build a new facility and expect a new partner to pay for it. So, uh, so th those are all part of the 
cooking of the of the stew if you will and it's too early in the process to uh, say that uh, the the district has a guaranteed partner if it does this or if it does that or even though course. we have to approve our budget that's, I have to approve my budget timing. next week that's that's the timing aspect yes and I think that's why the mayor wanted to make sure that the the prospect of a potential new hospital that we didn't miss the budget cycle the commitment of uh, bond funding over the next years, et cetera, miss that opportunity. Should a partner discussion come forward and say, "But we really would like to see a new hospital," and then we'd all be scrambling to try and find out how. That's so going to be. no action will be taken if there's no partner determined. If the budget is approved um, for this three hundred thousand over the next five years, if there's no partner identified, then what? What's going to happen? I, I don't know. Is the district going to potentially move forward regardless of if there's a partner? Or Is only Huron going to make a recommendation on that? Well, I think our, you know, if you go back to the original plan, uh, you know, what we what we determined through all of the process was uh, that to that the course of action that made the most sense was to was to invest what's necessary to. You know, to build the ambulatory piece, to, to renovate the hospital, to recruit physicians, and concurrently look for a partner because the, the consensus was that the district did not want to run the business of running the hospital, which, which we concurred with. So in order to, to get the momentum to, to grow the book of business, that we, you know, bring in the service lines required, bring in the physicians, was going to require an investment uh, Concurrent to that, oh, sorry. Concurrent to that is um, uh, finding a partner that ultimately would either through a management contract, eventually acquiring some sort of in some sort of an ownership arrangement. Um, so that investment, you know, we kind of looked at it that you could either not invest anything uh, and eventually spend as much in operating support as you would on that investment, or you can invest it grow the business, eliminate the subsidies on, on an operational basis, and hand it off to an interested party to buy it. So that's that was the decision that was made, was to do that, invest what it takes, and I think it was about $155 million to grow the organization, strengthen the organization, and then find a partner interested in taking it over. And that's the course we've been following. Um, so but, so, so can, we, can we, is it fair to say that Partners now are looking at the operation, and they still are not at the point where they could confirm something. I think um, what I've understood so far, and I have not been directly involved in it, but from what I've understood, uh, um, there is interest out there. There are uh, multiple parties who are interested in, in develop, uh, developing a partnership. We have signed a letter of. Uh, um, um, of intent? No, not of intent. No, no, no. We have a letter of interest. We have a letter of interest. One, one letter of interest that has come in. We're expecting another one shortly, and we'll start the evaluative process of that. Yes. So this so, is just based on the improvements that we made currently at United Medical Center. Yes, that and the commitment to for the investment required over the next five years of the $155 million. Okay. No, you know, thus far, to my knowledge, nobody has said it's dependent on a new hospital or it's not dependent on a new hospital. I think the important thing is to have the option that if that's what it takes, to, you know, to have a health care provider on that side of the river out of the hands of the of the So what, what does it take to get from a letter of interest to a letter of intent in your experience? Because you're in this business. Right. So is that the normal process? There is. That is the process. There, once you get the the um, you know confirmation of interest, and we've issued a request for information, we're now having companies respond back with information saying, yes, we are interested. Uh, the next step then is to move toward defining what that structure would look like, whether it's an operating agreement, whether it's a uh, co-management, you know, whatever that structure might look like because it probably won't be an outright acquisition or a purchase to begin with. It's probably going to be a rent-to-own type structure of some kind. So figuring out what that looks like, looking at the different options the district has, 
uh, and then working with the board to come up with the one that's most suitable looks like it's going to provide the best long-term solution for the district and so, for the so eventually with the 300 million dollar investment the district could very well recoup uh, that money through an interested party that's good that remains to be seen and that's the that's the challenge that David was referring to if the is that what the mayor is looking for overall a or recoup a recoupment on the investment yes I, I don't believe so. I think the mayor is interested. I, I can't speak for the mayor. Uh, I'll let the mayor speak for, for, for himself and his people, though. But, you know, the, the understanding is that we want to have the option on the table, uh, and we can't miss the budget and the debt cycle to make that happen. We, at a minimum, need to be able to um, uh, see that there is support and offer that level of support to interested parties uh, if they are going to invest and take full uh, risk of, of, of running that facility and, and what's there. What we have told them and what they can see is exactly what our plan has called for, that if the hospital is run well, it has the array of services, doctors, etc., and it is a good quality customer service organization. The opportunity to not need uh, operating subsidies is very real, and we're proving that. We are not asking for any operating subsidy in 2015 after a reduction in that request in 2014. That's the plan, and we're moving forward with that. Actually, that's uh, a huge step. It, and, and actually, we expect the projected performance for this year, based on year to date actual, is that we will actually have from operations positive margin that we will for the first time be contributing to the capital requirements ask of the hospital. Uh, so I think that uh, the hospital, the balance sheet is stronger, we're, we're getting better, and that is what we were under the first goal of our strategic plan. Improve the hospital's um, viability and strengthen it so that a viable partner would see that it's a worthwhile investment for them to get involved in. That, so, that was a great victory um, there. I want to move on because I want to be clear. So um, during um, our budget hearing with healthcare finance, this feasibility study was still mentioned. So the feasibility study, I just want to be clear on that, that um, um, the um, health care finance said the board and UN and GSA um, would be responsible for sending out an RFP for this feasibility study. So is this a feasibility study? This is the development? Uh, it's, deve it's not really a feasibility study because if the district says we want to invest in a hospital and they're in agreement with the plan to locate it at the St. Elizabeth site, then I think what's, what we're talking about is, number one, the district is going to get involved with a developer to develop the site, including potentially developing a new hospital. And we, meanwhile, will be spending money on the design aspects, the engineering so, aspects. So is this what the RFP is going to go out for, the design aspect, or, or is there going to be an RFP going out? It, so that was not correct information. Right. If you if you go to tab five in in the um, uh, our testimony and what we've provided to you, mm -hmm. uh, what we prepared is specifically looking at fiscal year 2015 and how the uh, we're projecting about 59.6 million dollars of uh, sources for capital. This is not operations. This is capital. And it's and it's uh and it has the various components, three point seven million dollars of internal cash that would be funded by the hospital. Right, because uh, capital couldn't go towards a feasibility study. That's correct. And then we have the go bonds uh, that that have been re referenced in right. the appropriations budget. The uses of that include the. But how is it listed on that chart then, as a feasibility study? Could you refer to where is it? This is healthcare finance. Oh, it's on healthcare finances. Correct. But, Correct. So and how could they? they and, and so are these capital dollars? Yeah, yeah there is thirty-eight 
the thirty-five point eight million dollars of capital dollars in that budget. Plus, there is uh, go bonds that will that will carry over that weren't used in fiscal year fourteen that would carry over to two thousand fifteen. So will it be in fact that amount? Because it still says construction and design. The so feasibility. Also, when you look at the construction, is that's also referencing to the ambulatory care centers that that would be built in 2015, and they're in addition to the hospital, and they've always been in the plan. Whether you have a a new hospital or. Uh, improvements to the existing campus. And so well, that, when does the RFP propose to go out on this? Uh, you're, you're talking about which RFP would you be referencing? <laughs> well, it still says feasibility study. Uh, well. So, I mean, what is it called? The new, develop, new design development. So when will the RFP go out on the new design development? We wouldn't put that out there unless we knew that funds were approved to spend to do that. So if the funds weren't approved in FY15, there won't be any new design. If there's not approved funds for a new hospital, then there's no need to... If funds aren't approved for a new hospital, would there still be a possible letter of intent or letter of interest? Possibly. At this point, um, we don't have enough line of sight yet from our interested parties as to whether that's necessary or not. Okay, so we discussed, thank you, uh, we discussed, and I, I just want to follow up on that because I want to make it clear to my colleagues because that has been a major uh, concern. And I still want to work with healthcare finance to get that cleared up, the feasibility. I, I think um, that the nomenclature there needs to be changed. Yeah, because I mean, we were wondering how could capital dollars be used for a feasibil feasibility study. And if that was the new trend, then we could really benefit a lot from capital dollars being used for other things. But that's not possible. Uh, we spoke about the needs assessment uh, that you spoke of earlier. Uh, and that has been performed on the current um, operating areas. How do you feel about the new location? It was mentioned that the new location, St. Elizabeth's, hospital may not be the best location by some and you know the mayor feels that's the best location what did Huron think about the location or did you did you take into account did you give any feedback to the mayor about St. Elizabeth's hospital location we, we or did. The, the new location you stated it would not be ideal the current so, location the current, the current location, location. I'm sorry. Building a new yes. hospital on the current location would, it would not, not be, be ideal. ideal. That's correct. So there are other locations. Um, I know. I don't know if you even considered the DC General Campus or St. Elizabeth. Here, we were we were asked a simple question, uh, and the simple question was: the St. Elizabeth site is being developed. There has been some suggestion that, as part of that development, perhaps a new hospital uh, might be located there. Um, we were asked to look to see, number one, would the planned need for buildings there uh, uh, that we had put in our plan, would they be able to fit in the site that was being proposed? So we had our folks take a look at it and we concluded that the new buildings that were needed for a hospital would in fact fit on the St. Elizabeth site. And we priced that out with the help of uh, 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 DC government officials, et cetera, to be about a three hundred plus million dollar development. So, do you we feel there needs to be another needs assessment? Um, because everyone thought in terms of the current location. Do we need to conduct another needs assessment because a new location is being proposed, the St. Elizabeth's campus? Because now that people know that a new location is mentioned there may be some other ideas out there about you know another location people didn't realize that was an option so do we need to conduct another needs assessment in the community to get I feedback think, about the location uh, yeah, forgive me but i think we're talking two different things again i want to be very clear the needs assessment that has been conducted is what are the projected needs for health care services for in service to the wards uh seven and eight 
and, and no provide, location wasn't and taken into consideration? That's absolutely correct. Locally, what's needed? You need a certain amount of beds, you need a certain amount of emergency room capabilities, physicians, primary care, etc. At the time when we did that, again, building a new hospital at the current location was not recommended and we moved forward with a plan that was adopted that called for continuing to use the current hospital in a renovated and developed, a more developed state. So there wasn't any um, further work done to identify perhaps the ideal location of a new hospital. The so St. Elizabeth Do you think site, that needs to be done? Do we think it needs to be done? Um, I, I, I think before perhaps contracts were, were signed and final determination uh, that that was going to be the site, uh, there could be some additional work done to study and look at uh, traffic patterns with yeah. the folks in one part of the ward, uh, can they get to there easily, would they avail themselves of it, those sorts of things. I think some of that information could be reconfirmed, perhaps. Okay. Yeah. I, uh, I, I don't think from a, from a needs perspective th there's been significant change, but I do agree that from an access and whether that's the right location for it, I think it's more of an access, uh, you know, how easy is it to be reached by all the residents of the district uh, is the most important thing. Okay, great. So there may be some possible consideration. Uh, could be, uh, but again, the St. Elizabeth's campus did present uh, an attractive location from the standpoint it did have access to nearby metro station, which doesn't exist at the current UMC site, and was indicated to us at the town hall meeting you attended that folks said it's too hard for us to get over there because metro Those are is by not convenient. The UMC is by. Um Southern Avenue has a metro station. That's it's, it's still a walk away. It's okay. still a walk away. Uh, the St. Elizabeth site where we're talking about as a potential, um, it's a, uh, a golf cart uh, sort of distance away. Uh, you could easily shuttle people and they could walk uh, to the site. So do you think the decrease in the number of beds is proper? You mentioned the decrease will be from 350 beds to 150 is that is that a why, why was that recommendation made well let me let me let me make sure we're talking about the right numbers here just for clarity we have a 120 bed nursing home which makes okay. up part of the available beds the acute care beds we have a license for 234 so of, be of which 234 to 150 then. right but right now, we run about 120 to 130 staffed acute care beds, including our 34 psychiatric beds. So in terms of right-sizing, if you will, and downsizing and all that, we're really fitting to what our current volumes are and the new projected volumes. But don't you think with the new hospital, the interest or the the increase may come, more patients may want to go to a new state-of-the-art hospital. So one and, and, and that's why about 150 beds sounds about right. Because you're so saying currently it may be about 130? Our average daily census is in the way. 102. 102? We run about 102 okay. occupied beds. So closer to 100, so it still would be an increase. Yes. Mm -hmm. yes. Okay. Uh, what will the bed capacity in Huron made that decision based on the current projections right. about yes. the beds? That's right. All right. The construction costs are estimated. We're back to the three hundred million again. Um, given your expertise, uh, is that the average cost of a hospital in this day and time? Three hundred million. Yeah, that's probably in the ballpark. <laughs> and for well, is it based on? What it includes is it based on the population? What is that 300 million? Because we're talking, you said 150 beds. Right. So what is that 300 million dollar cost based on? Aside from the size of the hospital, yeah, uh, construction costs. It comes out to about two million dollars a bed, which which nationally is a is a pretty reasonable bar, ballpark for what it takes to build a new hospital. So. You know, a larger hospital would, you know, two, th two million a bed is, is 
you know, pretty good for a uh, for an estimate. I, I don't know how the 300 was originally derived, but that's within the ballpark. Now, do you recall the mayor at his press conference even stating that there would not be a groundbreaking? And and this is where the yes. the question right. comes into play because now money can be approved. Um, but still a groundbreaking. He said there will not be a groundbreaking until a partner is identified. Right. But he did not say there will not be any money until a partner is identified. So in fact, if we approve this budget, um, we can just be, we can still be assured there will not be a groundbreaking until a partner is identified. So that money is just going to be out there. Well, that money could always be reprogrammed. Right. So the mayor, maybe the mayor, can the mayor come down and testify? <laughs> but he did state that there was not going to be a groundbreaking. He, he did say that. And again, we're talking about timing. We expect uh, the, the plan at the moment is still um, in play that we would have an interested party identified and a deal uh, uh, brought and recommended from the hospital's board to the council uh, by the uh, end of the summer, early fall. So did the mayor make his announcement based on the interest in the hospital? When he made the announcement about the $300 million for the new hospital, these letters of interest were already out there? Or did they no. come after his announcement? Um, no, we, 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 we've, we signed um, Throughout the last several months, we have signed a number of, of uh, non-disclosure agreements so that people could kick the tires and share information confidentially. So after his announcement of the $300 million, did this We didn't sign any new ones after that. Oh, okay. They were all the, the, were all the interested the parties who had said, let's share information. That occurred prior to that. And as I said earlier, as soon as he made that announcement, we then told everybody that just so they wouldn't be blindsided and we tried to gauge their response to that and of course their their response was uh, that's interesting uh, certainly is is in informative to the process uh, but it's too early to, to for them to say any more about that so his his announcement came with the interest that was already out there mm -hmm. basically mm -hmm. but we haven't gotten any more interest um, from that point after making that announcement no there is a uh, there was a request for interest uh, that was approved by the board at its last meeting that was released so that we could formally make sure that we've covered the campus uh, the, uh, and and sent out uh, formal announcements if you will inviting further interest we want to make sure that we've got everybody who may be interested at this point in time uh, to have come forward. So if there's anybody who's now considering it and looking at what's the district doing in terms of supporting the hospital's uh, strategic plan, it's called for capital dollar investment, new hospital otherwise, uh, you know, we'll, we'll see if anybody comes forward uh, additionally. Mm -hmm. But we're, you know, we're on a tight time frame, as you know, we're trying to move forward as rapidly as possible. Uh, to identify that partner and get a deal done. Can we identify before May 13th? No. <laughs> no. Um, when we're dealing with readmissions, and we know under the Affordable Care Act, uh, CMS is actually decreasing the reimbursement based on the readmissions, I believe, within the 30-day mm -hmm. time frame. Where are we in terms of readmissions? Are we Have we gone down? Have I'm, we increased? I'm so happy you answered that question. I get to brag. Yes, uh, the please. national average is 16%, and we are at 10%. Great, and that's um, to date. That's to date. That's current information. So the hospital is very fortunate that um, uh, our readmission and rates are low. So how long has that trend been going on as far as um, FY14? Yeah, at, at least a couple years. Oh. Yeah, at least a couple. And are you expected to to remain at that level, to be pretty we're, consistent we're, with that? We're working hard to reduce it even farther. So what, what steps have you taken to do that, to reduce the readmission rates? There, there are a number of them. Pamela, do you want to? Sure. 
address that? Would you mind? <coughs> Play a little musical chairs <laughs> here. Yeah. Hi. Yes, I'm Pamela Lee, uh, Executive Vice President of Hospital Operations and Chief Quality Quality Officer. Okay. Welcome. Thank you. Uh, we're doing actually a, a number of things um, that not only tie to hospital uh, readmissions, but also tie to making sure that evidence-based practice pretty much drives the care that's being provided at the hospital. There are certain conditions that um, um, we try to impact the outcomes of, whether that be whether those are congestive heart failure, acute myocardial infarction, or heart attack, as well as pneumonia. Through uh, standardized order sets, we've been able to impact care. Um, use of those order sets have gone up, and um, the goal is to administer care in an evidence-based manner so that we get the outcomes we need. <coughs> Excuse me. When we get the outcomes we need, then that will help with hospital readmissions. Uh, patients get to go home uh, better than when they arrived, and so all of those things are tied into not only readmissions, but also making sure that patients get standardized care. Do you also do tracking? I know the 30-day window is important. Do you do tracking beyond the 30-day of patients? Is there tracking after the 30-day readmission period, like if someone came back in two months or six months? Or right. No, we haven't uh, drilled down to that level just yet, but we are looking at it within a 30-day window. Okay. Mm -hmm. Thank you. You're welcome. Uh, I wanted to follow up how much revenue has been generated. I know the sources of revenue through the hospital or through the operations are inpatient, outpatient, and the skilled nursing um, facility. So what has been the breakdown among those three operations? We generate about 12 percent of our revenue from the skilled nursing, uh, and then we generate uh, Approximate. You know, the, the rest of that would be about 88% from inpatient and outpatient services equally broken down. So about 44% would be inpatient services and 44% would be outpatient services. Okay. And in the budget book, there was a steep increase in the um, skilled nursing facility and the admissions. Um, it went in FY14 from 81 um, to 151 and FY15. What, what's the cause of this major increase? What that what what we are doing is we are uh, going to be focusing more on a skilled nursing setting, which uh, those would be patients that uh, would be transitioning from uh, an acute care setting into uh, a skilled setting. They typically have shorter lengths of stay uh, than a long-term care resident. We figure that we're, what we're projecting is 25% uh, for a redesign of a skilled unit would be uh, dedicated to what is what is legitimately termed as skilled nursing. And how, which of these um, operations, if we move to the potential St. Elizabeth's location, what would be affected? So there will be no um, skilled nursing home facility, correct? It, it, we are. It, in is the, this totally inpatient care? It, it, no, uh, inpatient, an ambulatory center for uh, the house, uh, ambulatory uh, specialty clinics, primary care, ambulatory surgery, medical office building, parking garage, etc. So, what would be the plan for the nursing home uh, residents? The long-term plan has been, as it's stated within our our strategic plan, is for. Uh, the future UMC, whatever iteration that is, not to be in the nursing home business directly. And um, we would expect, based on, again, who the partner is and what their desires are, uh, the plan at the moment that's been adopted calls for, uh, in the long term rank, divestiture of UMC running a nursing home and, and operating one. That doesn't necessarily mean, obviously, that those beds uh, go away. Uh, they could remain there. They could be operated by somebody else. Uh, they could be relocated elsewhere. And obviously, we're not talking about closing a skilled nursing facility and putting people on the street. But some planned activity. It's just the long-term plan was not focused on uh, the continuation of UMC running a nursing home. 
So at, one, at, at what point are you going to not accept any new, any new um, patients? Because um, as I stated earlier, it's gone up. The admissions have gone up. So at what point would you plan um, to cut off? We don't, don't know because, again, the driving factor here is going to be a new partner and how the partner organization sees the value of a nursing home and how they wish to um, uh, perhaps see that in operation and how it's aligned with uh, the hospital operations. So we don't, we don't know at this point. Right, right because the projections have almost doubled. So right. my fear would be that, the, you know, if it keeps rising, we don't have the capacity anywhere for well, these people. So they would have to remain at the, at, at the current location uh -huh. until such time that we can locate other places for them to go. Do you do you foresee that you know is the forecast going to be that they're going to keep doubling like that? Well, it went from no, 81. No, it'll taper off as part of the plan, which 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 a hospital, an acute care facility such as United Medical Center that's built up. Mm -hmm. We're uh, we will be focusing our efforts for complementary lines of business that more are in line with the acute care hospital, which skilled nursing is. So we may have a component of skilled nursing in the new facility. What will probably be as we're as we're building the population of skilled nursing, and we will see a reduction of the longer term care population, which really is not in the best location since there's no real uh, areas for a a permanent resident to really. Wander. So, so most of these patients do return um, to the community and the skilled nursing facility currently. In a skilled nursing setting, most of them would be returned. Our, to ours us. do not. Ours do not. It's we we have we have really long term, low low intensity custodial nursing home care. Okay. Uh, and that and and I just want to make sure that you're 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 fully understanding. We're not talking about doubling the population. We're talking about increasing the revenue significantly because a portion of the beds we want to make sure are for higher complexity skilled nursing patients as opposed to our, our current population which is predominantly low intensity, low revenue generating, long term care custodial. Okay, and so this, this will be more like a rehabilitation kind right, of. And this is also consistent with the plan in which if you look at the primary drivers on the acute care side, our primary drivers are in the area of cardiology, orthopedics, oncology, and some of the areas that potentially would require more skilled nursing care. So okay. as we build the, the service lines on the acute care, we want to make sure that we can also uh, handle a, a more skilled population coming transitioning from the acute care setting. Okay, so in terms of the hospital admissions, um, are the majority paid for by Medicaid? The admissions, what's the, what's the payer mix with hospital admissions? With hospital admissions now, uh, we are actually about, um, let me get. And, and if you could give a comparison how that's changed, has it remained consistent? No, actually, I, I, well, uh, our admissions are growing, as, as Mr. Small had indicated, uh, which uh, is, uh, and in, I reference uh, in the book, we do have um, a um, payer mix book. Um, we are actually seeing uh, a, um, our Medicaid business, which is pure Medicaid, uh, we're budgeting at 28% of our inpatient admissions, and that's not changing. Mm -hmm. What we're seeing is the overall growth. Uh, we are seeing an increase in our Medicare business and our increase in our commercial business. So okay. in aggregate, we're seeing more access. So, so our and our managed Medicaid will start declining slightly, uh, and that may be either Medicaid or managed Medicaid in aggregate. We'll start seeing a decline. Not the fact that we won't see less patients uh, from Medicaid, and we were just the growth that we expect to see, that we have the most opportunity uh, based on uh, the review of the demographics as our Medicare population. So what are we doing now? Because I know in the past we had a lot of uninsured persons. 
um, that came and I know since the inception of the health exchange I hope that we have a growing population of insureds but what has been the turnaround that we are appealing to a lot of not only Medicaid but commercially insured um, patients that we're going to get Ms. Brown there one day well I, I would say there's probably three major components of, of why we're seeing a <laughs> shift uh, and, and, and I, and I want to make this real clear is we're not seeing a decline in our Medicaid and right. Medicaid managed care population. We're actually seeing steady state, right. a little bit of growth there, but where we're growing significantly, and I see three major components. Number one is we've done a lot of redesign work in our emergency room, which has enhanced the throughput and increased our ambulance traffic. Uh, Ambulances, uh, as, as Mr. Small had indicated, we are seeing 29, a 29 percent increase in ambulance traffic. Uh, we see almost 40 visits a day uh, coming through ambulances, and they also have about a 25 percent conversion factor uh, for every you know, 25 percent of those patients are actually admitted. And, and a lot of those patients are Medicare patients that are coming in, <coughs> commercial patients that are coming in. Uh, what we're also seeing is we've enhanced our third-party eligibility screen in uh, the facility by adding uh, a resources so when patients do present we can ensure that we can get them eligible and screened for Medicaid uh, if they have other insurance uh, we will also assist them in, in obtaining other insurance we were also had on-site uh, uh, representatives for the health care exchange do, so do you have any I'm sorry, do you have any um, percentage of patients that self-pay? Uh, we've actually seen that population drop. Uh, we're, we're projecting about uh, uh, about a 2 to 3 percent inpatient is pure self-pay. Those would be people that don't qualify. The, I will tell you the nice part about the district is uh, it's, it's relatively low. I mean, it's, it's, it's robust Medicaid program. So uh, there, there are there are avenues to to get district residents on some type of insurance plan. <clears throat> are there any? And that's good that we do have a lot of population in the district that are insured. Is there any discount plan or payment plan offered to persons? Yes, ma'am. Okay. Yeah, we do. Uh, every patient that comes in, uh, we do have uh, patient advocates there that assist them in, in reviewing of, of their ability to pay. Uh, we have sliding scale, uh, we have charity applications, uh, okay. and so we're very committed to ensure that, uh, uh, and, and most of our so, patients- And you did mention there's someone there from the health exchange yes, to enroll? Yes. So they would qualify persons if they qualify for Medicaid and too. We also have an on-site, uh, uh, we, we have also on-site Medicaid enrollment Okay. Uh, we have a Medicaid processor okay. on site at the hospital. So what are still some of the um, remaining issues to getting more insured persons um, to come to the hospital or commercially insured? I'm going to make one comment and then I'll turn out Mr. Small and he can certainly tell you what, what is being done. Uh, as, as I think we discussed in our, in our last testimony is, is ensuring that we have a, the plethora of services that are going to attract that care, uh, the, the, the cardiology, uh, the, the uh, general surgery, the vascular surgery, those items that would make the hospital more attractive in their, in their, in their needed services. Uh, I'll turn it over to Mr. Small and he can indicate what we are actually doing in, in that arena. I, I think in answer to your question, Madam Chair, I think there's, um, there's a couple of major drivers uh, that'll bring more patients to us. Uh, those who have even greater choice um, uh, and, and perhaps what we've heard from folks all along is um, do their doctors practice at our facility and or are they connected to doctors that practice at our facility. So ensuring that we can go to health insurance companies, third party payers and say that we have a robust medical staff that are on your panels. We have uh, you know, nearly 80% of our physicians are board certified, many double, triple, quadruple board certified. We're bringing more people there. Uh, that makes us more attractive to the insurance carriers so we can be in there what's termed the narrow networks, 
but we want to make ourselves attractive to the community so they can demand that they come here. When the, when the insurance companies see that the local residents want to use our hospital and they're their covered lives, they will also be inclined to present to us. Secondly, it's ensuring that we have the kind of high quality patient care that uh, has the outcomes that they are demanding. And we are seeing our numbers continuing to track upward over the last year in terms of those quality metrics. We are one of the safest hospitals in the district. I've been proud to rep report previously that um, uh, Consumer Reports in October of last year rated us number one in patient safety in the district. That makes the commercial insurance carriers look at us. And I think the last key influence is being part of an integrated system whether it's our own primary care or in working in collaboration with other community resources so that we can present integrated, well-managed care that are going to make people healthier and keep them healthier, which is what the insurance companies really want to see so that their costs go down. So we're attacking all of that, and I think our numbers, our metrics are showing that we're advancing. Thank you. We're winding down. Uh, the reimbursement methodology, could you, um, I guess, is it better for, um, for the new reimbursement? That they're, they're moving, we're moving away from a, a, um, a, a hospital-specific methodology to a district-wide system? Is that working out better, or do you recommend well, it stay? The uh, new reimbursement, of, and, I, and I believe you're referring to uh, that will cover about Medicaid, uh, 98, yeah, 98 percent uh, of the cost. Right. Currently, um, the the uh, it's 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 relatively early to tell whether we'll see upside or downside as it relates because we we don't have all the data collected to run the simulation models. Uh, I do believe that uh, we we are in an under uh, a served area, so our base factor will be 2% higher than the aggregate, which should be a positive for us. Uh, and I think that we have uh, some of the, our cost per case is one of the lowest cost per case in the district. That should also be a favorable influence factor. But as they convert to the DRG-based system, they will be rebasing the individual DRGs, which the lower intensity DRGs will be reimbursed at a lower rate. Oh, so okay. it's, it will be also important for us to see increased acuity and drive the case mix, which would also be a favorable factor. But uh, for the budget, we have basically projected a status quo. So we're not, we're not projecting to win or lose uh, as it relates to the new reimbursement system. But as far as UMC's um, patient mix is concerned, would you get reimbursed I mean, because the acuity level, would you say, is higher at that hospital than the average hospital? No, no actually, our, lower. ours is actually lower. Really? We're working mm -hmm. to, to, well, part of that <coughs> has to be with the, 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 the level of services that we were offering, the okay. physician services that we were so offering. So you wouldn't so get the, okay. But you're working on, you mentioned cardiology and orthopedics and yes. oncology, so that's going to change. Our yes. case mix uh, was <laughs> below one in uh, fiscal year 12, and it is now at about 1.13 in fiscal year 14. So we are seeing a, a, a upward trend in our acuity. Could you please describe for me um, the charity care program at the hospital? Yes, ma'am. <laughs> Anyone? I, no, the, no. Every, all patients who come in, as I indicated, and about 80% of our patients uh, originate through the ER. So that is our front door uh, of, of care, whether they're inpatient or, or come in for services. Uh, in the event that they uh, come in and they do not have insurance, uh, we have patient advocates stationed in the ER that will uh, uh, work with them to, uh, and that's where we also have our, our health care exchange people uh, and okay. our Medicaid uh, advocates uh, there to determine uh, their ability to pay. Uh, do you have the numbers, who, how many persons would quali have qualified for that to date? Um, I don't. Uh, 
Because uh, well, the debt projected was three hundred fifty-eight thousand. <coughs> I'm sorry. Is the debt that was predicted under this program um, was three hundred fifty-eight thousand. In the I budget, believe. correct. Okay. Oh, I thought so, you. Do uh, you were asking? Uh, I, I thought you were asking me about the number of. of well, I was. I, I was not not three hundred fifty-eight thousand. Kind of look at the dollars. <laughs> Okay, but, uh, well, the dollars guy. So three hundred fifty-eight thousand is about the projected. We are actually projecting. I believe we're projecting. Uh, yes, that's in the budget. That's that's currently what we're projecting. As as indicated, a lot of the and these would be those that don't qualify for any type of insurance. For any type, and I, I did want an idea of how many persons that might. Well, that might it's, be. It's about. Or, it's it's a, it's it's going to be around two percent of our population. Okay. Yeah, because as you mentioned, there are different services Correct. they're coming in for. Correct. So it wouldn't matter. It's not the same cost per person. That's so about 2% of the people they come through. I wanted to um, follow up on the workforce development um, plan. Now, I know you did have a job there, and I did look at the positions. I wouldn't have been able to have obtained a job through that job there. They were all very clinical and very specialized. Um, positions. So were you able to hire under that um, job fair that you recently had? That, and that job fair was such a success that uh, we, we've got several more that are that are planned. Um, I will tell you that there were uh, well over a hundred people that attended that uh, job fair. Um, there were a number of clinical people. I know that we interviewed a number of nursing, potential nursing candidates. Right. I believe were, we were there any are there any non clinical um, positions available? We have. We're, yes, there are non clinical positions. Or available. and were there any um, district residents that actually landed a job? Come on up. We're playing musical chairs again. I was concerned, and I don't know what the percentage of, was with um, district residents, um, but surely with all the investment that we put in the hospital. It would be my hope that district residents would benefit um, from some of the jobs offered at UMC. What is our current percentage of district residents employed um, at the hospital? The last I don't want to push anyone out who's there. I think you're doing a great job, but I would like to encourage some more district residents. Roughly that number is around 30% district residents. So that's actually gone up a little bit. From the previous 22%. <laughs> <laughs> so what did we do? Was that what? What are we doing to encourage more district residents? We are primarily participating in more district events. I.e., we participate with a lot of the faith base of late. Uh, we did the Temple of Praise job fair recently. We've also uh, attended some senior job fairs that were hosted in Ward Eight as well. In addition to the one that I that we just talked about that was held at Turner Elementary. Uh, do you work with Department of Employment Services? Yes, we do. As a matter of fact, we start with their um, summer youth program that's hosted by Mayor Gray every year. Roughly this year we're looking at about 15 to 20 young people, and some of those are able over time to transition into opportunities with the hospital. Are openings posted on the dc.gov website? Would that be? Are, we are you posted listed? the Department of Employment Services website. But uh -huh. I wonder, would it be possible, I don't know, under DC.gov, if United Medical Center could be included? I can certainly follow up. There. Um, because a lot of people do look at um, positions, district residents, through the DC.gov website. So I'm wondering what would it take to be listed on the website? I can would that be a possibility? Do you know? You could check? Yes, I will. check on it. Okay. That okay. would definitely probably enhance district residents um, in terms of their interest and awareness of what's open um, with UMC. Madam Chair, I'll also mention that uh, as you're aware, uh, the District of Columbia College is on our, on our campus, specifically the workforce development uh, section uh, for health. Uh, they actually just gave a, uh, an informational presentation to the board uh, of the hospital uh, last month. Um, we have we participate not only in providing space for them uh, mm -hmm. as part of that, but we have instructors out of our staff who participate, and we have uh, offerings to our current workforce. We have people within our workforce who want to improve and 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 uh, attain different jobs who, who go there, and we provide 
uh, the opportunity for folks who are graduating from those programs. Uh, if we have those openings, we're, we're linked with them. So as they graduate, phlebotomists mm -hmm. and a variety of medical techs and, and that sort of thing. Uh, so we're, we're looking for ways to work a little bit more hand in glove with them because they have a very uh, robust program. I think they have about 100 uh, you know, uh, students graduating and we're, we, we try and um, see if we, because we're on the campus, we can get first dibs, as they say. Awesome. Well, I would like to see that um, keep increasing. I think that's a great eight percentage points. Mm -hmm. So let's keep moving that up, at least half and half. I'm shooting for 50%. Okay. Uh, <laughs> thank you. You're thank welcome. You. Uh, I want to go to operating expenses now, and I'm going to refer to the table on page four. I just want um, an explanation as to why the contract labor decreased by 86 percent. Yes, ma'am. The way we have, um, our, our, obviously our plan is, is predicated on uh, not using outside agency. Mm -hmm. And so as you can also see, we're seeing a fairly sizable increase in our salaries and wages. So what, you're reflect, what that's reflecting is the movement <coughs> as we fill those positions which we're actively recruiting for, they would become uh, part of our full-time staff, employed staff. These are all positions that currently we have open that we uh, are anticipating. We're doing a, a, a wonderful job right now in terms of, and, it's, and what you see reflected really in that line item would be only the premium associated with contract labor for next year in the event that we had to use it. Okay, and can you explain investment income? I'm showing that increase by 622, I'm sorry, 6,224%. I didn't know there was a percentage that large. Well, it, it, it's, it's, it's actually, I, I apologize, I should be other non-operating income, uh, and, it's, and, and that is actually going down. Uh, uh, or in, I'm sorry, 2015? Mm -hmm. Investment income. And that's still... Well, that um, is, I'm sorry, that is the interest on the uh, potential cash that, that we, would, we would carry. Oh, well then that's a good thing. Right. Right. <laughs> and can you explain the interest on indebtedness and why that one increased um, by 1,881? Oh, I'm sorry, a decrease. So yeah, that's, that's good. Yeah. You got scared when I said it increased. They uh, got I scared was, too. No. <laughs> so, so what was the reason for the um, decrease? I think that's great. It would have been ven vendor uh, interest paid on, 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 on late payments associated. I think you've uh, heard that, that, that we did have uh, a time where we were uh, paying vendors late, so they were adding interest to, to rightly so, to the cost of of the goods that they supplied to us. And where will this increase go um, in FY15, an uh, increase of approximately $2 million in operating cost? I'm sorry, what line item are you looking at? Where is this one? Is this still table four? Oh, that's the overall budget. I'm sorry. The overall budget and the increase in the two million dollars in FY15. It was um, from FY14 to 15. The increase, the overall increase, just for the mayor's proposed budget overall. Oh, oh, that's the that, that's the appropriations. And and and, and as as I as I kind of explained, I think in tab six, we actually we have a what we do in in since we're a component unit, we have a one line item appropriations that provides us the authority to spend okay. the money. And, and that would include everything, that would include our, our, our operating expenses, our capital assets. So we're seeing, you know, in aggregate that number will, will increase a bit. But as you see when we look at the hospital actual budget, the components of it, the profitability is actually increasing. But that's our appropriations that gives us the ability to authorize the spending. Okay, so it's obvious that we're paying our bills and we're paying them on time with the 
decrease in the interest on indebtedness. How long is it taking now to pay our bills? Our, our average payment period is now 51 days. And what is the what what is the average to be in compliance? Our target was sixty. That's great. So what are we doing now? We just have more money. Well, uh, I think <laughs> and better management. It is it is it is nice to say that 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 with the mayor's assistant in March, where we had a fairly significant overhang in our accounts payable, we were able to actually attack all of the aged AP and get that paid for. Uh, through uh, uh, negotiations with vendors. Uh, we had a lot of partners who took uh, discounts. Uh, the utility companies took substantial discounts on the hospital, and so we brought all of our vendors current, and, uh, and as a result of also our cost containment efforts, we're having more uh, disposable cash to apply to the vendors as well. And we've increased our revenue stream, which is creating uh, more, more cash. That's impressive. Who wouldn't want a partner? That's what we say. <laughs> More importantly, what we say to the local community is why wouldn't you want to use your <laughs> safe hospital with high quality that is uh, got the kinds of doctors and services that everybody else has? Why wouldn't you want to use us? So my final question, I agree with you at this point. My final question is the encumbered dollars versus the unencumbered. I want to know um, if you could provide a breakdown of the cash um, that UMC has on hand. Yes, ma'am. Mm -hmm. To the extent of, you know, encumbered and unencumbered dollars. And that would be the final question. While, he, while he's looking that up, uh, can I just uh, get back to a question earlier? The community needs assessment uh, town hall meetings that were held last year, May 18th and May 23rd in uh, Ward 8 and May 28th in Ward 7. Um, and we have a June 18th uh, town hall to update the community at uh, DOES headquarters on June 18th. So. And what time is that? June 18th at DOES, and what time is that? I'm Do we have sure, a time? I'm not sure if I have the time in front of me. If you could follow sure up, probably, I'm sure, sure no earlier than 6 p.m., maybe even 7. But if you could follow up with the time, or maybe before we get Let's the know, answer to this answer. question. And the Department of Employment Services building is located on um, Minnesota Avenue. Um, I believe 4082, Minnesota, 44, thank you, 4058 Minnesota Avenue Northeast. Councilman Alexander, I picked up the wrong document. Uh, I knew that question might be asked. And, and I had it, mine was comparing it to prior year and I picked up the prior year's document, but I will uh, provide that to you. So you just have for FY13? Yes. Well, so I, uh, I do know that as of March we had about $25 million of cash and we had $7 million of cash that was available for operating activities. Okay. So if you could provide that. So you can provide me with 13 uh, and 14 yes. to date. Okay. May I have that? Thank you. 6 p.m. ma'am. 6 p.m. Yes. So there will be a needs assessment town hall. Um, I wouldn't call it needs assessment. It'll be a town hall meeting. A town with, hall meeting. Right, with, on on uh, at 6 p.m. at DOES on the 18th, where we will be updating our community and taking questions and answers uh, questions from the community. Okay. Well, thank you. I will send that out uh, to that. the community at large. And I don't have any further questions. This concludes our budget oversight hearing for the DC Office on Aging and the Not-for-Profit Hospital Corporation. I would like to thank all of the witnesses who came today to testify. And as a reminder, the record will remain open for two days and will close on Monday, May the 12th at 5.30 p.m. The time is 5.28 p.m. and we are adjourned. Thank you. Thank you.